Welcome to Sewing Parts Online, the family-owned business that has been providing quality sewing machines since 2008. Our mission is to help you bring your creative visions to life, and we believe that starts with having the right sewing machine. Quilting, embroidery, serging, crafting, Sewing Parts Online has got you covered. You supply the creativity, we supply the sewing machines. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Sew Creative Live National Sewing Month Celebration Day 2. My name is Brian, and I'm going to be your host for this event. If you didn't join us yesterday, uh, you, you may have missed a couple of really great classes, some product demos, some really fun stuff, but that's okay, because we have a fantastic schedule packed for today. So uh, if this is your first time joining us for Sew Creative Live, allow me to explain what it is a little bit. So if you've ever been to a quilt show or a sewing expo, you know that other than seeing all the amazing projects that are entered into the competition, you get to see product demos, you get to try out machines, uh, you get to test run a bunch of new products and really decide what you would like to buy. And you also get to uh, save a bunch of money, you get special event discounts. But we know that not everybody is able to make it into an in-person show for one reason or another. So we thought, hey, why not just bring it to the interwebs and try to get as many people together for this little community to try to celebrate sewing together. So I'm really glad that you are here. If this is not your first time, please uh, let me know in the comments. Let me know how many events you've attended. I'd really like to know. We really, really enjoy doing these uh, so creative live events and uh, our community makes it a whole bunch of fun. Well, there was one thing I missed when I was explaining what So Creative Live was, and that is the giveaways. I think that most people would agree that that's the most exciting part of So Creative Live. Uh, this event, we have some amazing giveaways. Uh, let me pull up a picture and show you what we got. Those of you who were here yesterday, you know what the grand prize is going to be. It is going to be a $10,000 sewing room makeover, and it includes a long arm machine, some sewing furniture, a whole bunch of Madeira thread. Uh, there's also some, some stuff that's not pictured. We have some uh, stabilizer bundle from Baby Lock. So I want to say thank you to all of the uh, sponsors of the event, Baby Lock, Janome, Juki, Arrow, Grace, um, and, and a few others. You guys are really what makes this event possible. So thank you if you're out there watching. We really appreciate your donations. So you may be wondering, well, how do I enter to win this giveaway? And I'll tell you right now. So what we have done for this event is we have these little So Creative Live Aurafil thread kits. And every segment, we are going to give one away to somebody in the comments. Now, if you win one of these Aurafil thread kits, you will be entered to win the grand prize at the end of day three, which is tomorrow. So every hour, there will be a surprise sewing related word that pops up on your screen. When you see it, run over to the chat and put it in the comments, and then you're entered to win for that segment. If you have any questions about that, you're a little confused on how that works, don't worry because our community is really good at answering those questions for us. So thank you and shout out to everybody who's been attending and knows how the giveaways work. And you guys are doing a fantastic job answering everybody's questions. I do wanna clarify a couple things. Um, the surprise word does not have to be in all caps and you only need to enter the surprise word once to be entered. If you enter it a bunch of times, we don't mind. We think it's fun. So. Put it in as many times as you want, but only the first time you put it in is what's going to count towards the randomizer tool. So with that said, I introduced myself, but I need to introduce you to my co-host. So Alex, would you mind coming up on screen? Yes. Hello, everybody. Everybody, give a big shout out to Alex. She is running the back end of the show, and she is doing a fantastic job. So please give her kudos, <laughs> clapping emojis in the chat. Well, thank you, Brian. You are doing an amazing job yourself. This keeps echoing, but I've just loved watching you all day yesterday. It was so much fun watching you up there and working with everybody and you're just doing an amazing job. Thank you, Alex. I am so appreciative that I get to do this with you. And I'm glad that we have been really enthusiastic during the giveaway drawings and we've been doing little drum rolls. So in case anybody out there doesn't know, when we do the giveaways collectively, all of us, uh, that are watching the stream, whether you're at home, you're in your dining room, you're at the doctor's office watching, whatever, you're at work maybe, I don't know, I'm not going to tell your boss. Do a drum roll with us when we do the giveaway tool. And uh, 
I think that increases the luck a little bit for everybody. So. Oh, absolutely. Awesome. Well, thank you for coming up, Alex. <laughs> okay. Okay. So I'm going to have Alex pull up the schedule for today and I'll go over it with you guys so you can see all of the wonderful segments we're going to be showing. So Alex, whenever you're ready, go ahead and pull up your screen. Perfect. Okay. So actually, let me change it to this because I can't read it even with my glasses on. Okay. So the first segment of the day is going to be with Ellie the Quilter from TikTok. She is going to be doing a traditional quilt block tutorial. So you may have heard of a nine patch and you may have heard of pass square triangles or, uh, or flying geese, all of the traditional blocks that many quilters use all the time in their artistry. Um, and you may be familiar with how to do them, but I know that Ellie's got some amazing tricks on how to perfect those. And uh, she's gonna be bringing that to us pretty soon here. So after Ellie comes up, we have Ashley Jones from Dime, which I am super excited for her to come back. She joined us for our spring social event and she showed us how to quilt in the hoop, which was really cool. That's something that I am looking forward to getting into this fall. I'm gonna try to get myself an embroidery machine and start learning how to quilt in the hoop. But sh this time around, she's gonna show us how to do hoopless embroidery, which is really cool. Uh, it's, it's basically an embroidery hoop that has a sticky pad and it allows you to embroider things that you typically wouldn't be able to embroider on your flatbed machine. Some stuff like ready-made fashion, uh, makeup bags, slippers, things like that usually have to be embroidered on uh, like one of those multi-needle machines. But with the uh, sticky hoops that Dime has, you can do it on your flatbed machine, which is really great because not everybody wants to buy a seven needle embroidery machine when they already have a flatbed one. So I'm really excited for her segment. Uh, after Ashley, the Grace Company is going to be back. And this time they're going to be talking about TrueCut. Uh, if you're not familiar with TrueCut, it's a rotary cutting system. They have mats, rotary cutters, rulers, and they have a really unique design that helps you stay on course. Uh, I actually have never seen another rotary cutter like it, and I use mine at home all the time. So I'm excited for them to be showing off their products. After the Grace Company comes on, we have Bernie and Shelly, which we know back here as hashtag Team Tobish. Uh, they, Shelly is a, an extremely talented quilter. She is uh, all about precision and using really, really small pieces to create her blocks. Uh, she's going to be talking about her process for selecting fabric for, for her project from conception to the time when she starts organizing and cutting. So she's going to talk about color theory, value, texture, and all that good stuff. Uh, and she's just a wealth of information. So if you are, uh, a a beginner to intermediate to even an expert quilter. I think you're every, all of us here are going to learn a lot from Shelly's segment. So I'm super excited for her to come up. The next educator actually has two segments back to back. And that is Michelle from uh, sewing machine artistry is the name of her company, but she is going to be representing sulky and clover for the first segment. She'll be doing a sulky uh, demo on how to make thread lace, which I've never seen done before. So I'm excited to see that. It sounds like a lot of fun. And then she's also going to be doing a half square and quarter square triangle demo, uh, the Clover way. I guess Clover has like their own method of doing it. And so she's going to be showing how Clover does it with their notions and stuff. So that's pretty exciting. After Michelle comes up, we are going to have Stephanie Hackney from Hobbs Bonded Fiber, which uh, if you were here for Christmas in July, she did a Q&A um, and she had so much good information about batting, things I never knew. She helped me understand what scrim was. She helped me understand what high loft versus low loft was. She talked about shrink rate and all that stuff. So this time, instead of a Q&A, she's actually going to do her full lecture. So um, I, I'm, I think that that's going to be a segment where we all need to get out our notepads because I know that batting, just like thread and needles, can be a little overwhelming. After Stephanie comes on, we were going to have Miriam Coffee, but there was a, a schedule change. She ended up doing her presentation yesterday. So instead, we are actually going to show you a, uh, an episode of the podcast that we've done with Pat Sloan, which I am stoked about. I, I know a lot of you in the comments probably know who Pat Sloan is. She is, is an extremely talented and likable quilter, and she's got a huge Facebook community. I know a handful of us are a part of her Facebook community. So Trisha and I ended up having a really great conversation with her a couple weeks back, and I'm excited for you guys to get to see it. After that segment, Alex and I are going to come back up. We are going to do the wrap up and the giveaway for today. So 
We talked about the grand prize, which was the sewing room makeover. We talked about the Orifil thread kits in every segment. Now let's talk about what we're giving away at the end of the day today. So let me see if I have an overlay for that. I, I gave you guys a little bit of a teaser yesterday that it was a piece of furniture. Here we go. Okay. So whoever wins the last giveaway of the day today gets the Orifil thread kit, which enters them into the grand prize drawing, and they get a Koala So comfort chair with a value of $504.99. So that's super exciting. We want to thank Koala for donating that chair to give away during this event. So with that said, I believe that is everything. So I'm going to go ahead and check in. Hey, Alex, is our, is our presenter ready to come up? Yes. Okay. So uh, keep your eyes out for that, that surprise word of, of this segment to enter the giveaway. And let me go ahead and bring up our new friend, Ellie the Quilter. Hello. Hey, Ellie, how are you doing? Hi, good morning. Are you tired? It's early over there for you. It is quite early. We're going to hope that my brain functions this early in the morning. And um, I don't know. We'll just see what happens. Well, with caffeine, anything is possible. So... If you need True, to take a, a quick moment to load up on some coffee, go for it. <laughs> yeah, I don't want to get all jittery with coffee. I think we're just going to wing it and see what happens. And hopefully all the brain cells are firing this morning. That's fair. So I'm, I'm excited that this is your first time on our So Creative Live event. Do you want to introduce yourself and kind of tell people a little yeah. bit more about who you are? Yeah, definitely. So uh, I go by Ellie the Quilter on social media. Um, I am the owner of Mojave Farms Quilting Company. And so we specialize in novice quilters, beginning quilters. So um, almost all of our patterns are beginner friendly. And you can just grab whatever one if you're a beginner and give them a try. We also have fabric, notions, um, all kinds of stuff like that. We have quilt kits. We just recently launched um, a six week online course for hmm. beginners. So you can sign up for that. And over the span of six weeks, you're going to learn a lot of basic traditional blocks that are friendly for beginners. And you, at the end, by week five, you're putting together your own first quilt. So it teaches you all the basics. So that'll be fun for beginners also. I love that. I'm super excited for you to get started on that new venture. Um, speaking of ventures, we, Sewing Parts Online and Ellie the Quilter, have something special planned coming up in a little less than a month, right? Yeah, yeah, early October. Yeah, so uh, for those of you that are in the Nashville area, we are going to be at uh, the original Sewing and Quilt Expo in Lebanon. That is, I believe, October 5th, 6th, and 7th. And Ellie is flying out to help us out at our booth. So we're going to be there together. So if anybody wants to come by the convention and hang out with us for a little bit, you are more than welcome. What do you say to that, Ellie? That would be super fun. I love meeting new people. I love hearing what everybody's working on. I think we're going to be demoing some Grace long arms, So that will be fun. It'll be a lot of fun. Yeah. Yeah, it's going to be really exciting. Well, anyway, I know that you uh, have a lot to show us. And I know that this is you, we kind of, this is like a little timed challenge because we had talked about how we're not sure if you're going to get through every block. And if you yeah. don't, it's okay. We'll have you back and we'll do another segment, but I'm, we're going to challenge. We're going to see if you can do it. Okay. <laughs> we'll see how many we get through. Yeah. I have a bunch of them prepared um, that are super easy for beginners and we're just going to see how quickly we can go and how many we get through. Awesome. I'm going to let you take it away. If you need anything at all, don't hesitate to reach out to me. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. Sounds good. Um, so we, um, I'll start off by saying we have a forward camera and we have an overhead camera. Hopefully you can see what is going on here. We have been having some weird glitching this morning with the overhead. So if that happens, we're just going to go straight on and I'll try and hold everything up so you can see it. But we're going to start super easy with something called fence rails. And it, and it looks like this. So it's super easy for beginners you're just going to be sewing three um, um, rectangles together and um, these are going to be two and a half by six and a half and so I'm going to put these over here so if you have three of them just like this two and a half by six and a half can you see that is that working okay okay two and a half by six and a half 
the way that we um, sew our quilt blocks together is always with a quarter inch seam. And so we start by just laying them right sides together like this. And I'm trying to make sure you guys can see everything. I guess we are glitching a little bit. Um, so we're going to lay them right sides together and we're going to sew along here with a quarter inch seam. And Brian, if you all have questions or comments in there, if you want to let me know, I'm happy to answer them as we go along. Definitely. Do you want me to save them to the end or do you want me just to interject with them? Sorry, can you say it again? I well, I just said, do you want me to save any questions for the end, or you want me just to interject? Um, I think just interject. Yeah, if I have the sewing machine going, I can't totally hear you, but um, okay. but yeah, inter I don't I don't mind interjecting. Okay, we'll make it work. So now that we have uh, these two sewn together, I'm going to add this one right sides together. Just flip it over. And then we're going to sew along here. Now you can tell I don't like to pin. I'm not pinning things. <laughs> but if you want to make sure everything's lined up properly, you can do that. And it, it will make things go a, little, a lot more smoothly for you. All right. So here is our fence rail and let me press it real quick. Uh, I know there's lots of controversy in the quilting community about pressing open or pressing to the side. I usually will press open because that gives me a nice flat quilt top. Uh, when I was a beginning quilter, I had a not great machine and it would skip stitches anytime there is anything bulky. And so I nearly gave up on quilting because I was so frustrated. And then I found that if I joined my binding diagonal and if I did flat seams like this, it turned out really well. So I'd say 90% of the time I'm doing that. Um, I might just press to the dark side or a side if it's something like maybe pinwheels or something that needs to kind of nest a little bit. Um, so this is our completed fence rail. This is super easy for beginners. And what makes this really lovely is when you join a bunch of them together in a pattern. So for instance, you might have this one going this way, this one going this way, this way and this way, if you can see that. So this becomes super adorable. Oh, actually, this should go like this. So you can see like the polka dots kind of go like that. So you can also set it up kind of like a chevron or like a stair step pattern for your quilt. This is probably one of the easiest things that I can imagine to teach a beginner because you aren't really matching up a whole lot of seams in your block. You just have some seams here in the middle. So that's probably one of the easiest that I can imagine. All right. So that's number one. We did one. That was quick. I, I was surprised. I thought they were going to take a whole lot longer. Uh, the next one that I wanted to show you is super easy again. However, we're going to do a little bit of a twist at the end here. So this is four squares. They can be any size. It doesn't matter what size it is. And I think these, let me double check. These are, yeah, these are four inch squares. So you can do this five inch, 10 inch, you know, do whatever you want, any kind of square. And we're just going to lay them again, right sides together like this. And then we're gonna sew down here. Now I'm gonna show you something called chain stitching. So if you are a beginning quilter, it might seem really weird to you that I'm not back stitching. Um, and I'm also just going to put one block in after another and keep sewing. And that's, people always get confused by that, but it's really just because in quilting, you're going to be trimming up your block 
And so you're probably going to be cutting off that back stitching that you do anyhow when you trim up your block. We have a question. What's the, oh, well, Brian's going to ask her. It, he put it on the screen. Oh, what's the question? It says, Ellie, what surface are you using that allowed you to iron on demand? Oh, this is actually a wool mat. And I have a fairly long one. It's maybe two and a half feet long or so. Um, but it's a wool mat. And I love using wool mats because you're heating it from the top with the iron, but the wool is so dense that it also heats it from the bottom. So I love these. I have a couple in different sizes, but I love this one for if I'm going to be maybe um, ironing, uh, like maybe like my quilt top. If I'm ironing something that has really long seams and so I can get a whole lot of it done at one time. Um, I don't have this space in my sewing area for um, one of those big ironing boards. And so when I first started quilting, I was using one of those little mini ironing boards. It was horrible. It was horrible. Get a wool mat. They're amazing. Um, okay, we're going to go sew down here. All right, so chain stitching again. I've sewn through here. I'm not back stitching. I'm just going to stick my other one in there and go one right after the other. All right. And I'm very lucky. My sewing machine is has a little cutter here. I never have to have an extra cutter. I think I think Sewing Parts Online sells this. This is a Janome HD 1000. It is a great basic domestic machine. I suggest it all the time for beginners. Um, and I've never had any trouble with it. I've had it for years. It's basically my daily driver. You don't have to spend thousands of dollars on a machine to get going in quilting. Um, you can just do something like this. I think they go for around 300, 350, something like that. All right, so we it's have our really two. Popular model. Oops, sorry, to, sorry to interrupt you, Ellie. I was gonna say it is a really popular model, and it comes in black yeah. and white. So, and, and oh. if anybody wants to know, customer service can get you the price on that. But I interrupted you yeah. because I have a question for you. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I, I know why you're doing it, but can you explain to the audience why you're chain piecing as opposed to kind of working the whole block at at once? Definitely. So chain stitching is a must if you're going to be doing quilts because a lot of what you do in quilting is a same, like the same block over and over or the same things over and over. And so the way that you get quilting done quickly and you don't spend months and months and months and months and months doing it is chain stitching. And so you'd sit down and you're going to have a sewing session and you're going to chain stitch everything that you can sew. And then you might take that and go press everything you can press. And then you trim everything that you can trim. And so you're kind of working like assembly line style. It goes way faster. You're also saving on thread because you're not pulling it out and cutting every time. And so the most that you have to, to cut apart is that. That's all that you're losing as you're doing your chain stitching. So it's super fast, saves on thread. And it's the way that I get through my quilts pretty quickly is just chain stitching one thing after another, go press everything, trim everything, sew everything. So it's just kind of working assembly line style, if that makes sense. That was perfect, thank you. Okay, so, so now that we have these four, or the two and the two, we need to join them together. And so this is where we are gonna start matching seams. And this is usually maybe the second block that I show beginners because it's where we have to start matching seams. And so we're going to do that just by, again, laying them right sides together. And then we're going to carefully look that we have our seams matched up. I wish our overhead camera was working so that we could show you a little closer. Um, now, the way that I like to pin. Oh, I just pinned it the wrong way. Okay. The way that I like to pin is I pin on the right side of the seam because I'm going to be putting it this way through my machine. And when I sew along here, I can come right up to my pin and that's going to hold my seam in place while I pull the needle out. So that way my seams don't, they, there's no chance of them slipping as I'm sewing. 
We'll put this in here. So I'm going to run right up to my seam and then pull my pin out and then get going. And then we'll move this, we'll give it a press. Flip it over, give it a good press. Ellie, I do have another question for you. Yes. It's, it's half question and half shameless plug. So okay. uh, how, do you, how do you like your Panasonic iron? Because we're featuring them as one of the products that's on discount for this event. And I'm actually curious about getting one myself. So I want to know your opinion. Uh, you need to get one. They yeah. are one of my favorite things. I've had it for, gosh, I want, I want to say like four or five years now, probably. And it is one of the best things I ever spent money on. Just because, you know, when you're, when you're ironing and your cord gets stuck on your on your ironing board or get stuck on the corner of a table or something yeah. like that. Or maybe the way that my sewing loft is set up, like I might be sewing on this side of the table, but I have my iron plugged in over here and maybe your cord wouldn't stretch or something. And so this is super handy because it's, you can iron any direction. It mm -hmm. stays hot for a long time. I've never had a problem with it going cold while I'm sewing. It's phenomenal. It's one of my favorite things. I'm glad to hear you say that because I've been curious about them for a, a while. And that's part of the reason I added them to this event because I was like, I yeah. selfishly want to see a demo for myself. So I'm glad to hear that. It's amazing. Yeah, it's definitely amazing. One of my favorite things for sure. Yeah. So um, this is our completed four patch. And that just basically means that there's four um, squares that are sewn together. But let's make this a little more fancy. We're going to do something called a disappearing four patch. You can do this with four patch, nine patch, doesn't matter. Um, there's all different variations to this that I've seen. I'm going to show you probably the more traditional one that people will use. So one of the ways that you could do this is by cutting diagonally and then mixing the pieces up so it looks a little more scrappy. What I'm going to do is I'm going to cut kind of like a hashtag. I'm going to cut down the middles here and then we'll mix them up a little bit. So I'm going to do maybe we'll say like two inches from the center seam. So I'm going to line up my two inches on my ruler along the center seam here. I'm using Grace Company True Cut. It's one of my favorite things. I always suggest it for beginners also just because I have an ergo cutter. This has saved my wrist. And all of their cutters have this little, I don't know what you call it, little doohickey um, that fits onto their um, rulers. And so their rulers have a little guide and then this hooks onto it. And so as you're cutting, it can't come off. There's no way you're going to get straight cut every time. So I really appreciate that. It, it has saved me many times when it's late at night and I'm trying to sew or quilt. And I'm trying to get something done not having to stress about about my cutting is amazing so i'm going to cut that and then i'm going to turn this around and i'm going to cut two inches off of this side and then so now that we have three pieces like this, we're going to cut the other way. So we're going to, I'm going to try and put them back together. And then we're going to cut two inches down this way. And I think there is a special word on your screen if you wanted to pay attention to that. And then let me turn this around this way. We're going to cut two inches on this seam. Oops, I'm trying to roll around. All 
All right. I'm normally standing up to cut. This is very weird for me. All right. So now we have them cut into all these little pieces like this. And the fun thing is you can mix and match them and switch them up however you want to do them. I'm just going to maybe do the top and bottom and I'll just do the sides. Uh, how did this go like this? I think. Yeah. So you can see it ends up looking pretty scrappy because now we've changed it all up. And then we just start sewing them together. So I'm going to, I'm going to lay all of these right sides together into the middle. I'm going to chain stitch them. And this one has a seam, so I am going to pin it just to make sure it doesn't go anywhere. So again, I'm pinning on the right side of my seam. And that way I can sew this way and it will hold it in place. This one, I think, Brian, you said you were learning how to quilt, weren't you? Yes. So I started, I would say I started quilting about a year ago, but I didn't start seriously quilting until about four months ago. So I, I had made a couple of quilt tops and they, they were all just, you know, charm squares sewn together. Nothing, uh -huh. nothing too crazy past that. And then I joined my first uh, quilt guild a couple months ago, and I made a friend through these live events. Hi, Deb Porter, if you're out there watching. Um, and I, I just started falling more and more in love with it. It's not something oh, that no, I, I, love it. I thought at first that I would enjoy as much as I do. I thought, when I, I'll be honest with everybody, when I first started, I, I wanted to do it for my job. I wanted to be able to, to communicate with people and understand you know, the language so that, that I could figure out a way to best serve them. And through that, I accidentally fell in love with it. And um, I am on my third quilt. I'm working on a couple projects right now. I'm learning that Yay. that is like, that's like quilting behavior. You start a project and then you get a little bit into it. Then you start another project, you get a little bit into yeah. it. You start another project, you get a little bit into it. And then you finally circle back and you finish that one project. So I just finished sewing my disappearing nine patch quilt top. Um, I'm Perfect. still deciding if I want to add a border to it, and then I'm going to try to mm -hmm. straight line quilt it. I love that. I love that you're learning. Yeah, I, it's right. super fun. And I'm excited to talk more about it with you in person in Nashville. So, Yeah, I think a Disappearing Nine Patch is a great one to start with. Um, or not to start, you've done a few, but I think that's a great one to venture into. It. I like to say that it's great for beginners just because it looks super complicated and it looks like you cut all these tiny little pieces and it's so time intensive, but in reality, it goes pretty fast um, and people are going to be amazed at your skills as a quilter, even though you're just a beginner. So again, I just laid them right sides together and now we've joined them into rows and I am going to pause here to press just because when we start matching up all of the rows, we want to make sure that our seams are flat. So I'm going to go ahead and pause here and do some pressing. Now, one of the problems I always have when I am doing a disappearing four patch or nine patch is that I forget what order I have them in. So if you are, you know, a little more organized than me, it'll probably go fine for you. But for me, I'm going to have to try and figure out how I had them all. All right. So let's see, how did we have them? I mean, it ends up scrappy either way. I'm pretty sure this goes over here though. Ah, uh, maybe not. 
Ah, uh, see, this is tough for me. I'm not even sure how I had it. But let's just say it goes like this. So we're going to lay right sides together. And again, we're going to pin all of our seams to make sure that they line up. Pinning on the right side. Now, normally, I'll confess, when I'm doing this myself, I don't pin. I'm a horrible non-pinner. And so far, it hasn't bit me in the butt too many times. So I've been able to get away with just kind of holding it and adjusting it as I go. Hey, Ellie. Yeah. Colleen wants to know what temperature you keep your iron at for the wool mat. Oh, this one is on high. Um, I'm working with 100% cotton, so I'm able to press on high. Awesome. And then Debbie wants to know if the iron comes with a base and if yes. it's just off camera. Yes. Oh, I wonder if I can show you. Okay. So that's the iron. This is the base. And so there's little prongs in here that your iron slips into to get heated up. And mine is filthy dirty right now, but yeah, it's, it sets in there. How long does it usually last on a full charge? I mean, it'll, it lasts quite a while. I have irons like maybe a third of a throw size quilt top as I'm pressing seams. Um, I mean, it lasts quite a while. Awesome. I don't know if they might have more information on their product description or their website or something like that, but maybe. Okay, and then we're going to do the top row. So we're gonna lay it right sides together. Match up my seams. Yeah, I'm, I'm not one of those cultures that has a million different notions. Um, I know there's some cultures, they have a hundred different kinds of rulers. And you know every different kind of pin or pin cushion, or, and I'm I'm really simple. I tend to just have like a couple rulers, and I use them for everything. Um, but there's some things I don't want to skimp on. So I want a really great iron. I want a great pressing mat. I want um, a long ruler, so maybe like a six and a half by twenty four and a half thing, and that way I can cut right off the bolt. And then I might also want maybe. So like this is a nine and a half inch that I'm using. I also, I have a bigger one I don't use too much. I also have like a six and a half that's really great. And then I have a couple of these that are a little bit longer, but thinner. So I don't have a whole bunch of them, but I like to have good quality stuff and then I can use it for whatever I need. This is our last seam, and then we'll take a look at our disappearing four patch. Ellie, to yes. mist or not to mist? I missed. I usually missed. Yep. I love my mister bottles. I have one that I put starch in. I use Terriel Magic, I think it's called, and I get a big jug of it, and I pour it in a Mr. Bottle. Phenomenal. Um, and I don't put steam in my iron. I have, I've had bad experience with that. Um, even using like bottled water, distilled water, whatever, I still had brown gunk go all over a white low volume quilt, and I was devastated. So I don't do that anymore. And I had to switch to a Mr. Bottle. And using a Mr. Bottle has been great. I have not had any problems with not steaming 
my fabric, I just give it a light mist and a press and it's great. And a lot of times you can see like I'm using this and I'm, I'm dry ironing and it still comes out fine. So I prefer not to steam just because I don't want to take the chance that I mess with my fabric and I just use Mr. Bottle. It's perfect. So this is our completed four patch. You can see it's super, super scrappy. And so again, you can do this in different variations. You can cut it diagonal. I've seen some where you cut very close to the center seam. And so you end up having a smaller uh, middle section and then larger squares out here. Um, I did mine kind of through the middle. So it ended up being just like a patchwork kind of thing. So that is a disappearing four patch. You can do the same thing with a disappearing nine patch. So instead of doing two of them, you would do three and then three rows. So three, three, and three, same thing, sew them together. Um, and again, you can cut that any different way. You can cut diagonally. You can, um, instead of a hash mark, like we did on this one where there's two here and two here, um, for a nine patch, I would just do an um, like a plus sign. So up the middle row and across the middle row. And then you can turn them all different directions, make it look as scrappy as you want, do it thin, do it fat, however you want to do it. So these are really versatile and super simple for beginners to try. That's one of my favorites. Ellie, Beth wants yes. to know why it's called disappearing. Uh, it's called disappearing because your, your four patch, this is the way I understand it. I don't know if there's like a technical thing out there that I'm not aware of, but um, your four patch is the four squares and the four squares disappear because you cut it all up into different shapes. And so it looks completely different by the time you're done. So I wanted to show you an example of a nine patch. So for instance, I started it for you. Um, and let's add another row. How should we do this? Maybe like this. So again, we're just gonna sew right sides together. I'll show you how they look a little bit different. And I can't chain stitch this one because we have it all the other rows done. We're just going to do a quick sew on this one. I'm just gonna finger press real quick so I can get this sewn onto the other one. skip my pins just for the sake of time. And I just adjust as I go. It's not a great quilting habit, but that's what I do. Okay. So here is our nine patch. press again. Oh, I'll also say about the Panasonic iron. I just heard it kick on. So it'll stay warm and then it'll kick on and heat it up again. Um, and it'll do that for a few times, but then it's going to turn itself off. So there's been many a time that I forget about it and I walk off and then I come back and it's turned off because I forgot that I even had it going. So that is a nice safety feature that it just kind of turns off after a while. All right, so here's our nine patch. So again, there's 
nine squares like this. So let's do what I said earlier. We'll just do a quick, um, let me get a bigger one. Okay. So we're just going to cut down the middle here and cut down the middle there. Um, is that middle? That is not middle. There we go. And again, I'm using my Grace True Cut. So everything stays straight. I'm just going to turn it around like this. Go down the middle again. Oops, I moved it. There we go. All right. Is this the style you were doing, Brian? The disappearing nine patch? Yes. So I'm do I was doing the disappearing nine patch exactly the way you're cutting it. Yeah. And then I believe I turned the top right and the bottom left corners in I wanna say 180 degrees. Yeah. So the I biggest usually, square was one middle. Yeah. I usually yep. do something exactly. like this. Yeah. Yeah. So then if you were to sew them together, they'd look like that. So again, it looks super fancy. It looks like as a quilter, you put so much time and effort into this. And as a beginner, you can really wow people because they think that you spent so much time cutting all these little squares and sewing them together. When in reality, you maybe just grabbed a charm pack, which is five inch squares, sewed nine of them together and cut it up like this. And it was you know super easy to do. So just for the sake of time, I want to move on to another one so that we can get through a few of them. I want to show you all half square triangles. I want to show you traditional half square triangles. Um, I've already prepped this one. So this is two blocks that are the same size. It doesn't matter what size square. Um, and I've drawn a line from one corner to another corner. And then I sewed down a quarter inch on either side of that line. And you're going to cut down this line. And then when you open it up, you have two triangles. So it's a half of a square, but it's a triangle. So that's why they're called half square triangles. So this gives you two blocks like this, because you'll have one like this. And then when you cut it apart, you'll have the other side that looks like that. So that is the traditional way of doing them. Um, the other way that I wanted to show you that not a lot of people know about, but this comes in really handy when you have a quilt that has, or you want to make a quilt, or maybe you have a pattern that calls for a lot of half square triangles is the eight at a time method. So same thing, two squares that are the same size and I've pinned mine together so they don't shift around on me. And we're gonna draw the same thing, a line from corner to corner, but then we're also gonna draw a line from corner to corner here. And so on both of these lines, we're going to sew down either side of them. So it's gonna be four lines that we are sewing on. It's gonna take me a minute, but I wanted to make sure I showed you this. So this is something I like to do sometimes with scraps. If I have some blocks, um, some bigger blocks, I'll just go ahead and throw them together and make a bunch of half square triangles and you can put them into a scrappy quilt. And you can do some scrap busting with all your leftover scraps from your quilt. So that's the one side and then we'll do the other side. Ellie, do you mind if I ask you a question? Uh, no, go ahead. Uh -uh. So 
there was some talk in the chat about pressing seams. You know, you press your seams open because you feel that it gives you less bulk. Some people press their seams to the dark side. Some people yeah. nest their seams. Do you want yeah. to touch on for the beginners? Mm -hmm. You know, in the quilting community, we all have a different way of doing things. Do you want to touch on that a yeah. little bit? Yeah, definitely. Um, I like to say when I'm teaching beginners that there's no one right way. There's, there's no quilting school that people go to. It's not like becoming a lawyer and this is how it has to go. Um, quilting is an art form and it has been passed down from generation to generation. And so I might do things the way that my grandma did it because that's how I learned. And somebody else does something the way that their grandma did it because that's how they were taught. Um, they're, yeah, pressing seams and I'll say pre-washing fabric or scorching fabric are probably like the, the things that people get in disagreements about. But I, I think every quilter has their own personal thing that is important to them. So for instance, somebody might feel it's really important to nest their seams and that's how they like to do it. And so they're gonna press to one side and on the other thing, press to another side so they can nest their seams together. That's fine, do, do it that way. Um, I think the reason I, I pressed open was because um, number one, that's how my grandma did it and that's why I was shown, but also because when I was starting, my machine wasn't a great machine. And so um, it didn't allow me to sew over any bumps or sometimes even like on your long arm, your long arm will, will skip some stitches if there's some bumps. So it might depend on your machine. Um, I, I think there's been lots of talk about uh, like pressing to one side and having your seams pressed to one side and nested it makes the seams stronger. And I don't know, I feel like that's really a holdover from olden days when we didn't have machines like this, you know? So if I was hand sewing something, I would definitely want to make sure that my seams are pressed to the side. And as I quilt, maybe I, I'm quilting through those seams that have folded over and it makes it really strong and it held together well. But in this day and age, we have really amazing machines. We have really small stitch length. And so I don't know, I haven't had seams popping. Um, and I have, I think I've pressed open for as long as I've been quilting. And then as you're quilting, remember also, so let's say for instance, these are some seams on your quilt that you have sewn. And as you're quilting, you're coming, you're quilting over these seams and they're going to hold the seams down. So I don't know, I haven't experienced any problem with pressing open as long as you are quilting well and you're quilting over those. Um, you're not using a big stitch length. My stitch length is usually about a two. Um, so I haven't had any trouble. I know there's lots of controversy, but I'll just say that's my take on it. That's why I do it. Um, I think, you know, other people can do what they want. It's not my project. It's not my quilt. So I say do what you want and whatever works for you and your machine. Um, I hope that answers it. Is that okay? That was a great answer. So... All right, now that I've sewn down both sides of those lines, we're gonna cut on the lines, just like we did with our traditional half square triangles. <clears throat> and then we're also going to be cutting a plus sign. So we're gonna be cutting through, just like this, we're gonna be cutting through the middle part of the triangle lines. I don't know what you would call that, but yeah, it's not a seam. So we want to make sure <clears throat> we want to make sure that we're lining up our a line here along one edge of our block and it's going to hit that middle point where the lines converge. And then we're going to do the same thing when we turn it around. We'll do it this way. Okay, and then when we open these up, you're gonna see 
all of these half square triangles. Oh, I didn't cut all the way through there. Um, there we go. So you have all of these. This is going to give you eight of them. Oh, goodness. I might need to change my rotary blade. This is getting a little, I might cut all the way through. So it's nice when you have scraps left over and you just want to, you know, maybe make a whole bunch of squares that are maybe eight inches, 10 inches even, and make a whole bunch of half square triangles. And then you can, half square triangles are so versatile. So if you can master half square triangle, you can do all different kinds of patterns on your quilts. So you could just use some scraps, a whole bunch of half square triangles. You can make them into a chevron. You can make them, you can put two together and make something that kind of looks like flying geese, if you can see that. Um, you can do so many different things and you can just have fun laying them out. Um, we can put a whole bunch of these ones together uh, and make them into kind of like a diamond shape. So kind of like a square in a square, if you've seen that block. Um, super versatile, half square triangles are amazing. I know they're a pain to trim um, because if you are doing anything with a triangle, know that it's on the bias and it might be stretchy. And so as carefully as you sew and press and cut and everything, um, you might uh, definitely need to um, trim them up. And I also, how much time do we have left? Because I want to see if I have time to do a little bit more. Oops. You've got about 10 minutes. Oh my goodness. Okay. I'm not going to have a ton of time, but we're going to do our best. Well, I was going to show you a star block, but maybe I can just lay it out so you can see. No, I don't, I don't have time for that. Okay. Let me show you another quick, quick trip, quick tip. Um, so just like we did eight at a time flying geese, we're going to do four, sorry, eight at a time half square triangles. I want to show you four at a time flying geese. Um, when I was learning to quilt, flying geese was, I mean, it was the bane of my existence. I could never get them to sit right or trim right. And I found this method, um, I think on Pinterest one time, I was like, I got to do it because it's so much easier. So we're going to do four at a time. We have now there, okay, there is math that goes along with this. So maybe check out Pinterest or uh, maybe I'll, maybe I'll make one and put it on our website. Um, there is math. You need it to be a certain size. So you're going to have a larger square here. Let me look at my notes. I'll tell you what it is. It is a uh, five and a half inch square. And then these are three inch squares and you need four, three inch squares. And on your small squares, you're going to draw a line corner to corner, just like when we did half square triangles. And we're going to lay two of them like this in each corner. And then you will want to pin these because they can shift around on you. And I find that I get the best results with this when I put my smaller square just inside the block. So you have a tiny like 16th of an inch um inside of your big block and then again we're going to sew down both sides of that line just like half square triangle and the little squares do overlap that's what they're supposed to do so don't get worried if you see them overlapping and you think you're doing it wrong you're not And now we're gonna cut down the line, just like when we were doing half square triangles. Okay. And then you'll see when you open these, they kind of look like a heart, but don't get freaked out. It's supposed to look like that. Oh goodness, we have our office mascot that's a little upset. I'm going to make noise and bark, I'm sorry. Okay, so let's pretend that I've pressed that. We're going to take another one of our three inch squares and we're gonna place it this way. 
so that it goes in between our heart points and it's right there in this point. And we're gonna pin it down again. And you're gonna do this on both of them. But for the sake of time, I'm just gonna do it on this one. And then we're gonna sew down both of those lines. Now, we've done both sides of the line and we're gonna cut on that line just like we did with our half square triangles. And then let me move all of this so I can press it and you'll see what I'm talking about. Brian, I think your next thing is going to be flying geese or half square triangles. Oh, I am avoiding flying geese. I love doing half square triangles. I find squaring them up very satisfying, but uh, flying geese and me are not friends at the moment, but hopefully I'll kind of dive into them a little bit more as I get a little bit more advanced. <laughs> this is a super easy way. Um, you can get a lot of them done at one time. You get four done at one time. So I haven't done this other one. So I'm just going to show you the two, but know that you'll be able to make four. So yeah, this is, this is two of them. So super easy way to get all of them done. Um, if again, if you have a pattern that has a lot of flying geese, know that this is a great way to do it. Um, and again, you can join these together in all different ways. So let's say that, and you do need to trim these also, by the way, just because we know that they're cut on the bias. So let's say that you put two of them together and you would have a square in a square if you wanted to do that kind of thing. Um, some people will do all different scrappy colors and a neutral background. And then they have some like rows of them going this way and a row of them pointing that way. So there's all different variations to this again, but great, great use of scraps. And yeah, you can make four at a time. So a lot of people get to this stage where they have um, cut them and it looks like a heart and then they start to get freaked out. And so they're like, I don't know what to do from here. And it, it's fine, just add your extra square down there and then finish it up, you end up with four. So that's another, a little, a little advanced beginner one, but I think definitely something that would, that would be something that if you've done a couple quilts or, you know, like you've been doing um, nine patch or disagree nine patch or some half square triangles, I think you can try and, and master some flying geese. I bet you could do it. I'll send you a pattern and you can try and see how that turns out. I would love that. As long as I get to phone you, if, if everything yeah. goes awry. <laughs> yeah, I will say definitely because we do a lot of work with beginners and a lot of our patterns are for beginners. I do get a lot of emails on the website and they're like, hey, I'm on step whatever and I'm not quite sure how to do this or I'm running into this issue. How can you help me? And I'm like, absolutely. Um, so I'll email them back to answer their question or uh, one or two times I've actually hopped on like Zoom or something and tried to show them and talk to them about it. So I, I love teaching beginners. That's really what I'm here for and um, love to help. Yeah. Well, thank you for doing that because if you were here at all yesterday, the first second segment of the day was Courtney Govro. And yeah. we had a really nice conversation about how important it is to keep the craft alive, to pass yeah. down information i keep dropping my pumpkins um to pass down <laughs> that you know the the uh experience and the knowledge from previous generations to the new generations yeah. to try yeah. to keep the craft going so that it doesn't die so i think yeah. what you're doing is super important 
Yeah, I, I remember maybe um, 10 or 15 years ago or so I was uh, visiting with someone and she was maybe like young 30s, had young kids. And she said, like, I said, oh, I see you have a sewing machine. Do you do you do sewing? She goes, oh, yeah, I'm a quilter. And I was like, what? Like, I it's, it's rare that I come across young quilters. And it's mainly probably women my age, like mid 40s and above. And so I love to see the diversity that's coming, um, the inclusivity of everyone. Like, hey, this is a great art form. And I don't care who you are, you know, just it's a way to express yourself. It's an art form. I used it for many years as a self-care hobby. I worked in an extremely stressful profession. And so this was the way that I could kind of decompress and ignore yeah. everything going on out there and create something beautiful and just be creative and, and do some self-care. So I mean, it's good for everybody, I think. Yeah. I agree. Well, I'm super excited that you were able to join us for this event. Thank you for sharing your knowledge. You yeah, and I will be in touch. Yeah. Uh, you and I will be in touch about OSQE and uh, well, I guess we'll see each other in like three ish yeah. weeks or so. Three weeks or so. Yeah. Uh -huh. I'll be there. Oh, one last thing before I let you go. We got to do the giveaway. So we got to do oh. a drum roll. So let's let Alex pull up the giveaway tool and then I'll let you know when. And everybody at home, if you want to drum roll with us, you are welcome to. If you can't make noise because you're at work or whatever, uh, put a drum roll emoji in the chat and we'll know you're doing it with us. All right. Ready, set, go. Paula Gardner. Yay. Paula has been here for a couple events. And I think this might be, she. I think she's won something before, maybe. I, I may be misquoting, don't quote me on that. So, but Polly, I believe you know what to do, but just in case to claim your prize, visit www.sewingpartsonline.com forward slash Sew Creative Live. You'll scroll down to the giveaway section and fill out the form. Paula, you won the Sew Creative Live thread kit, which also enters you into the grand fa finale giveaway for the Dream Sewing Room makeover. So we'll draw that at the end of the day on Friday. Well, uh, Ellie, uh, thanks again for joining us, and I hope you have a great rest of your day. Yes, happy to be here. Thanks for having me. See you later. Awesome. Let me write down Paula's name before I forget. Alex, is our next pre presenter ready to go? Okay, let's get her pulled up. So we have Ashley Jones joining us from Dime. Uh, she joined us for our spring social, and her segment was fantastic. We learned a lot about quilting in the hoop, and this time she's going to teach us about using the sticky hoops from Dime. So let's go ahead and get her pulled up. Hey, hey Ashley, Brian, how's it going? How it's going I'm good. I'm glad to be here with you. Hey, are y'all located in Texas? My home office is. I actually work uh, in my home in Florida, but yes, home office is in Dallas, Texas. That's your home that you work out of? Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I have to say, you did a really good job decorating your home sewing room <laughs> studio because I noticed it last time. I was like, dang, Ashley's setup is beautiful. So kudos to you. Well, thank you. Um, I don't want anybody to look on the opposite side. This always looks <laughs> presentable, but over there, Brian, it looks like every other crafter's room, which looks like, you know, a craft or a fabric store bomb went off. It's all movie magic, right? I mean, I'm wearing this nice button up, but uh, I'm also wearing gym shorts and flip flops. So you just, you know, you, we only show the pretty stuff. So uh, <laughs> Ashley, right. do you want to tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do? Yeah, for sure. So I've been working for Dime since uh, 2014 and uh, we were um, traveling and now we're doing most everything virtually. And so uh, I have really enjoyed working in this industry. It's really fun. Um, I came from an IT uh, job. I have an IT degree and I worked in that field for a lot of years and uh, just kind of accidentally happened upon this job and I've never looked back. It's so fun. Uh, all of of the um, crafters, embroiderers, sewers are so fun to be with. I love sharing my knowledge and the things that I've learned uh, from Eileen and from Deborah Jones, which I work directly with every day. Um, and so, yeah, so just uh, everything crafting, embroidery, and um, just, yeah, loving it. 
Now you do this a lot, right? You live stream like all the time. Right, we do. So we do uh, um, lives uh, all week long. Um, we have presentations that we have other educators that present. Um, and then we also do a Facebook and YouTube live twice a week as well. So yes, um, we are always online and always uh, bringing everyone something new. Well, awesome. I am super excited to learn about the sticky hoops. So I'm going to go ahead and let you take over. I'll put your overhead cam up. And then if you need me at all, just call my name. Okay. Okay. Sounds great. Brian, should I answer questions as I go? Or are we going to do Q and A at the end? Um, I, I find it easier to do Q and Q and A at the end. That way we're not interrupting your presentation. Does that work for you? That's perfect. Thank you so much. All right, guys. So I want to talk to you about Sticky Hoop. Uh, this is a, one of my favorite products from Dime because it can make your life super easy um, and it can make your hooping really efficient. Um, so so sticky hoop, uh, this is what it looks like. It comes in the package that looks like this. It is a flat metal hoop and it does connect to your embroidery machine the same exact way your standard hoops do, attach. And so this attachment, I've got the same hoop here. Uh, this attachment um, fits a FOF or a Viking embroidery machine. Um, and we have hoops for all brands of home embroidery machines. And I'll uh, share some of those different ones with you. But it does slide into your embroidery unit. So your machine does recognize it and know the size. So let's see what it's all about. So Sticky Hoop uh, comes with the hoop itself, but it also comes with uh, five sheets of stabilizer that are pre-cut to the size. You can see those are perfect for the size there. It comes with these adhesive rulers, four of them. And I'll show you what we do with those. Um, and so you're ready to go once you get your sticky hoop. So when you get your sticky hoop, I definitely would keep this uh, board that it's on. This board is great for just transporting your hoop. Um, we don't ever want to put pressure on the stabilizer when we're transporting because if it, you know, it could come loose. So this is great for just holding the hoop and it keeps your fingers from putting uh, pressure against your stabilizer. Okay, so when you get your sticky hoop, we're going to talk about how you're going to get started with it. And I'm going to talk about what you're going to use it for as well. So the sticky hoop is a flat metal hoop and sticky stabilizer attaches to the back of the hoop. Um, now, I already have a piece because I've already stitched this cross here to show you how to align your, um, your rulers. And so you actually place the sticky stabilizer right to the back of the hoop. You can kind of see um, how mine is placed. I've got it hanging off that end, which is perfectly fine. Now over on the front here, now I'm going to peel this. I just put that to keep that uh, um, from getting dirty. Now I have attached a piece of sticky stabilizer that comes in the package. You get those five sheets of tearaway, uh, tearaway sticky that is. And then it tells you where to download this embroidery design. This embroidery design is just a run stitch crosshair so that you could then get your rulers on your hoop straight. Every embroidery machine has a different center of the sewing field. So different brands, um, not every single machine, but um, different brands have different centers of the uh, the hoop. Um, so you can see I loaded this design. I stitched it just as is. And I then lined my rulers up, which you get, and they're adhesive. So you then just place those on your hoop and trim off the excess, which I've actually already done. Um, and that's going to mark the center of your sewing field. Now, um, as you guys know, if, if you're looking at your standard hoop, some brands, the uh, notches are not center with the entire hoop. They're what we call sewing field. We have this space around our hoop that we can't embroider that is going to accommodate the size of your embroidery foot. So um, we've got this imaginary field in the center there that we are going to be stitching um, on any hoop, whether it is a dime hoop or your standard hoop. 
Okay, so that's my sticky hoop. You can see it's a flat metal um, and we stick our stabilizer to the back of the hoop. So how easy is that, right? Um, and then you'll apply your rulers. Now, once you get your rulers and you're ready to get started, let's see what we can do with our sticky hoop. So I'm going to set this out of the way and move this to the side here. And I've got another one uh, that we're going to talk about. So um, I've got now, this is a sticky hoop for a brother baby lock machine. So like I said, we have them for a variety of different machine brands and models. Um, check uh, um, uh, Brian. Ryan, I'm sure can tell you uh, how to find which one will go with your machine for your shopping today. Um, but do make sure that you select the correct one. Okay, so I've got my sticky hoop and I've got my piece of pre-cut stabilizer. Now the pre-cut stabilizer, we do have refill packages that I'm going to talk to you about um, in two different kinds. Okay. So I peel off the release paper and this is sticky. And now the easiest way to apply this is to flip this over on your surface and then put that sticky stabilizer right on the back. Now I'm working with a small uh, sticky hoop. It's the four by four and we make them all the way up to a 11 by 18, depending on your brand of machine. So when you're working with a piece of stabilizer that's really large, you can put the release paper down and then flip your hoop over while you're working with it uh, so that it doesn't stick to the surface underneath. I also like to hang my hoop off the edge of my uh, table and it'll make it a flat surface. So if you put your table there, um, it'll make this lay flat. And so having that release paper underneath will just make sure it doesn't stick. On the smaller hoops, it's really easy. Um, but when you're dealing with that really large sheet of uh, sticky stabilizer, then that's a really good tip to do. And we'll, I'll show you that again on the next uh, hooping that we do. Okay. So now I've got my sticky stabilizer applied and um, I'm ready to hoop something. So now the stabilizer uh, that I'm using is a tearaway adhesive stabilizer. So in order to um, use this, I'm just going to stick my item to it. So for instance, what kinds of things would you use to hoop with your uh, sticky hoop. Now, this is one. This is the a little round, like kind of a jewelry case. There is a little bit of padding in the top. I'm dealing with the zipper and and the seam here, or the the uh, the bias tape that's covering the edge there, and I could not get that in my standard hoop. Now, lucky for me, uh, this zips uh, all the way around, which makes it really easy to place down on my sticky hoop. So I just get that into position, um, and I can use the the crosshair here or your item, however you've marked it, to get that in position. And then I just press it down, and I'm ready to go to the embroidery machine. Of course, you want to support uh, the weight of this bag here, since this is a small one. This would sit on the inside of my machine uh, while I'm moving. Um, you could hoop it around the other direction so that it's hanging over the attachment as well. Um, so this is really one good use of it. Once you've stitched, uh, you're then just going to rip it away. Um, and uh, you're ready to go. So now this is a pretty stable item. Like I said, it's got foam in it. Uh, the fabric itself is pretty stable. So this tearaway stabilizer is perfect. Yes, it's going to leave some stabilizer around my uh, monogram, but it's going to be on the inside. And so I'm really not concerned about, uh, you know, what that is going to look like on the back. So um, you might also want to use a sticky hoop for something like these. The If you can find these spa slippers, that Velcro. Um, these are excellent for doing embroidery. And so you can place that down uh, in your sticky hoop um, for embroidery. And in this case here, I could actually get two. So anytime I can get multiples in one hoop, I definitely like to do that because that's going to use more of my stabilizer. And I can just flip this one around so that I've got both of the soles on uh, one side there and then uh, take that to my embroidery machine. I've got plenty of space between these two uh, texts to do my embroidery. And you can see that uh, the soles both here on the left hand side uh, are being supported um, just by flipping it around. You just need to make sure you rotate 
your design at your embroidery machine uh, for that bottom set of text there. So don't forget that. But this is another really good example of um, using adhesive stabilizer. Now this is going to tear away. So um, you can see that it does uh, have a little bit of stabilizer left. I've ripped away most of it. So it does rip nice and clean right up next to the letters. So I was pleased with the tear away. If you ever need the stabilizer to completely disappear, I have an option for you uh, for that coming up here in just a bit. Um, but you can see that it rips away nicely. It does not leave an adhesive residue and that one even better. So we've got just that long word. I just have a little piece there right in the uh, that loop of that F. Um, and so the tearaway stabilizer was perfect for this. Now, since this is going to be against your, uh, your skin, um, you might want to cover that with a um, particular type of stabilizer that covers the back of embroidery. Um, that's another way to make it really soft, but honestly, it feels actually really nice. So, and so that's another good example of how uh, you would use a sticky stabilizer. Now, what about embroidering on paper? Um, so this uh, little card here, this is a card stock that I used kind of an open airy uh, design. And I embroidered uh, by just sticking that right to my uh, stabilizer. And then when I was all done, I ripped it away. So you can see the inside here. Now, before I would give this, um, you know how when you get a card at the store, it has that really decorative paper where the text is. So I would just put um, a decorative piece of paper or nice pretty color uh, on the inside and it would completely cover that. But if you're ever stitching on paper, uh, this tear away stabilizer is perfect um, and it stitched out beautifully and held up really nicely. So paper is another uh, good use of your uh, sticky stabilizer and your sticky hoop. Um, what else have I got here? So um, here we have uh, what about the tongue of a shoe? So have you ever wanted to embroider on uh, something like these uh, cute little tennis shoes um, and put an initial or something on the tongue? Um, if it's large enough and you're putting a, a design that's small enough, you might be able to work over here and uh, really kind of uh, move this out of the way. But the tongue is actually pretty easy. And I would do the same thing here. So I would uh, center that um, in my hoop there and stick that down. And now when I head to the embroidery machine, again, uh, you're going to want to support the weight of this and I can center my design. Now with this particular item, um, I definitely want to make sure to put it in this orientation because um, I need to be able to get the uh, attachment onto my embroidery machine. So having this excess because it won't slide under the needle um, is going to really make a difference. You could also turn this one so that it's floating on the bed of your machine as well. You just don't want it back here where you've got to get it uh, pulled against your needle, but you could also put it uh, this direction as well. And the bed of your machine will most likely support that as it's embroidering. So uh, either way would work great. Sticky stabilizer works great with this. Um, and again, it's going to rip away. It's Especially if you've got a single letter like this, it's going to rip away really easily. Um, now, this is a canvas material and uh, this waffle weave material that we were using here of the uh, slippers is a very stable fabric. So if you wanted to use a stabilizer that disappeared, you certainly could. Um, and I have some more examples of that um, that we're going to be talking about. Um, what about socks? Have you ever embroidered on socks? Um, this is a really uh, cute idea. Just get some fun, uh, whimsical socks and then just put a little initial or a little word on there. Um, and socks are stretchy. So the sticky stabilizer is actually going to prevent this from stretching while I am embroidering. So I would just stick that down into place and get my design into position there to stick, uh, to stitch that little example. So Sticky is also good um, to keep an item from stretching. Now, for the socks, I definitely would use a um, uh, like the tear away because I don't want this stabilizer to completely disappear. Um, since the knit of the sock is a really unstable fabric, um, I want to make sure I have stabilizer that remains. Uh, and this adhesive tear away is going to remain behind the letter, although I'm going to rip away any excess. 
excess from the outside. Uh, so socks are a really good example. Now I've got a tip for this. Take a look at this. So this tiny little letter and I've got all of this stabilizer out here. So of course I could put multiples uh, in this particular hoop. I could do something like this for this little C here. I could do uh, another sock on the other side. So you can hoop multiples if you'd like. Um, and then I have a tip too uh, for just kind of patching the stabilizer. And then we could put something else down here as well. So something maybe like this. So um, a little luggage tag. And then I could put this direction and I'm using up more of my uh, stabilizer in this instance here. So I definitely like to conserve as much as I can, um, you know, so that any money I can save can go to a new machine. Right. So I love that. Um, but when you're embroidering on knits, you want to make sure that you've got a stabilizer that's going to stay um, and remain in the design. And again, this once I embroider uh, this cute little compass, which I thought would be cute on this little luggage tag, I'm just going to rip away the excess stabilizer. It's going to be behind. So it's really um, not an issue uh, with the stabilizer. Don't need it to rinse away in any uh, situation like this. So, so there's some other examples here. So um, here's another Whoa, sorry about that. <laughs> just had a had an avalanche. Here's another example of something that stretches. Um, so this uh, cute little fleece, uh, little lovey blanket here, um, the fleece stretches. So I definitely would want to use, if I'm going to choose between my adhesive stabilizers that we're talking about today, I definitely want to use this tearaway. It's going to stay behind the, the design. And I know that a lot of times we don't like to see the stabilizer on the back. The nice thing about stitching on white, the stabilizer's white, you're not going to see it. This is a large uh, area design. When I rip away that stabilizer, it's going to rip cleanly away from that edge. So it's not going to leave a lot of excess. Um, this area in the center here is applique. And so I'd be able to pull that large piece of stabilizer that is uh, in the center here, but it's going to leave stabilizer behind the stitches of my satin stitch and those fill stitches uh, that make up the, the design. So when you're stitching on something that has any stretch to it, uh, it's you don't want your stabilizer to completely disappear. Now, if you're stitching on something more stable, your stabilizer can disappear with no issue. And I'm going to show you that here in just a bit. But uh, this cute little design here, um, is perfect for this little little knit item here. And since we're embroidering close to the edge, this is another great reason for sticky hoop. Um, now, you know that we could hoop this if we wanted, um, but when, since we're close to the edge, it's easier to just stick this down to our adhesive stabilizer. Now, uh, that is another uh, really good example. So let's talk about um, different, another type of stabilizer. So this is my peel and stick tear away. So Dime makes what we call refill packs of the adhesive stabilizer. So you can see I'm using a four by four hoop. And here are my two refill pack options for the four by four uh, hoop. I've got the sticky hoop refill pack, which is the tearaway peel and stick. That's what um, I'm using right now. It comes with five sheets in your uh, package when you get your sticky hoop. So you'll get to test it out and, and use it. It does not gum up your needle. Um, it holds securely and it's, you know, good for a variety of different embroideries. And you've probably used sticky stabilizer. Um, we've just hooped it and scored it uh, and then used it in our standard hoop. So in this case, it's the same concept, only we're sticking it to the back of our hoop. Now, the other type of stabilizer that you can use for uh, your uh, sticky hoop is uh, a wash away stabilizer. So this stabilizer, again, pre-cut stabilizer, and this stabilizer is a... Uh, um, wash away stabilizer completely dissolves. It's a woven type wash away. So it is a really strong and can support a lot of stitches. Um, so this is our adhesive sew and wash. And again, pre-cut uh, for our sticky stabilizer that you see here. 
Um, so I'm going to show you some things that you can use the stabilizer for. Um, we've seen some that work great for the tear away. Um, but really, some of these things, it's, it's a personal preference. So it depends on uh, what item you're stitching on, uh, the stability of the item itself, and then um, if you're going to see the back or not. So it just depends on, on which item. So both of these are great for your sticky hoop. We have these pre-cut stabilizers in all of the sizes for all of our uh, different hoops. And we have lots of different hoop sizes. In fact, uh, let me head over and I'll show you uh, those different ones now. And again, for ordering purposes, uh, make sure that you um, check with the, um, you know, Brian, how to order, how to make sure to select your correct hoop. But I will show you uh, the different ones we have. So you guys st saw the sticky hoop under the camera and we're using this uh, for adhesive stabilizer. So anytime you have an eye item that is hard to hoop or impossible to hoop, a lot of times we can stick it to our stabilizer to get it under the needle so we can embroider it on, embroider on it. So I love to embroider on pretty much anything that is not nailed down. So we call this a uh, hoopless embroidery because we're not having to uh, actually attach a top or a uh, sideless embroidery um, is another uh, term that we use for the sticky hoop. Um, so again, it's a flat metal frame, which makes trimming really easy. If you're doing an applique, um, you're not having to deal with the sides of your hoop, which is really nice. Um, and and you, you can see in these pictures, your materials can extend beyond the sewing field um, because we're really just sticking that area to our hoop that we want to embroider. So the each sticky hoop that you get comes with five pre-cut sheets of the peel and stick tear away adhesive stabilizer. And the sheets that you get, of course, will be pre-cut to the size of the hoop that you are getting. Um, and this is uh, was really created to keep any sticky residue off of our Snap Hoop Monster. If you guys are familiar with uh, Dimes Magnetic Hoops, um, we didn't want to stick to the back of those and get that sticky uh, residue to that um, hoop there. So... Okay, so whoops, sorry about that. Let me back up here. I was it wasn't keeping up and it was clear I was clicking too fast. So we have uh sticky hoops for um brother, baby lock, Janome, Fof, Viking, um, and Bernina. So we have a variety of different sizes, and make sure you choose the one that will work with your embroidery machine. So just because we have an eight by twelve hoop, if your embroidery machine will not stitch an eight by 12, then you won't be able to use that hoop. So you have to choose the hoop that's based on your machine brand and model and the size of your sewing field. So for sticky hoop for brother or baby lock, um, we have a variety of sizes. You could see here four by four, five by seven, six by six. That's actually a fairly newly hoop and it does not get the credit that it deserves. So it came out uh, last year and um, I'm not even sure that everyone is familiar that we have it, but um, I four by four and five by seven used to be my go-to sizes, but now six by six is like a perfect hoop size. Um, you can do a decent size embroidery there and you're not dealing with that big area wasting too much of your stabilizer. Um, we also have six by 10, seven by 12, eight by eight, eight by 12, nine and a half by nine and a half, nine and a half by 14, 10 and five eighths square and 10 and five eighths by 16. So huge hoops all the way down to the small hoops. So those are the sizes that we have for uh, brother and baby locks. So make sure you um, add those uh, and uh, check them out, get them while they're special, uh, on special here for the, uh, the So Creative Live. Um, so Fof and Viking. So we have uh, 120 by 120, 200 by 200, 200 by 260, and 200 by 360. Uh, those are the sizes. We list these in millimeters because the machine manufacturer lists their hoops in uh, millimeters as well. So we use the uh, size that the manufacturer um, uses. Uh, if you want to do a little bit of math, you can, um, you know, calculate those sizes in inches. Um, and so check those out. Those four sizes for sticky hoop um, for the Foff and Viking embroidery machines. 
So now Janome, uh, we have quite a few sizes for Janome and we have some new ones. So does anybody out there have um, the new um, embroidery uh, machine from Janome? That is the M17. We now make hoops uh, for that machine. Uh, so we have a variety of different sizes, the five by seven, uh, the 5.5 by 7.9 is for the CM17. We have eight by eight, 8 by 11, 8 by 12, the 11 by 11, which is for the CM17, and 11 by 18.1, a massive hoop uh, for uh, the Janome CM17. So all of those uh, sticky hoops, again, your attachment will look just like the attachment for your standard hoops for any of these sticky uh, hoops that we have from Dime. And now for uh, Bernina. So Bernina, we have uh, 145 by 255, 150 by 400. Um, we also have 165 by 265 and 210 by 400, 260 by 400. Uh, and so those are the sizes of sticky hoops that we have for Bernina. Again, those attachments will look just like the attachments for your embroidery machine and will attach the same exact way. The embroidery machine does does recognize the hoop size uh, for these sticky hoops. So there's uh, um, no learning curve. You use them the same way that you use your standard hoops. So isn't that awesome? So they're really easy, uh, easy to use. And I know some people like to use sticky uh, hoops and sticky stabilizer for nearly every project. So there are some people that really like to be hoopless <laughs> all the time. And so I showed you these under my camera, but just kind of a reminder. So the two different types of stabilizer pre-cuts that we have are the adhesive sew and wash, which is a water soluble uh, stabilizer. It has a woven kind of look to it. So you uh, um, will be able to use a high stitch count on that stabilizer. It is not the same type of water soluble that is like the film. This is a adhesive uh, woven looking water soluble stabilizer. So it uh, um, gives you more stability. And then we also have the peel and stick, which is the tear away, which is what I started with. And we were talking about those different things that we could uh, use with the um, the tear away uh, adhesive stabilizer. So let me head back over and let's talk about some uh, tips for um, items that you can use with the adhesive sew and wash, things that you might want the stabilizer to dissolve and you don't see any stabilizer on the back. But of course, we do have to make sure that our item is uh, safe to get wet if we're dissolving this stabilizer. So I'm going to go back over to my camera here. And so I'm going to set uh, these two aside. Those are our refill. Uh, packages. So make sure you're getting both the uh, refills um, with the size sticky hoop that you're getting. Okay. So, okay. So I'm going to set this one aside. We might come back to that four by four. And so now I'm going to use my uh, five by seven size. This is like probably a hoop that I use the most. Um, and I've got my, um, for this one, I'm going to be using the adhesive sew and wash. So the adhesive sew and wash is adhesive, just like we talked about, but look at the difference in uh, this stabilizer versus this one. So you can see um, that we've got a little bit of a more uh, a darker opaque look. This is the tear away. This is the one that's going to dissolve and wash away the one that's in my hand. Okay. So to put this on the back of your hoop, remember you can use this release paper and put that, let me set this down here. Um, you can place that down on your surface so that when you flip your hoop over and you place your stabilizer, as you're down, it's not sticking to your table. Um, and then you're just going to apply that to the back. Now, before I do that, look at that stuff on the back. We get this question a lot. Look at all that residue. I do not bother cleaning that off. You know, when I remove my stabilizer uh, each time, you know, some of it will come off, but not all of it. These hoops I only use, and they are only designed to use with adhesive stabilizer. So I don't bother cleaning that off. Now, if that bothers you, and you want to clean it off, uh, you could do so with maybe some uh, um, alcohol. Um, you could use like the adhesive remover, but I would be very careful with that because some of that is has an oily texture and you 
don't want that to get on your embroidery. So uh, if you do use something uh, that is an adhesive remover that has an oily texture, just make sure that you clean your hoop really, really well. I found just, you know, uh, some alcohol will help dissolve it and then you can get most of it off. But honestly, unless it really bothers you, I mean, this is the only thing that you're using this hoop for is to attach another piece of adhesive stabilizer. So I really don't even uh, worry about cleaning that off. And it sticks each time I've used this a ton. So don't think that it's not going to stick to the hoop really well. So, and I'm just uh, making sure that this is nice and taut. So when I place my stabilizer on, I just, you know, make sure I kind of pull to make sure I've got a really nice taut uh, flat surface here. So you can see here over on the opposite side. Now, if I was not going to use this right away, I usually will put this back on. That's going to keep keep any dust or any threads or lint or anything from uh, falling on it because that'll make it less adhesive. Uh, so if you were, if you hoop this up and then you changed your mind about what you were doing, which definitely happens to me, um, then you can definitely um, uh, put this to cover it up uh, for sure. So, and then just uh, peel that off when you're ready to use. Um, okay. So now this is our adhesive sew and wash. So what kinds of things might we want uh, to put on a stabilizer that dissolves? So you guys can tell me some of the things that maybe you guys use over there um, in the chat. So what about this? Have you ever done a, a napkin where the embroidery is hanging off the edge? So this is actually freestanding lace and I wanted it partly stitched on the napkin and partly stitched off. So I needed that water soluble because the part that hangs off the edge, it needed to completely disappear. But also because it's a napkin, I wanted it to look decent on the back. So I matched my bobbin uh, thread color uh, uh, to the top so that it looks, you know, fairly nice on the back. So when you're stitching on the edge of something like this, you need the stabilizer to disappear because if we were to use our tearaway stabilizer like this, of course, we'd have all of that stuff left and that is not what we want. So when you're stitching on the edge of an item or close to the edge of an item and you're using freestanding lace, that's definitely something you would want an adhesive sewing wash with. And this sticky uh, hoop is perfect for this type of item. Okay. So now, so that's a really good example. Now I have one to show you. Um, here's another really good example. So this one is hanging off of the corner of a napkin and I've got my design. So in order to do this, um, what you're going to do is I love templates. As you can see, I have them on nearly every one of the items that we've uh, um, seen here. So let me slide this out of the way here so I don't accidentally stick it to my stabilizer. Sorry for the wrinkle there. It was all folded up. So I'm going to take my design and I just, oh, I stuck that to the wrong side of my, my paper there. So it did not want to release. And uh, I'm going to put that right on the edge. Now notice how my design is hanging off the edge of my napkin. Um, and so I need stabilizer that's going to disappear. Okay. So that's perfect for this example here. And remember, I mean, you could use uh, two different designs in this uh, five by seven hoop here. So I can place that down on my adhesive sew and wash in my sticky hoop, just like that. And I'm ready to head to my embroidery machine. So when you head to your embroidery machine and I get my design all centered, um, then you're going to remove this template. And that way you know exactly where you're going to be stitching. And then you're going to be ready to embroider. But take a look at this. Here's another use for that adhesive sew and wash. Um, if you take a piece of your adhesive sew and wash and just cut some uh, strips that are like one inches, if you have ever stitched off of the edge of an item, when your foot travels off and on, it could get caught under the edge and make a mess. And we don't want that, right? So I like to cut strips of my uh, adhesive sew and wash like you see here. So this is going to dissolve top and bottom. And I can place this down to act like a ramp. So my 
embroidery foot now could travel uh, over this with ease and I don't have to watch it. So how many people uh, like to walk away whenever their embroidery is doing its thing? So I know I do because I'm doing so many different things, but you can take a look here. So the stabilizer, I would be stitching on stabilizer that is on the top and on the bottom but when i rinse that away it will completely dissolve so and you can see here on my opposite corner this is completely dissolved and so i don't have any stabilizer uh, remaining because it's going to completely dissolve in this instance so corner stitching edge stitching are really uh, great uses of sticky hoop and the adhesive sew and wash. Um, and so uh, this time of year, we're approaching that season where napkins are great to make either for a gift or for your own table setting, because this is the time of year where we are having a lot of gatherings and a lot of good food, right? So that is all approaching us quickly. So get started with that. So grab your sticky hoop to get started on those. Um, and again, these are just uh, strips. It's the same stabilizer um, in a strip that I just cut and then I can use to kind of protect that edge there. So um, this, uh, you can also cut strips of that stabilizer uh, to join pieces of batting. Does anybody save their batting out there for um, uh, putting your pieces together? So you could use those cut strips there to put those two together. And then once you're done with your design and your quilting and things like that, uh, it'll just dissolve inside of your quilt. So pretty cool, right? Um, okay, so another instance that you might want a stabilizer that completely dissolves. Look at this fabric. Oh my gosh, would you have ever thought to stitch on that? <laughs> and so those holes are huge, right? And so we don't want our stabilizer to peek uh, through that. Not only that, but this fabric is uh, really slinky. And so I place that down on the sticky stabilizer so that it stays uh, um, in place while I'm embroidering and it's not moving around. Now, remember I said you want, if your fabric is not super stable, you want to have a stabilizer that is stable. So we don't want this to completely dissolve. But in this case, we don't want to see that. So what I did was I put what we refer to at Dime as a nap blocker. That is a fill stitch that makes a foundation stitch and it fills in my holes with thread uh, so that I can actually stitch on top of it. And if I bring that up to the camera, you can kind of see uh, what that looks like. So those are actually stitches. So that is thread. And I matched it as close to my fabric as possible. Um, and this cute little uh, fabric here, um, I had placed plan to make like a seashell bag out of it. So the sand would all fall through. Um, but this is another really good example here. So it's keeping that from moving around, but it's going to disappear. So we don't see that through this really open uh, stabilizer there. So isn't that cool? But that foundation stitching is really what's uh, making the difference. So that's a loosely dense fill stitch that we call a nap blocker here at Dime. Um, it's great for your towels, but it is also uh, great for things like this for creating a foundation set of stitches. So really easy and really fun to do. So um, now let's see what else we got here. So what about something like this? A camera strap. So this um, you might want to completely dissolve. This is a uh, woven cotton webbing. So it is very sturdy. It's not thick, easy to embroider through. But um, when the stabilizer dissolves, I can be 100% confident that the... Um, the design is going to hold up because the fabric itself is sturdy. So even if my stabilizer disappears, my design is still going to look great. Okay, so now let's talk about these marks that are on these. So these um, adhesive centering guides, we do not use these for measuring in any way. They're simply to uh, get things lined up in your hoop. So remember on uh, my first hoop where I stitched that crosshair, I made sure to get my uh, notches or my uh, marks lined up with my um, the marks on my centering guides here. And that's so that you can make sure that something is, is placed straight in your hoop. And this is a really good example for me to show you. So something like this, um, I can obviously see exactly how straight I am. So I can line this up with the one, the zero, the two. And remember, we're not measuring anything. We're just using those marks uh, to make sure that we are straight in the hoop so that 
when we stitch our text, um, we don't want it to go up downhill, um, you know, to, to make it not straight on our camera strap here. So this is a really uh, fun item and something easy to use with your, uh, um, your sticky hoop. Another thing, if you've ever stitched on uh, nylon webbing, so like for dog collars, uh, things like that, that's another great use of adhesive uh, stabilizer. This is a very sturdy fabric. Again, um, the wash away stabilizer would be perfectly fine for something like this uh, nylon. The tear away would also work great um, too. R stitching on ribbon. Now ribbon um, can uh, tend to, to move around, especially if you're stitching on one that has kind of a satin texture to it. So the adhesive stabilizer is perfect for that. And uh, you can see that it's not going to move uh, whenever I'm uh, stitching there. So you can see that I've got three strips here straight in my hoop using my um, guide. So that's why it's a good idea to put these on when you get your sticky hoop because it's going to help make sure you get things straight in your hoop for stitching. Now, once you get to your embroidery machine, you know, you're going to move your design to whichever one you're stitching on using the features on your machine, but then just, you know, making sure that you're uh, centered in that area, doing that trace. If you've got a feature on your machine that has uh, other alignment uh, features, use those to make sure that you're in the hoop. So, um, but yeah, super easy. And in this instance here, we're using quite a bit of our stabilizer and embroidery on ribbon, whether it's hair bows, holiday gifts, you really want to elevate your gift wrapping instead of a gift tag, put the recipient's name on the bow that you are, are putting on their package um, with your embroidery. So really easy to do. And I, I love that. And stitching on ribbon, it just really, people love seeing that it's easy, but it just seems like super, um, uh, I don't know, people think that it's challenging or something. I don't know, but it really elevates some, some gift wrapping. So, so that's a good use of your, uh, sticky hoop. Now, um, two, as I'm removing this, notice that if you were doing something with applique, so we call, uh, this being sideless because it's really flat. Um, this, uh, hoop it's very narrow here it's only you know maybe like a quarter inch thick or even less there um and so trimming in the hoop is a lot easier um with this type of hoop so if you're working on something like this this is another really good example of something to use in your sticky hoop um this area is too small even for our you know our four by four hoop so this is a really good example but trimming those little applique pieces makes it a lot easier because you're not dealing with that hoop. You're not at this angle uh, trimming. You can trim more uh, straight and flat, which is more natural as you're turning, and you're not dealing with that uh, edge of the hoop. So doing appliques with the uh, sticky hoop is another really um, easy thing. It can really streamline your trimming. Um, not to mention having these pre-cut pieces can really make that hooping process quick, right? Um, and then sticking your item down makes it really quick. So here's my hooping process, right? So I don't have to do uh, do anything else. I don't have to put in an interior uh, in a ring or anything. Okay, so look at this. So here's another example. This is another reason I would use an adhesive uh, sew and wash where it's going to disappear. Um, this particular design you can see here is on this coaster. This is a fabric coaster. It is sheer. So if I had stabilizer remaining, um, not to mention it's too small to hoop, so that's perfect for the sticky hoop. But if I had left some stabilizer uh, tear away behind here, look at the difference. See how bold that looks when you've got a sheer item. Um, so the tear away stabilizer really makes a, a difference in the look. So instead of using that tear away, that's this adhesive sew and wash would be great for this example. Since it completely dissolves, um, you're not going to have that opaque look behind your your item so that tear away that might be left behind might be really visible if you could not get it all out if you could get it all out between your embroidery it'd be perfectly fine so um so that is a another really good example there if you're stitching on sheer items uh this might be fine linen something like this that you see here handkerchiefs a lot of times are sheer uh batiste fabric um muslin things like that so if it's sheer and you need it to disappear that's 
that's another great example. So what about tool? Has anybody ever stitched on tool? Uh, so look, you can't even see this under the camera because it's so sheer. Um, when we're stitching on tool, um, it tends to want to move around because it's, you know, really kind of slinky. Um, so placing that down gently on your stabilizer and then just kind of patting it down so that uh, it's not stretched in any way um, is another really good uh, use of your sticky stabilizer and the adhesive sew and wash. So um, you want it to disappear. So from tool, that's another really good example. Um, and then again, when you place that down, just don't stretch it, uh, um, you know, the shape so that it is uh, disorient, you know, like the, the distorted uh, look of the embroidery. So just make sure you're gentle with that. Okay. So here's another uh, really good example of sticky hoop and um, the sew and wash. So this is just a knit shirt um, that I stitched this neckline design on and added the rhinestones here. And with a knit, that I'm going to wear, I want a stabilizer that's going to stay in there forever because knit is not a stable fabric. And so I want something that's going to give me that stability. Now I could have used the sticky tearaway, but for wearables, I really going to get a lot more use out of this. And so I fused on to the back here, a uh, no-show stabilizer. It's a um, adhesive no-show. It's perfect for um, embroidery on knits and it is uh, sheer and it's lightweight and like I said, fusible. So it kept my item from stretching. But to embroider close to the neckline here, I needed uh, to be able to stitch all the way up to the edge here. So the sticky hoop was perfect. So in this case, I actually used two stabilizers. I used the adhesive sew and wash so that it would completely disappear. And I fused my no-show to the back of it so that it would stay forever. So then once this was washed, this stabilizer that held it to my hoop disappeared. And I'm left with this stabilizer that is my soft uh, cutaway no-show stabilizer. It's going to keep my embroidery looking great forever. So in that case, I used two different types of stabilizer because I, um, I wanted to make sure that no-show was in there. And I wanted the second layer to completely disappear. Uh, so that's another. A uh, really good example there. Um, and then what about this? How about hooping multiples? We've talked about this with the ribbon, but you can also do that with napkins. So with napkins, I do like the stabilizer to be removed from the backside just because uh, not the backside of the napkin is not going to be um, visible all the time, but it does... Um, you know, uh, since you're using it to, uh, you know, wipe your mouth, your hands, uh, it is nice to make sure all that stabilizer is gone. So hooping multiples of the napkins. This is another really uh, um, easy way to save stabilizer. And then I'm going to give you a tip if you don't have multiples to do. Okay, so for this example here, I've already got my napkins marked where I want the embroidery. So I would put the first napkin to the back of the hoop. So if this were attached to my embroidery machine here on the left, I'm going to put the first embroidery to the back of the hoop just like this. Okay. And then of course, I'm going to use my machine features to get my design right where I need it to be. And then I'm going to stitch that design. And then before I go on to the next one, I'm not going to remove it. I'm literally just going to flip this back. OK, and then I can put another one here in the center. So I can grab my next one. These nice fall colors here, uh, the green, the beige. I can put that down, um, get my design in position. And then I'm going to fold this back. Um, and uh, this um, I usually remove my tags here, too, once I'm done. Um, and then the last one here, the same thing. I could put this down here in the very bottom and press that down. Make sure it's nice and smooth. Stitch that. And then um, again, each of those you would fold. This would be your last one. So you take all of those out of the hoop at that time. And I like to trim away the excess stabilizer since this is uh, going to wash away. Trim away the excess and then uh, you can uh, throw these in the wash or just rinse out that extra stabilizer. And then you won't have that on the back. So napkins are generally a, a, a woven fabric. So that is sturdy enough to support something like a monogram, even if you're rinsing away that stabilizer on the back. So really easy, right?
Okay, so a couple more things, and then I think we're almost ready for our Q&A here in just a bit. So let me just show you a tip here. Um, so I've got a large uh, hoop. Let me move all my stuff out of the way. So here I've got a, um, a larger sticky hoop. So this is uh, my 6 by 10 sticky hoop. And look what uh, is going on here. I stitched a uh, small a design up here in the top. So like this here, and then you rip it away and you've got this hole, but you've got all this stabilizer. Now we know we can put other designs down here in order to uh, use as much of our stabilizer as possible, but you can also patch this area and use it as well. So use the same type of stabilizer to patch. So this is my adhesive peel and stick. And then I've just cut a piece that I know would cover that hole. Um, and I'm going to separate it and then put it right on the back. So I'm going to flip this over. I'm going to put my release paper down so that it uh, doesn't stick to my surface. Peel off that release paper there. And I can put that right over the hole in the back to patch it. And now I'm ready to go to uh, um, my hooping with another uh, another item. So then you could take, you know, whichever item you're embroidering and put that right down and you're ready to go and you can embroider in that same exact spot. So to save a stabilizer, uh, you could do this, you know, quite a few times. So to patch these holes, I mean, you know, you might have patches everywhere for those little pieces of stabilizer. But anytime you cut off of your roll, now, our uh, pre-cut pieces, you can see from my uh, release paper here, is perfectly sized to fit your sticky hoop. Um, but if you have a roll of stabilizer and you have ever cut off a piece and all those little scraps, then you can save for this very reason. Or the scraps from around the edge. So when you remove this from the hoop, if you could manage to save these pieces here, just save your sheet to stick it right back to. And then those could be pieces that you use to patch um, another hole and another stabilizer. So, um, and again, you're using the same type of stabilizer to patch the hole um, that you have in the hoop. So hopefully that helps. So, okay. So I think that's, uh, I have some more I could keep going, but let's uh, stop and check in with Brian. Ryan before it gets too much later um, and see if we have any questions or comments. So Brian, anything that we need to answer uh, from the, the uh, comments? We're pretty limited on questions because you pretty much answered them all. I, uh, I do have one that I think would be good to clarify. I think there are some people that are confused by the concept of hoopless embroidery. So Irina asked, "Do you uh, did you show how these hoops fit into your machine's hoop? Can you explain to her that this is the the hoop?" Yeah, absolutely. So this is our hoop, and this attachment here is the same type of attachment that you would put in your embroidery machine. So in fact, I've got one that I can match up here. So here's my standard hoop for one of my machines. You can see here, and then what did I do with my hoop? This one here, and so you can see that this attachment is the same as my standard uh, hoop attachment. So your embroidery machine is going to recognize it. And then even though we call it hoopless, we're not, um, we still have to have something attached to our embroidery machine, but we're not having to insert the inner ring. We're not having to use that magnet top. We're just uh, using a piece of adhesive stabilizer and then sticking the embroidery right to the stabilizer. So we're not having to to do the hooping process, although this is a hoop that's going to attach to your embroidery machine. We're just sticking our item uh, that's going to be embroidered to the adhesive stabilizer rather than having to hoop with our, um, our standard hoop or with the magnetic hoop. So hopefully that helps, Brian. Is that any clearer, clear as mud? No, that was a perfect, that was a perfect explanation. And I do have to tell you, and I'm being honest when I say this, this segment has convinced me to get an embroidery machine because I've been eyeballing them every day when I come into the office, I look at them and I see them and I'm like, oh, I want to do that. But like, I can't see myself actually doing this. And so yeah. now with, especially with like the, the spa shoes and the postcards and stuff, like I can see myself doing this and making gifts to my friends and stuff. So Absolutely. it was a fantastic presentation and thank you thank very, you. very much for joining us. 
Yeah, absolutely. I appreciate you having us. And I do agree with, you know, anybody out there that's reluctant or if they are, if you're struggling with hooping, uh, sticky hoop is really easy. I mean, if I can, I like to put it in my standard hoop or my magnetic hoop, Brian, because I don't always use sticky stabilizer, but I do have some friends that swear by everything goes on sticky stabilizer because it's so easy and it's so fast and uh, convenient. The placement is uh, generally perfect because you can stick it right where you need it to be. So it's definitely um, one of the easiest hooping methods available. So I appreciate you letting me share my love for sticky hoop and um, embroidery in general. And thank you guys so much for supporting us at Dime and allowing us to be part of your presentation. Definitely. I hope you have a good rest of your day, Ashley. Thanks. You too, Brian. Have a good one. Bye. All right. So that was pretty cool. I, uh, I, I knew what the sticky hoops were, but I didn't realize how much you could actually create with them. And I'm really excited to learn more about them. Um, Ashley did mention uh, a, a little bit into the segment to talk about uh, how to make sure you're getting the one that's correct for your machine. So I'll go over that really quickly. So the easiest way to do that is just to call our customer service line. They know how to find the exact hoop for your specific model. So um, just give them a call. They'll make sure that it's guaranteed to fit your machine so that there's no issues uh, when you, you don't want to wait for a package to come and it not work and stuff. So that's the easiest way. If you don't have the time to call us, you can always go to our website and search by the parts that are meant for you. In fact, Alex, do you want to go ahead and bring it up? We can just go and show them. Go ahead and pull up our website. Oh, just the website. Yeah, here I'll add it to the stream. And then if you go to machine parts in the upper left, and then you can find the brand. So say you have a baby lock. You would click on baby lock, and then you would type in your model number. So type in uh, Solaris. And say you have the, the original Solaris. So that pulls up all of the parts that are guaranteed to fit your specific model. So these are all the parts that are guaranteed to fit the Solaris. And so that's where the hoops would be. You can also type in, Alex, if you want to go to the search bar and type in sticky hoop. So you can see it pulls up some dime hoops. Go ahead and click on any of those hoops, Alex. And if you scroll down a little bit, you'll see the product description and the list of machines that this hoop is guaranteed to fit. So scroll down it. Yep, right there. So if you see your machine model listed in the description, that means it's guaranteed to fit. Now, we do carry a handful of these sticky hoops. We carry most of them for the most popular machines. Um, but there are a few that we haven't started carrying yet. We're going to get working on adding those to the website this coming week. Um, if you call in because you want one of these hoops and... Um, if we don't have it on the website and you can't order until next week, I know that our special event pricing ends on Friday, but if you call in before Friday and it's, we don't have the item yet, but we're going to have it, we would absolutely be happy to honor uh, the special event pricing for that. So let me go ahead and talk a little bit more about special event pricing. I want to talk about the dime pricing really quickly. And then I want to back up just a little bit to talk about uh, the Panasonic cordless iron that Ellie was showing us. So um, here's the overlay for the dime sticky hoops. Uh, so you can see what they look like for when you order the prices you saw when Ashley did her demonstration that there is a whole bunch of them. So we just put prices vary. If you call customer service, they will get you the sale price and they'll tell you what the event price is. So you know, you have a general idea of what they typically cost versus what they cost today. Um, just give them your model number and they'll get you pulled up. So I said I was going to backtrack to the Panasonic cordless iron. Uh, we have two options for that. We have the QL1000 cordless 360 freestyle dry and steam iron. That is an MSRP of $187.99, currently on sale for $159.99. But as you know, if you've been watching, that sale price is not the lowest we can go. It's just the lowest we can show online. So if you call in and you want a better price on one of those Panasonic irons, we can get it for you. There is another option. This one is the Panasonic Cordless 360 Freestyle Iron. That one is an MSRP of $153.99 with the sale price of $139.99. So a little bit more affordable than the previous one. And of course, if you call in, there's a better price over the phone than that $139.99.
So with that said, we are still waiting on our next guest to arrive in the in backstage. So I am going to, we have to do a giveaway. That's a perfect way to fill it. And then if they haven't shown up yet, we'll play a quick video. I believe that they are just getting things ready. They told us they might be a few minutes late, so we'll find something quick to play. Okay, so we are going to do another giveaway for the uh, Aurafil So Creative Live Thread Kit. If you win this giveaway for this segment, you are entered to win the grand prize finale at the very end of the event. So Alex, go ahead and pull up the uh, selector. And this is uh, box number 11, by the way. So go ahead, and we're going to do the drum roll. Here we go. Here we go. Trish Winters, yay. Congratulations, <laughs> Trish. Um, so you are entered to win the grand finale giveaway at the end of the event. Just to touch on that a little bit more. Uh, that is a sewing room makeover. So Alex, go ahead and pull away the giveaway tool and I will show the grand prize. So the grand prize for the entire event is going to be given away Friday afternoon at the end of the event. Uh, it's worth over $10,000. It comes with a 16 X manual long arm machine, a grace cutie frame, an arrow bandicoot cabinet and sewing chair, a whole bunch of Madeira thread, some Krista quilt blocks, and we also have a baby lock stabilizer uh, bundle that comes with it. It's just not pictured. So Trish, you are number 11. Good luck. I hope you, uh, I, I'm excited for everybody to win. So let me talk about how to claim your prize. So if you won one of the thread kits so far, you can log on to www.sewingpartsonline.com forward slash so creative live. Scroll down to the giveaway section and fill out the form. Make sure that in the form you have your surprise word. Uh, so Trish, what was the surprise word for the last segment, Alex? Uh, knits. Yes. So Trish, for example, you would put knits in the, in the form. And then that way we know who you are and we can stay organized. So Grace is going to be coming on next uh, to show us true cut uh if you watched ellie's segment you saw that she was using the true cut system to uh cut her blocks together and grace is going to be coming on and doing a full product demo on those but we're still waiting on them so we're going to play a quick video for you alex do you have one ready for us okay let's do it Welcome to the workbench, I'm Doug. Today we're gonna to talk about a little preventive maintenance that you should be doing on your multi-needle machines in between your yearly service to your retailer. Sometimes a lot of you are using these commercially for businesses, which creates a little bit more dust than those using it periodically. So we wanna start from the top and work our way down. So we're, it's important that we snap our threads into this pretension guide. But it's also important that we take our little included brush to clean underneath, to wipe, make sure that there's no debris, no extra threads laying around. And then your tension assembly sometimes could become a little dry and sticky. So to kind of inspect these, you want to remove the knob, which you can place on your embroidery arm. And then you have a little clicker that gives you that little clicking sensation, a tension spring, and the base which could be lifted up all at one time and also placed on your embroidery arm. Then you're gonna see that you have a felt and this disc that rotates. So while sewing, the thread the reason you wrap it is to rotate this disc. And if this disc isn't spinning freely, then you may get premature warnings that your thread is broken when it's not. So lift this up in a way to inspect that there's no thread or lint buildup. Then you have another piece of felt, which sometimes you can see even on this guy, we have a little lint and fuzz coming away from it. So that could restrict that disc from rotating. So let's go ahead, we'll remove that all away so that you can wipe and clean. You could also, if they get too deteriorated, uh, purchase replacement ones from your retailer. And then this shaft is important to be clean and smooth. If this gets a carbon buildup, then it's going to make it more difficult for that disc to rotate. 
So what I like to do is take the oil that's included with your machine, place a drop or two of oil onto maybe a piece of stabilizer. Because oiling is a good cleaning agent for your machine parts. And then with that, you can take a, a wipe and clean that shaft thoroughly. You may even see some dirt and debris that comes from that. Because you're wanting a very nice slick finish for that disc to spin around on. Once you have that clean, insert your piece of felt. And then your disc. But it's very important for you to understand that there's a wrong and a right side. The bottom side should be the side with the black magnet. And while sewing, this is spinning and that magnet is reacting to a sensor underneath. Thread breaks, it stops rotating, sends a signal to stop your machine. So that will always go onto the bottom. Then reposition your felt, your base and your spring, and then your knob. So for perfect balance, we'd like to set these with three gray lines showing above the white base. See what I mean? Three gray lines. Okay, then we have another thread guide underneath here. Sometimes it's just as good to use that same felt on this one to wipe and to clean. Or the included brush. To make nothing sure nothing's restricting that pressure on that thread. Okay, then we'll want to remove the needle plate area to clean underneath this. Now to remove the needle plate area and clean, use your provided screwdriver, which is L-shaped, to make it easy to get your screws loosened. And while I'm there, I loosen my second screw. Now once you get them loose, a lot of times you can just spin them away with your fingers. Once you get the screws removed, pull down your bobbin case cover and lift up on your needle plate and the little white spacer that may come away as well. Ho ho ho! There's a little bit of lint and fuzz there for you. Now you can see this one here has had a little bit of use to it since we've removed the needle plate. But notice on the right hand side there's a lot of little thread clippings. Less from your thread cutter. So after your thread is cut, it's actually held in place so that when it goes to the next needle position, it's easily picked up to begin your sewing. But sometimes too much of this thread clipping will eliminate the holding of your thread. Then you could start your next color or your next needle position and maybe get an error code if the thread is broke because it didn't grab your bobbin. So it's important to remove these little threads away from the machine as well as any leftover lint and debris. So I know people have talked before maybe and mentioned to you, be careful with using canned air. However, canned air is very handy to use if you understand to use it properly. If you hold the can upright and pull the trigger, you get a nice airflow. But if you were to lean this, and spray, do you see that Freon? We don't want that into our machines. Nor do we want you to shake the can up and down while going wide. Okay, but just holding it with straight upright with the flex hose, you can blow and remove any of your debris. You may even notice a few clippings that are left behind here that you can then Maybe use your tweezers to clean out. It's important to remove that so it properly holds your thread after the cutting process. Maybe another shot once you do that. But doesn't that look better? I'm sure it's going to give you a better start at the beginning of your embroidery because of that. That's going to be holding your thread a little better. 
Then once you get it cleaned out, reinstall your spacer on the left hand side. There's a little pocket that it has to fit into place. On the right side, there's a screw that holds it in position. And then set your needle plate back in and reattach your two screws. And again, I just like to start these with my finger. Once you get them going, you can just spin them a little bit as far as you can go. And position your second screw into place. And then to tighten them securely, use your screwdriver. Being careful not to hit your needles or needle bars. So hopefully this gives you a better understanding on some preventive maintenance that can be done in between your cleanings. So now that you know, get out and sew. Awesome. So I saw a comment uh, in the chat about this. Cynthia McCarty said, wow, thanks for showing this. I had no idea I could do this all by myself. Yes, you can. Uh, just to anybody out there who's watching, um, you don't, I understand that uh, sewing machine maintenance can be very intimidating because you don't want to do something wrong because sewing machines are very precise instruments. You know, if you, if you reinstall something that you took off to clean wrong, you might mess with the timing or, or whatever. But I just, you know, I want y'all to know that that's kind of the the heart of sewing parts online. We we sell, we love doing these events with the machines and stuff. But our bread and butter, we really started out with the parts and and empowering people to service their own machines uh, to replace a, the parts in a sewing machine, so you can keep that beloved sewing machine that you got from your grandma or your mom going as long as possible. So if you have an old machine that uh, needs something. Don't be too afraid to call us and ask us to help you get the part or to ask us to help you find a diagram or to talk to our technician to see if we can figure out what's going on with your machine so we can get it fixed for you. We're happy. We're more than happy to do that. So anyway, with that said, uh, we have the Grace Company with us. They're ready to go. So I'm going to go ahead and bring them up and they're going to show us about TrueCut. So let's get them on up. Hey, Grace. Good morning, Brian. Hi. How are you today? I'm doing well. How are you? We are, are doing, doing well. Doing yes. well. Doing great. Uh, sorry we had a, a, a technical <laughs> technical difficulty uh, getting uh, into uh, the event this morning. Uh, it, we're super busy uh, here on our end. Uh, lots yep. of events uh, for National Sewing Week. Uh, thank you, as always, uh, for having us uh, and inviting us. and. Uh, again, apologies for our delay. Listen, it's no biggie. We totally understand. <laughs> you guys stay busy. So, and we, <laughs> we love working with you. Don't even sweat it. Now, okay. Melinda, I'm happy to see a familiar face. You and yes. I are basically friends at this point, even though we haven't met in person. But there's somebody two there weeks. that I don't recognize. Two weeks, though, we will. <laughs> two weeks. Two weeks, two and weeks. we get to hang out. I'm so excited. Yes. <laughs> we so are, too. You? So... My name is Catherine. I have been with Grace Company about eight, nine months yes. and am loving it. Loving Grace Company. Yes, yes. yes. So uh, a newbie here today. Uh, we, yep. We've had a couple new faces uh, at, at our different events this week yep. uh, and uh, they've done phenomenal. They've done great. Uh, I worked with Kathy <laughs> uh, at a show uh, during the summer uh, and She's phenomenal, oh. uh, you know, do, <laughs> with you. true cut. Well, with everything, yeah. but I was like, Kathy, you have to do uh, the sewing parts online uh, demo with me today, uh, the segment, because just her her skills, her their her <laughs> abilities. It's like, come on, it'll be fun. Aww. We're gonna do this. Get in a so. big head. Thank you. <laughs> well, it's nice to have. A couple. We met Anthony yesterday too, so it's nice yes. to have a couple of new great additions to the team of great people. So, and yes. you guys have great products. Speaking of great products, you're about to show us about TrueCut. So, 
go ahead and kind of start and explain what TrueCut is, and I'm going to let you take it away, okay? All, All right. right. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks. All right. So I want to ask, start off just with a question uh, in the audience. Go ahead and put a one. Uh, if you use TrueCut, maybe you know somebody who uses TrueCut, uh, and you would recommend TrueCut uh, to a friend, to a family member, to a fellow quilter, <laughs> go ahead and put a one. Uh, if I could put a one all day, every day, <laughs> my one is going to be yes, uh, in those me comments. As well. So, it, and I saw Brian's one. Uh, he would recommend True Cut to a friend or a family member. So, I just want to, you know, see from the audience. I'm seeing tons of ones uh, coming through, uh, and I think that's just the testament. Really, you know, is. If, if you can recommend a product to a friend or a family member. That's the best advertisement there ever could be. Yes, it, you know, and, and it—it's the testament of really how truly great uh, the True Cut products are. Uh, I stand firmly uh, behind all of the True Cut products. I'm a believer; they work. Uh, they're safe, easy, accurate. Uh, it, yeah. You know, and fun to use. They are. They're fun to learn to use. So if you've never used any of our products, you'll be like me when I was starting out and I'm still learning all of the different parts. You'll see me fumble a couple times today. It, you know, it, but it, it comes with the territory. Yes. Two years ago, I, I was in your same yeah. shoes. So <laughs> yes, yes. So I, I saw a lot of ones uh, and it, you know, there's so many wonderful yes. products. Um, hopefully we don't run out of time yes. uh, with our segment. Uh, we. We, we did uh, in a previous segment, we ran out of time. We'll try not to do that today. Yes. Uh, but le let's get into it. Okay. So I think kind of the basis uh, of the true cut system is going to be our cutting mat, mm -hmm. but more importantly, what's underneath our cutting mat. So I'm gonna, let's slide these over to the side, maybe. So we okay. have our cutting mat. So uh, our cutting mats, they're a three-ply, uh, they're self-healing, uh, there's print, uh, all of your measurements, your grid system on both sides. But below the cutting mat, it might be a little hard there to see, there we go. We have our non-slip surface. So, and then of course we just have our, our standard table. But the non-slip pad really is kind of the basis of the true cut system. Then we have our cutting mat that goes right on top of it. I'm pushing this it's uh, and it's not moving. It, it's pretty secure right there on the table. Uh, all of our cutting mats, as I mentioned, they're a three ply. They're self healing. Uh, you know, they have all your measurements, your grids, mm -hmm. everything right there, easy to see, easy to read. Uh, and we have three sizes uh, of our cutting mats. So uh, we have the, this 24 by 36 mat. Yep. This is our biggest. Uh, we have an 18 by 24. Uh, and then it's a, a 12 by 24. 12 by 24 or 12 or by 18. 18. Yeah. Right in there. So it, again, depending on your mats. space would be yes. depending on what one you want. Yes. Uh, and I know I, I keep my large mat yep. out all the time on my cutting table. I'll take the smaller mats, like if I'm going to, you know, my, my sister's or yeah. girlfriend's house or, or somewhere and it's craft night, I take those smaller mats. Yeah. So yeah. this one stays on, on my table all the time. So what's the next foundation piece? I would say system. the next foundation piece is going to be our rulers. Okay. So the way our rulers are made, they are made to not bend, not break, not crack. They do have movement in them. So I guess they bend, but they're made not to break. To snap. When you, yeah, to snap when you break them. Yep. So I know, it, you know, bad things happen to our rulers mm -hmm. unintentionally. Yes. Bad kids, bad husbands, bad dogs. Bad you name us. it. <laughs> if, we're, if we're a little bit klutzy, we drop everything. So. Yes. yes. So <laughs> you, bad things, unfortunately, yeah. happen to our rulers. Uh, but it, again, the design 
of the rulers. There's a little bit of flexibility. Yeah. Uh, there's holes mm -hmm. uh, in our rulers. Everybody always asks, well, what are the holes for? Uh, and really, uh, our rulers have all of our measurements uh, as well, uh, along with our cutting mat. Mm -hmm. uh, our rulers are clear. Uh, the markings are easy to see, easy to read. Let's see if we can, there we, there we go. So you can, you know, see those markings, the measurements, uh, but the holes are there. So if you have your fabric laid out, if for whatever reason, if you need to mark your fabric, you can easily do so through the holes. Mm -hmm. I use the holes kind of as my anchor point as I'm holding my ruler. I like to put my fingertips in the holes and then as I'm cutting, I, it just helps have that grip on the ruler itself. And yeah. then the third reason, the, all the holes add to that strength and durability yes. of the ruler. If it was solid, if you did a little flex, chances snap. are that ruler is going to yeah. snap on you. So, all right. Now, aside or, or working in yeah. conjunction with the rulers, what's the next basis of our system? That would be our cutters. Oh, we, or do you we want... forgot something. Well, you did mention it doesn't slip. <clears throat> now, why doesn't it slip? That would be because of our true grips. Mm -hmm. Now, true grips are awesome. You put them on the back of your rulers and you go to cut and that ruler is not moving, not at all. Um, how many times have you gone to cut and your ruler goes, ooh, or ooh. This will not do it with true grips on it. Do you yes. use true grips? I do. Yeah. So all of my rulers, have true grips, you know, placed along mm -hmm. the back of the ruler. Uh, and again, it just helps to grip the mat yeah. so there's less slippage. I use true grips for other things in my house too. And yeah. I, and I yes, have heard I do you as say well. I the do. same thing. So <laughs> in our family room, uh, the TV remotes, um, they usually sit just on our coffee table. I put true grips on the back of those remotes Such because- Such a good idea. You, you know, you, I don't know what it is. We you just kind of naturally toss <laughs> the remote uh, onto the table, and then of course it goes goes sliding. Yeah. Um, but with the True Grips just on the bottom of that remote, okay. it, you know, just kind of helps it stay yeah. in place. What do you use? True I grips for? I use True Grips on the bottom of my bar stools. That way, when I'm sitting and I'm eating and moving and talking, we eat a lot of our dinners at the bar. The chair is not sliding. Mm -hmm. So I love the true grips, yes. true grips with that. Yeah. Yes. So true grips are uh, amazing. You can use these uh, with any ruler, not just, you know, our true cut rulers, yeah. uh, but any ruler, uh, you can use our cutters with any rulers. We haven't gotten into the cutters yet, uh, but you can use the rulers with any cutters. Yep. There's so much versatility. Right. So uh, if, and if you already have something at home that you just don't want to reinvest in right now. Right. It'll work with the perfect size ruler. You get the perfect size ruler, that's where you start. And then yes. when you're ready, you then you branch get, out. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So I love uh, our system. So with our rulers, we have so many different sizes. Yes. We have rectangle rulers. We have square rulers. We have triangle rulers different sizes, you, you know, just for your, the various different projects uh, yeah. that, that people are doing out there. Yeah. Uh, all of our rulers are unique uh, because we have a track and guide system. So again, as, as we mentioned, our rulers work hand in hand with our cutters. Yep. All of our rulers have a raised edge along the side. Let's see if we can see that so you can see this raised edge on the side all of our cutters come with a guide uh, so out of the package you can use the cutter with any ruler with this pin okay it's super simple to swap out the pin open the release on the back the blade drops out so we do want to be very careful when we're yes. switching, you know, the pins, changing blades. Blades are super sharp. 
be extremely careful. Again, I put the blade on the pin and now I'm going to put that pin back in the hole, snap it into place. How uh, fast And now was I've that? changed my comfort cutter to, uh, again, have that uh, guide that will work hand in hand yeah. with our rulers. Did you guys notice how fast she did that switch out? It was <sighs> fast. I mean, it took me a minute when I first learned how to do yes. the cutters. I mean, it seems harder than it is. It you but know, and, and I read the instructions. That's the funny thing. I read the instructions and it tells you how to do it right away. Super yes. easy. Yes. So again, you can use the cutter with any ruler, you put the guide on, uh, and it works hand in hand with our rulers. So you can see that guide locked or locks onto that track. We'll have safe, easy, accurate cuts, straight cuts every time. I don't know about you, Kathy, but I'm the cutter. I tend to veer in, <laughs> yes. or sometimes I, I tend to veer out. Yes. I've had a few f close calls with my uh, fingers. Yes. <laughs> Haven't we all? Haven't we all? <laughs> but we've all heard the horror stories from somebody yeah. who has, you know, in a One sense, had a major accident yeah. with their rotary cutter. So again, that track and guide system makes it super simple, super easy, uh, and again, safe, easy, accurate every time. Yeah. Uh, you're not gonna cut your fingers. You're not going to nick your rulers. You're not going to cut fabric and therefore waste fabric. Fabric's expensive. It is. It, it is. Yes. <laughs> I'm like, oof, I don't wanna waste that. I know. Save that scrap. I can use it for something, something right? Something, yes. As long as there's no blood. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, again, super, super easy. We have our comfort cutters. We still have our traditional straight, straight cutters. Cutter. Uh, this is the type of cutter I yeah. kind of started and learned how to cut fabric with. I always pitched my thumb forward. Kathy, show me I how do you it different. I always cut like this. Yep. So, so with my, my index finger. Yep. So either way, I would get the pain right above my thumb into my wrist. I'm not even holding this cutter very hard uh, or, or very tight. Mm -hmm. You can kind of see the tip of my finger, it, you know, it's changed color just <laughs> with that slight amount of pressure. And, and again, I'm not holding it hard. Uh, you know, so you think as you're cutting, I always get like a death grip yes. on my cutter. And, you and don't it's like want I'll it hold to it, slide. it you know, yeah. tighter and tighter. And, and that's when I think I would start having slip ups. Yeah. Because I my hand was, you know, falling just, asleep. It, there was just yeah. a lot of fatigue yeah. in my hand. Uh, and again, you, you're telling yourself, don't cut your fingers. Yeah. Don't cut your fabric. <laughs> don't cut your ruler. Don't nick your ruler. <laughs> It, you know, do yeah. it perfect every time, and, and it's like I, I don't know what it is. The, the mind plays tricks it on really us. It really does. Sometimes. It really does. So, while we still have our traditional straight cutters, we have our comfort cutters. These are the cutters I personally gravitate to. Me as well. Just because they're they're so simple, so easy. Go ahead and show us. Okay. So, in a sense, kind of the proper way so to hold So you saw those. how I hold my straight cutter with my index finger. So with the comfort cutter, when I first picked it up, I naturally went to hold it this way. Well, this way right here does not change the press pressure that I was putting on my finger. So I was instructed to put my knuckle where I had my finger and just kind of lay my finger on the top. That way, as I'm cutting, the pressure I'm putting is directly from the palm of my hand right here rather than from my finger. So you would wrap, put your knuckle right there on that top and wrap your finger and that's how you would use the comfort cutter like that. Awesome. Awesome. So let's show everybody. Okay. Excuse me. Just uh, again, how simple, okay. how easy the blades cut. Uh, our fabric. Uh, and as she she's kind of showing us, yeah. I, I do want to point out, you can use uh, any blade with our cutter, uh, as long as the center has the three little kind of winged cutouts yes. uh, in the blade. 
Look at that. Super it didn't even easy. look like you were pressing I very wasn't. hard. I wasn't at all. So I click it onto the lip of the ruler. That is your guide. I'm holding my ruler. I also stick my fingers in like Melinda does, right in the holes. And then just cut. And look at that. Look how easy, no pressure. My finger was even sticking up. Look at that. I mean, yeah. they're perfect cuts. Uh, I, I mean, I watched, what, we're all watching, what, you, <laughs> you know, with our own two eyes. Yeah. Uh, it, but you just made it look so simple. Uh, what about, though, I don't know, if, if we needed more little strips. Okay. Do you think it would cut through that? I think so. Let's give it a try. Now, you might need to press a, a little yeah. bit harder uh, with more layers of fabric. But okay. Still holding my cutter the same way. And there you go. Easy what? peasy. No way. We've got multiple pieces. <laughs> That was awesome. Super, yes. super awesome. Uh, it, you made it look easy. Uh, it, and I I guess that it's not you making it look it's easy. Just it, it's easy. just easy. Yeah. So yeah. I, I love it. I love it. I love the versatility with our cutters. Yeah. There's three different sizes in both the comfort cutter and the straight cutter. So we have the 28, 45, and 60 millimeter. At a blade really for any type yeah. uh, of a project so whether uh, you, you know you're doing small intricate cutouts I would use the 28 right. millimeter for those uh, if I'm cutting multiple layers of fabric I would probably use the 60 um, the 45 though it's kind of your, your everyday middle of the road use exactly <laughs> right. middle of middle of the road uh, our number one product yes so uh, i know there was a comment how many layers will it cut uh and that mm -hmm. honestly can vary uh how many layers did that we cut was here? two four six eight so eight with no problem eight with no problems yeah. but depending on your fabric so yes. the type of fabric the thickness uh is it cotton is it some other you know fabric type uh, how old, uh, it, you know, how long have you been <laughs> using your blade? Yeah. It, you know, how old is the blade? Those are, are things which can certainly affect Definitely. how many layers you can cut through. But that was eight layers of fabric yep. and, and, and Kathy showed, it, you know, she Easy. did it with ease. So uh, I'll say at least eight. <laughs> uh, obviously, you know, the more we're cutting, especially with thicker layers, uh, our yeah. blades will dull uh, a little bit faster cutting those thicker layers but what's the solution for dulling blades uh, i would say probably a sharpener and we have two different sharpeners with our true cut products awesome. Awesome. Um, the first one that we want to talk about is the one that i love to just keep here on my workstation as i'm doing my cuts um, i feel my blade getting a little bit dull i feel like it needs to be sharpened a little bit so this is our linear sharpener you use it just by taking your blade and running it across the uh, sharpener now mm -hmm. what sharpens the blade what is in here melinda that makes it so so good to use. our our sharpener so both the linear and the electric which we'll talk about here uh, in just a minute mm -hmm. uh the we use a diamond grit stone so okay. aside from diamonds, you know, being a girl's best friend, <laughs> uh, they're also the, the, you know, just the, the hard hardest, yeah. the hardest thing on, on earth. Uh, yeah. I, I would say they're probably pretty indestructible, um, but we use the diamond grit uh, as the sharpening stone for our blades. Yes. Now you will never be able to sharpen back to, you know, a brand factory. new factory finish. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you're resurfacing that outer edge. So just like when we sharpen our kitchen knives, right? We're rehoning that surface. Uh, we're not taking off uh, any of the surface. So we're, we're just kind of rehoning uh, and resharpening that outer edge. Uh, a lot of people will ask, well, you know, as I was cutting fabric, I ran over some pins and now I have divots in my blade. <laughs> oh. Will sharpening take out those divots? No, unfortunately not. The sharpening 
will smooth your blade so it's sharp again, but it won't take out the divots right. that you have done by going over pins, like we all do at one point or another. Yes, I, yeah. I know it's frustrating. <laughs> <laughs> um, now, uh, there's a question uh, from Heidi. Can you sharpen other brands? Uh, the question, or the answer is yes. yes. So again, uh, our blades, they're a stainless steel blade. Um, when you're sharpening, if you're using the rotary cutter, you want to swap out the pin and put the original pin uh, that was installed uh, out of the package uh, onto the cutter. And then you'll run your blade through, uh, I don't know, four or five times. Ten, it, depending right, just, how dull. Yep, depending on how dull. Pick it up, rotate it, and then run your blade through again. This way you're sharpening both sides of the blade. Uh, a lot of people will say, or, or will wonder, well, I'm running it through, why wouldn't it sharpen both sides? So there's uh, the diamond grit stone kind of along both sides mm -hmm. of the linear sharpener, uh, both uh, in the top and bottom of the electric sharpener, mm -hmm. which we'll talk about a little bit more uh, here in a moment. Uh, but there has to be a certain amount of pressure or, or resistance yes. as you're pushing the blade through the sharpener. So again, our blades, they're the stainless steel, but you can sharpen any other blade out there. Uh, if they're like a titanium or otherwise coated blade, you may need to run it through a few more times, but it will still sharpen it. And the reason you have to run it through a few more times with the titanium, you actually have to get that coating off to mm -hmm. be able to sharpen the blade underneath yes. the coating. Yes. Yeah. So a again, uh, diamond grit stones in the sharpener. My linear sharpener lives on my cutting Mine table. Mine too. <laughs> Mine too. You know, I, I when you're cutting, it, you know, you you definitely notice when your blade starts to dull. Yeah. You don't want to, you know, stop mid project. Uh, we I know we all have those little containers full of blades, you know, <laughs> stashed away because we don't want to throw right. our blades away. Blades can we be expensive. We hate to waste money. You know, and, and yeah. I think before uh, the thought of, of any type of a sharpener used to be, oh, someday I'm going to be able to, <laughs> you know, I'll take them somewhere to get them yes. sharpened uh, or resurfaced. We hardly ever do. We keep it in a can or a jar or a yep. basket, wherever you keep Somewhere. your blades. Somewhere. Yes. <laughs> but we all have, you know, those containers of blades uh, ready, well, not ready to use because they're dull, uh, but you can uh, bring new life into those blades. So we talked about the linear yes. sharpener. Kathy, tell us about the electric sharpener. Okay, so the electric sharpener, um, this is the one that I like to sharpen all my blades that are in my can or my jar or my basket while I'm sitting watching television. Um, I can do multiple at a time. I'm multitasking. I feel like I'm doing a good job. Uh, with the electric sharpener, you would open it up and actually take your blade out of your cutter. So we've got a blade in here already. Now the cutter itself comes with a pair of tweezers so you can put your blade in and out uh, safely. We don't want mm -hmm. any injuries there. And then you'll notice the diamond blades up here on the top and down here on the bottom. So we, this uh, sharpener also will do uh, the three sizes of blades. So we've got our 28 millimeter, 45 millimeter, and 60 millimeter. So you put your blade in, you'll shut it, lock it up, and then you'll just press this button here on the back for about 15 seconds or so. Now, is, is maybe this 30. battery operated? This is not. This is a plug-in. And the reason that we've done that is the batteries will wear down over time, especially if it's trying to sharpen. Mm -hmm. So we've decided to take that out of the play and not have to worry about your batteries dying. So you can plug it in and you're good to go. Yes, okay. So, um, just like with the linear sharpener, once you sharpen one side, you'll want to take your blade out, flip it over, and repeat the process. So you'll lock it up, press your button again for the 15 or 20 seconds, and 
then you're ready to go. Now, if you get it on and you uh, feel like it's not as sharp as you would like it, you can do it again until you get the sharp blade that you would like. Yep. So yeah. I, I would say start with kind of a, a longer uh, interim of time, yeah. 15, 20 seconds. Flip the blade over uh, that same 15, 20 right. seconds on the other side. Uh, if you're going back, don't quite do that 15, 20, maybe do 10 to 15 seconds yes. uh, on that side. Flip the blade over, do that same amount of time on the other side. So what can happen uh, is uh, if a blade is dull, it's not going to cut. Uh, if a blade is under sharpened or yep. over sharpened, what does that give us? Um, that'll give us little divots. Well, not, not divots, but it, it'll, an over or under sharpened blade oh, it'll will be... give us a dull yeah. blade. Yeah. So it, again, there, there's kind of that perfect, uh, and, and I know, you know, right out the gate, nobody's going to get it perfect. <laughs> I still don't <laughs> always get it perfect uh, when I'm, you know, sharpening my blades. Right. But, uh, it, you know, the more you, you use it, yeah. uh, you know, the easier it is, it, you know, you know, how much you've used your cutters, right. uh, your blades, it, you know, so be the best judge. Yeah. How long do I need to rotate it? I've heard tips and tricks uh, where if you get a Sharpie and make little lines just on the outer edge of both sides of your blade, okay. use those little lines as kind of your gauge to know have I sharpened my blade that long enough? That is great. Or not long enough. Yeah. So uh, in theory, you, you know, make the little marks, put the blade in, close it, lock it, run it. Uh, that, again, initial, you know, 15, 20 seconds. If those lines are still on the outer edge, that's hasn't your indicator. It hasn't been long yeah. enough. So close it back up again, run it again, that 10 to 15 seconds. Run it until those marks are gone. Okay. Okay. That's a great tip. Once they're gone, that's your indicator you've ran it long enough, not too long, and not too <laughs> short. Yeah. And then you can turn the blade over and do the same thing on the other side. So uh, I've heard, you, you know, that tip and trick. So that's a know, great tip. Try that. Try yeah. that, definitely. So I know uh, there was uh, a comment. How long does it last? So the stones are diamonds. They're di again, diamond, diamond grit stone. stones. Yep. yep. So I foresee the stones will outlast probably the, the motor and the yeah. electric sharpener. I think this, it, it's heavy, it's sturdy. I don't want to say, I, I'm not going to say this will last forever, but I wouldn't be surprised if, if it, it did. did. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you, you know, so uh, again, you, you know, the stones will last uh, a long time. Uh, with our, our electric sharpener, you can sharpen 28, 45, 60 millimeter blades. Uh, the linear sharpener, really any size blade. Yeah. You just want to make sure, it, you know, if you have the guide on, you don't have enough room uh, to get the blade uh, in the track to be able to sharpen it. Okay. So you want to put that original. Um, now I did see a comment, Kathy, yes. uh, and this is an item we ran out of time uh, in, in our last segment. Yes. People want to know what this bag what is. What is the bag? What oh, is it? It is such a nice bag. Let's show you. So this is our travel kit. Yes. What? A travel kit? Yes. You can take all of your True Cut product with you on the road, where wherever you're going, whether you're going to quilting club or to a show or to your mom's house, to the front, cabin, to the cabin, wherever <laughs> we'll you're <build>. going. <laughs> um, so here's our kit here. We're going to open it up. There we go. And inside our kit comes a, quite a few goodies. Things. Yes. Yep. So the first thing I want to talk about is this. So it's kind of a gift. Yeah, it's kind really. of a gift. It's a it's a pattern guide. It has different patterns, um, different ways to trace how you would make different shapes, different uh, patterns, 
Now, do you know what this pattern is? I don't. It's a pin cushion pattern. Oh. It, it's super cute. It uh, is. I've made a couple of these uh, and, and given them away uh, as gifts. Uh, but that we give you this cute little pattern uh, and it's a little pin cushion. Super cute. Uh, I, you know, have one for myself. Uh, like I said, I've made a couple and given uh, as gifts. Um, you can, you know, use any fabric to your heart's desire. Um, but the people that I gave those pin cushions to mm -hmm. absolutely loved them. Okay, let's see what else is in this pocket. We've got a pack of True Grips. Awesome. Love that. You can never have too many. I'm going to be honest with you. You really can't. You can never have too many True Grips. No, no. All right. What else do we have in here? Melinda? All right. So we have some marking tools. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a seam ripper. I love this seam ripper. I, you know, it's, I've used seam rippers that have felt really small yeah. uh, in my hand. Um, the material felt, you know, was super slick. Yeah. This, I, I don't, I'm not going to say it, it's, you know, rough by all means, but it has texture. this darker, yeah. it, you know, it's a little bit more of a, a, like a rubbery, whereas the lighter purple, it's a little bit more plastic. So it, it you're able to just have a, a more comfortable hold uh, on the seam ripper itself. Um, it, you know, it's, uh, kind of a, a longer kind of picking it is. Uh, at the end. Uh, I just love it. Um, the very, very tip has the kind of the same feel, the same rubbery texture as the bottom. It, you know, so however you're holding it, it's not too small, it's not too big, super easy, just probably my go-to seam ripper. Yeah. Um, and we're all familiar with the seam ripper, right? Yes. Who hasn't <laughs> used one? Come You're on right. now. <laughs> uh, but I love this item. Yes, uh, I do as well. So I'm going to age myself. Uh, I, I, you know, I'm an <laughs> 80s baby. <laughs> yep, same um, here. But I grew up, you know, back in the day we had like the, the fun slap it bracelets. This is kind of that same yeah. concept. So it slaps on. But people ask, well, what is this thing? Now, you can take this little plastic cover off. It's just a, a protectant, um, but uh, it, it's a magnet. So when you're on the go, when you're out, you know, busy doing things, uh, you know, whether you're in the car, maybe uh, on an airplane, maybe uh, train, whatever, it, you know, to have quick, easy access uh, to our pins. This is magnetic, so it'll hold our pins. So we don't nice. have to worry about spilled pins. Can go like this. Uh, to any pick of those them places. <laughs> um, I have dropped a container of pins, and I yeah. use this to pick them up. Yeah. <laughs> um, it, you know, but it, it's just super fun, super easy. It, you know, kind of one of those. Why didn't I think of that exactly. moment? But you know, our, our <laughs> Grace Company truly believes uh, in, you know, we're a company of quilters mm -hmm. making products for quilters. Um, you, you know, so just the, the creativity, uh, the innovation, you know, the kind of thinking outside of the box uh, with our products, truly, truly just amazing. All right, so Kathy, what else okay. do we have in here? So with our marking pencils, we also have a pencil sharpener. Um, nice, ready, on the go. It has a cap on the top of it to keep it so it's all clean. You're not spilling dust or shavings anywhere. And then we also have a handy pair of scissors. I love these scissors. They're very nice. They they are. So whether you know cutting fabric, uh, cutting thread, it, you know they're they're just a a, a good, nice set uh, of scissors. They aren't too big. I'm not quite sure uh, if if you can get past TSA. I, I know you can take small scissors, yes. which I have before, you know through TSA. My scissors that I've taken, they're a bit smaller than this. Smaller We'll blade. have to double check yeah. uh, to see uh, if these are, are size appropriate to get through TSA. 
So we'll, we'll come back on that one with an answer. Okay. Uh, but what else do we have? So we have this ruler. This is such a great size. Doing the squares, um, it's easy to handle, easy to maneuver. It also comes with this mat. So this mat, it's just like the big mat yep. uh, that we sh have shown. Uh, so again, it's the three ply, it's the self healing, it's double printed on both sides, both sides. has your markings, but it, but it's that perfect, excuse me, travel Portable. size, yeah. it, you know, option. Uh, again, whether you're going to quilt guilds, whether, you know, you're uh, going to your sisters or, or your <laughs> girlfriends and it's craft night, it, again, the, the items in this kit, they're, they're versatile. Uh, I, I will say I don't use everything exclusively just for quilting. Nope. I, you know, I, I can use these products for other crafts uh, as well. So again, very handy. I love the bag. It's uh, so as a whole. cute. It's such a perfect size. It has mm -hmm. the slots that you need. You can bring other pairs of scissors or whatever tools that you're working with at the mm -hmm. time of your project. Extra spaces, there's pockets galore in it. Yes. Now, Melinda, when I first saw this, I wondered what the heck is like, this? <laughs> you and, and me now both. now I know what it is. It's brilliant. So it has this little piece of, it's almost like a sandpaper board. Yes. So if you're working on piecing a product or a project together. So for instance, if you were making this cute little pin cushion uh, and you have your fabric pieces cut out, these fabric pieces, they will lay perfectly on that sandpaper kind of backing. Look at that. You can pin, you have your pins, uh, you know, on, on your bracelet, easy access. Uh, you can pin everything together, but your pattern is going to stay right on kind of that sandpaper mm -hmm. backing. Uh, I don't know, maybe you're coming up with uh, a, design. A, a new block, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and you're playing with different colors of fabric and you just kind of want to see how everything once cut out, you know, mm -hmm. how everything uh, is going to look together, you know, in the pattern that you're mm -hmm. doing. This is a great feature for that. Another thing is if you start putting together a pattern and then it's time that you need to go home and, and you're done with your project for today, but you want to go back to it tomorrow, we have this nice little cover, holds it right in there and you're good to go. Yes. Okay. So other I, side. Yep. Has another side as well. It does. So. I like this side, I, you know, kind of, I have vision boards yes. uh, at home. So <laughs> vision board for different things, home decor, it, you know, uh, my kind of mentality and positivity and, you know, different things. So yes. I, I, I may have more vision boards than I care to admit, but <laughs> I would kind of compare this to uh, our vision board. Um, so if you have a project, I don't know, maybe that uh, you want to start next or what, what else would you kind of use in there? I think just maybe you've uh, gotten some tips from people. You want to keep those with you. Fabric Any sort swatches. of yeah, swatches or notes or whatever. You can just pin it right yep. to this board. So you have your handy dandy yep. pins, pin your little notes, your you know, design, your uh, magazine picture, mm -hmm. anything in there, it, you know, that way you know where it is uh, and, and it's going to be something you can come back to. So. Yeah. Well, I think um, you'll want to see it all put together. Yes. Because I want to talk about the outside of this amazing bag. So the nice thing about this, uh, it's not going to break down over time. It has this no. really nice it's a hard case, shell. hard shell case. Your projects are kept safe. Your scissors, your your ruler, your cutters, they're all in there nice and safe. Genuine leather mm -hmm. handles, kind of the bottom. 
uh, a great um, zipper, uh, you know, two, two a sides. two sided yeah. zipper. It has this wonderful shoulder, uh, shoulder strap. strap. It, it's a stylish bag. It I, really I mean, is. I could see myself taking out all of my true gut stuff and just using this, you know, as a bag. Yeah. Um, it, you know, it's super cute bag, super fun. It, you can fit a lot into mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Yeah. I love it. So that is I our travel it. bag for yes. all of those that you have been asking. Yes. Now, I know we, we've talked about a lot today. Uh, we, my absolute favorite kind of getting started yes, product. Yes, mine as well. Is going to be the Quilters Combo. So I'll take this out. Hopefully I won't knock everything down. <laughs> uh, but the Quilters Combo, uh, really it's a, a great starter package. Um, we're almost out of time, I apologize. Uh, but it really gives you the basis of true cut. So you get the six and a half by 24 and a half inch ruler. Uh, True Grips, the My Comfort Cutter, great, wonderful package. Um, Perfect and, and again, starting package. Yes, starting, yes. yep. So it gives you just those basic, uh, the basis of the True Cut system. Mm -hmm. Once you have this you, or any item, you can certainly branch out uh, yes. with additional items as well. Um, Holidays are right around yes. the corner. Great this is an Christmas awesome gift. gift. Kiss, yes. a Christmas gift. Yep. So, you know, I, I didn't think we were gonna run out of, out of time. Uh, I think there may be one or two products we didn't discuss. <laughs> <laughs> True Cut's just amazing. Uh, it amazing. really is. So uh, let's jump back though uh, to Brian uh, there with Sewing Parts Online. Uh, well, I know that you guys didn't get to all of it, but that's okay, because I know <laughs> that you guys are going to be back at some point. So yes. we can uh, go through the other ones, like the circle cutter and stuff at that point. But I will go over the overlays uh, right after you guys sign off so we can go through pricing. But I just okay. want to say I can personally attest to the My Comfort Cutter and the rulers with the channel locks. I think they're amazing. Since I got mine in July, it's the first one that I reach for in my sewing room. So... I, I haven't been able to collect all of the True Cut stuff yet, but what I have collected so far, I really, really, really enjoy. So thank you for oh, sharing that demo with us, guys. You are welcome. Thank you so much for having us. Sorry thank we you. went over a little. Uh, I wasn't watching the <laughs> clock. <laughs> so, Don't even sweat uh, it. Hey, and I'll see you guys in about two weeks or so, okay? Yes, two weeks. We'll see you, and then a week after so as well. So. Awesome. Thanks so much. Bye. Bye. Thank you. you awesome. So that was a fun demonstration. So let me go ahead and go over the pricing really quickly. So they showed off quite a few products. Uh, but you can get all of that stuff individually. But for the event, we have the pricing on some of the bundles. So the first one we have is the True Cut Cutter Combo. So that comes with the My Comfort Cutter, comes with the extra blades and the circle cutter. That is an MSRP of $108.99 with a sale price of $92.80. But of course, that's just what we can advertise online. If you call in, we can beat that $92.80. And that's going to be true for every product I'm about to share. The next item is the True Cut Four Piece Quilters Combo. That is MSRP of $170.99 and a sale price of $145.80, but if you call in, we can do a better price, and that, minus the uh, the blade sharpener, is exactly what I have. I have the ruler, I have the My Comfort Cutter, and I have the True Grip Grips, and I love them all. The next thing on my list is to get the uh, blade sharpener. The next thing that they showed us was the True Cut Travel Kit. MSRP of $210.99 and a sale price of $179.95. Perfect for taking with you on the road. If you need to go to a retreat, it can hold all your notions. It looks like some of those pouches could also hold your presser feet. And it's a nice, cute carrying bag. So I think that's a really good deal. And then this one, this is the big boy. So this one is the True Cut Master Cutting Collection with an MSRP of $350.99 and a sale price of $299.90. So if you saw what you like and you just decide you got to get all of the, the most popular rulers and the blade sharpener and the cutter and the circle tool, 
then this is the one for you. So go ahead and give our customer service agents a call. If you're interested in any of these products, we will get you a fantastic special event price. With that said, we uh, have a giveaway to do, and then I am really excited to introduce the next segment. So let's go ahead and do the giveaway, and then we'll talk a little bit about uh, our friends Bernie and Shelly. Alex, do you want to go ahead and pull up the StreamYard tool? Absolutely. Okay. All right. So this is for Aurafil Thread Kit number 12. Remember, if you win this one, you are entered into the giveaway for the grand finale grand prize. So let's go ahead and drum roll. Hello, please. Who's it gonna be? Alicia McDonald. This is her second one. She won yesterday too. That's awesome. That's your lucky. You got to get a lottery ticket, girl. Yeah, seriously. <laughs> and split it with all of us so that we can all get true cut yeah. cover systems. <laughs> um, so Alicia, you are getting two thread kits and you are entered twice into the grand prize uh, giveaway at the end. That is awesome. Okay. So really quickly, if you won anything, you can claim your prize on www.sewingpartsonline.com forward slash so creative live. Click giveaways or scroll down to the giveaway section, fill out and submit your form, and then give us about a week or two to get started on working on the giveaways, and we will try to get them out to you as soon as possible. I uh, just want to say for anybody who's watching, if you are the winner of the grand prize giveaway, we are going to call you to congratulate you and uh, to verify some information. So just want to make sure before you enter the uh, surprise word, just make sure you're cool with getting a phone call from us. Uh, just wanted to give you that little disclosure first. So anyway, um, now we are going to bring up uh, Team Tobish, as we like to call him back here. And I'm really excited for their segment because Shelly Scott Tobish is my per... I, I love... There's a lot of quilters out there that I really, really enjoy. I love Pat Sloan. I think she creates a fantastic sense uh, community. And I love... Uh, Karen Miller from Redbird Quilt Co. She's also the lead educator for Orafil. She is an amazing free motion quilter. But hands down, Shelly Scott Tobish is my absolute favorite quilter. I think that she makes beautiful, beautiful, meticulously done pieces. And I'm so excited for her to come on and show you how she decides her fabric from conception to starting on working on her project, how she selects all of her fabrics to go with her pattern and all that. It's, it's going to be a really fantastic segment. So let me go ahead and pull them up. Team Tobish, yeah. it looks like your mic is muted. Oh, I think we're okay now. Just unmuted it just as you said it. Perfect. I'm so excited to see you guys. We talked a little bit about your segment yesterday. Um, and we, you guys gave me a little sneak peek at what you were going to show. I know, uh, Shelly, you're going to show us one of your prized quilts, the one that's on the cover of your book. And then you're going to go into how you select fabric. Before you do that, do you want to introduce who you guys are and how you guys came to be? Absolutely. So, uh, Brian, thank you for that wonderful introduction. Mm -hmm. Much appreciated. <laughs> Hopefully I can live up to that today. <laughs> thank I you think so you already much. have. Oh, <laughs> thank you. Okay. Well, I'm Shelly. And I'm Bernie. And we are Team Tobish. And where do we begin? I guess we got to begin at the beginning. We met in the industry uh, in 19... 1996, I guess it was spring was of 96. I had ago. opened up a little, a little uh, shop in a, a little machine uh, corner in a quilt shop in in the Vancouver area, Vancouver, Canada. And one day they introduced Shelly to me as she was going back to teach, <laughs> and I could hear her teaching over top of this, you know, partial wall. And I thought, wow, that lady really knows what she's talking about. So it was difficult, but I convinced her to come and. <laughs> and work with me in that corner. And uh, the rest is is history. We just uh, kind of hit it off and we've been hitting it off ever since. So it's mm -hmm. been a lot of fun. Absolutely. Yeah, we're best friends. <laughs> well, you guys are like the power couple of the quilting industry because Bernie, you are a master technician and Shelly, you are a master quilter and you guys work together to write your books and create your products and all that stuff. And uh, it's, it's, Truly a fun story. In fact, if anybody is interested in hearing that story, they did an episode of the So Inspired podcast with us, and it's out on Spotify. So go ahead and listen to it. It's a great story. 
But I'm going to go ahead and let you take it away. I know you've got your quilt to show off, and then you're going to go ahead and do your segment. Just let me know if you need anything at all, okay? Okay. Thank you. I do want to sort of preface this by saying that the, the my part in Shelly picking fabrics is limited. Uh, I'm colorblind. So what, what I'm actually good at is uh, value. So I, I sometimes help a little bit with that. But what I'm really, really good at is getting Shelly to a quilt shop uh, yes. and, and being very patient while she's, you know, scouting out what she needs. And I'm also getting better at suddenly swerving and breaking when we pass by a quilt shop in our travels and uh, you know that happens uh, that happens frequently and just to tell you a little bit more about the togetherness Shelly and I have been on our trailer since I think May 28th traveling and we are in a really really beautiful quilt shop now and I mm -hmm. wish I could show you a little bit more in Stony Plain Alberta uh, called Blue Barn Quilts and it's just a really really fantastic quilt shop like I said it'd be great to show you more but it's it's uh it's different here. And by the way, hello to all of you who are saying hello. I, I, I was on the wrong page there and I'm just seeing you now. So hi to all. Yes. Hello, everybody. Yes, we are at uh, Blue Barn Quilts. Mm -hmm. And I have to say it is the candy store for quilters. I am having a really hard time uh, <laughs> Not going home with a car full of fabrics. <laughs> it's a good thing we're already loaded to the hilt. <laughs> yes. But during this uh, uh, talk today, I have gone around the store and picked out some beautiful kits that I want to share with you and also some beautiful quilts. And I'm going to take you on my journey as a quilter from when I first started quilting, the different things that I, the different tools that I used, uh, the information based on fabric uh, to uh, the way that I select fabrics today, especially I think, uh, I know that when I was first starting to quilt, I was so curious about, well, how do you even begin to choose fabric for a super scrappy quilt? So I'm going to start from the beginning and work on through all of that. Okay. Please, uh, so. please ask questions as we go along. My, my task here is basically so to switch cameras yourself. when Shelly needs it and to watch for any questions. So I will do my very best to keep an eye on that. So this quilt is, uh, this is the backing fabric. And this is a quilt that really caught my eye as I walked through the door a few days ago here at uh, Blue Barn. May I hold and that up for you? Yes. And what I love about this, I was going to take a bolt off the shelf, but according to Linda, it, it flew out the, when, the door with the moment she posted this. So I then can show you this uh, finished quilt. But what... I would do with a a, bat, a a theme print like this that it, that has been placed on the back is I would then take this around the shop and match fabrics to this print. And that's what I did when I was just learning how to select fabrics for a quilt is I would choose select fabrics depending on what the artist already had in the print. And I would then decide whether I was going to use this print of my theme print in my quilt when when I was uh, working on the quilt or if I was going to drop it completely from the quilt. Simply inspiration for color. And that this is the result. This is a quilt that Linda made. And I love how she selected the fabrics based on her theme print and then used the theme print. I'm just going to fold this down for the backing fabric and see how beautiful everything just flows in that quilt. And it made it so it's a really good exercise in uh, working with color. So that's one way to go about, thank you, Bernie. That's one way to go about selecting fabrics for your quilt. So you're picking a, um, just a, a print and seeing all the different colors in there and then yes. walking around the shop and find. Yeah, Absolutely. That's a great idea. And then you can you can pick out all of the different fabrics and then that are in that particular print and then weed them out until you've found a selection of fabrics that feels right for you for your quilt. 
And this, this quilt here behind me, um, when I was making this particular quilt, I knew that I wanted to do a rainbow. This is called Here Comes the Sun. And uh, if you would like a pattern for this quilt, it is in the September 2021 issue of American Quilter. I can, I'll can i have to <laughs> confirm that in a moment, but American Quilter Magazine. And you can get the pattern for this. And what I wanted to do with this quilt is I wanted it to go from uh, from red to orange and yellow and all the way through the colors of the rainbow and back again. And when I saw the Moda Grunge fabric, I knew that that was the fabric I wanted for this particular quilt. One thing you'll notice is I also, just through the colors themselves, I have great contrast in uh, using the backing fabric as light. And then I have great contrast with all the colors as they read solid in this quilt. And also just by the colors themselves, they are light and dark. And that's important to uh, take note of because sometimes you might want to have light fabrics and dark fabrics that also have a lot of contrast in your quilt. I'd like to point out just a little touch on this quilt that I really, really like. <laughs> and if you look at the corners, how she's extended the block into the border. And I, I, I just thought that was brilliant when I saw it. So, so far we haven't talked about the color wheel. And sometimes the mention of a color wheel can, can uh, evoke a little bit of fear within us, but I'd like to put those fears to rest. And I do just want to talk a little bit about the color wheel to show you how it can actually be used as a tool for selecting fabric. So this particular color wheel is, has been designed by Joan Wolfram. And I really like working with it. When you're looking at the color wheel and you're trying to select colors for your quilt. One thing to keep in mind, what am I doing here? One side of the color wheel is considered to be your cooler colors, which would be like your greens to your blues. And the other side is considered your warmer colors. So if you think of, uh, say, water, water is often cool. And so you can imagine like the Pacific Ocean is rather green. And then when you get into the tropics, they're more blue and moving towards warmer. When you think of the sun, of course, our sun's nice, bright, orangey, yellow color. So those are warm and into fire. So those should, those, uh, should help you to remember the cool side of the wheel and the warm side. When I'm selecting colors for quilts too, you want to think about, do I want my quilt to be calm? Do I want it to be more exciting? And here's a really simple thing to do if you want to have just a nice calm quilt, just select three colors that are next to each other on the color wheel, such as these three here. We've got our, our chartreuse, yellow green, and spring green. And those are because they're right next to each other, they're concerned, considered to be analogous colors, but they're just nice and soothing. So any three colors that are next to each other on the color wheel, if you work with those, you can get yourself a nice calming quilt. Another way to select color from the color wheel would be to select complementary colors. One, two colors that we're super familiar with are red and green because those are Christmas quilts. So you can, here's your red and your green here, they're complementary. You can even go to the other side of, of the aqua here and go more blue green or green green and get your reds and greens and they will complement each other. One thing I caution about working with a complementary quilt uh, selection is that you want to make sure one of the complementary colors is used more than the other. Otherwise they kind of compete for 
attention in a quilt and it can make your quilt feel a little bit uh, more energy than maybe you expected. Thank you, Alexander, for uh, pointing out which, uh, which month of the AQS magazine it was in. Much appreciated. Oh, thank you so much. I had it wrong, didn't I? No, I think you were right. Oh, <laughs> so here's an example of a quilt that is working with complementary colors. This is a quilt that is in my book, and it's called Muskrat Hollow. The quilt that's in the book, this example in the book, is very scrappy. But what I did is I really wanted to work with uh, sort of complementary colors, and I wanted to work with the these, I, I saw this sort of purpley pink color, and then I saw this really bright green color. So I decided I wanted to work with these two colors with a white background, a little more modern quilt here for this particular quilt. And you can see in the way that I have the colors in this quilt, I do have more green than I do of the pink. And that way the pink will still come forward. It's still complementary, but it's just more green than this hot pink color. So just a little guideline for you as you're selecting fabrics. So we're talking just a three fabric quilt and it'll look fabulous. Oops. Any questions so far? No, I haven't seen anything, no. uh, any questions related to this so far. Feel free anytime okay. if you have a question. I'm definitely keeping an eye on the chat here to see how that goes. Would you like me to switch cameras and hold that up for you? Uh, yes, please. That'd be great. All right. Okay. So that's a couple ways of selecting fabrics for a quilt. Now let's talk a bit about scrappy quilts. I, I really love a super scrappy quilt. And that's this is Apple Yard Lane, and this is the quilt that's on the front of my book. And when I was selecting fabrics for this quilt, what I did is I gave myself some guidelines. And it's really important uh, for myself to have guidelines to work with. And so what the guidelines were for this particular quilt, I'm going to call them rules because I do like to set rules for myself because I do often misbehave. So what I did is I selected what would be my lightest light and my darkest dark fabric. And then I took them and I stuck those fabrics up on my design wall. And anything that fit in between the lightest light and the darkest light, that was fair game to go into the quilt. So that was one rule I set for myself. The next rule I set was I wanted to have my lightest dark and my darkest dark. And I needed to work within that, that particular range of colors. The other thing I had I wanted to figure out was what what theme do I want to work within? How are your arms doing? Good, good. Okay. What theme uh, do I want to work within for this particular quilt? And so what I decided is I wanted to do 1800s because I or circa 1800 because those are fabrics that I had been saving for years and I had I have thousands of them put it that way, because I do like to buy everything in fat quarter bundles. And I have friends that are very generous that give to me from their scrappy bins. And I use them. I do use their those fabrics. And so for this particular quilt, I made my guidelines. And then what I like to do on occasion is I like to step outside of that guideline, just a, one step or another and to bring a little flash of brightness into the quilt. And so that those are some things that I did as I was selecting. Also in the layout for this quilt, the center of the quilt is yellow 
and I went from yellow to orange to green to blue to red. I wanted to make sure that that everything uh, worked cohesively around the starting from the center to the outer edges of the quilt. Once I had those guidelines, then I could go shopping and pulling from my bin. So I did do that. And what I like when I'm doing, uh, I don't know if you can see here, when I'm in selecting fabrics for scrappy quilts, is I like to add a lot of what we call visual texture. Should we do this under the other camera, maybe? Okay. <clears throat> I'll just switch cameras for you. Okay. There we go. And in this case, anything that that uh, fit within the guidelines and has a nice visual texture, anything goes in the terms of that. I wanted, I didn't want to though use any solid prints or any solids. I wanted to use all prints. And you can see that I have included some stripes here, some uh, just little prints, like a red print with a little bit of cream in it and so, so on and so forth. Just all different kinds of visual texture going on in here. May I point something out? Because I yes. think I think you you often don't do this, but uh, one thing I, I notice about this is there are details that, that you might miss at first glance, and that is in the fussy cutting. Just how she has, whoops, let's get, let's get this in here, how she has centered things. Uh, I just find it amazing. And, and what I see that that does is it kind of adds some calm to something that could be busy, right? So if you look at all of these pieces, you'll see there's a, should I say a method to the madness? Is that, <laughs> that's there probably is. not, that's yes, there probably is. not Absolutely. the right way to say this, but gives a, a different connotation. But I just love how you have cut these individual pieces. So this is not chaotic. This is actually quite calming. It, it, it's really remarkable from my perspective anyway. Thank you, Bernie. Okay, so this was this is one super scrappy quilt. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you one more and then I'm going to walk you through the selection. I have some fabrics here that I'm going to show you how I uh, go through the whole process. Valerie asked if it was meander quilted. Yes, this quilt has a story. Oh, does it ever. Oh, boy. This quilt is quilted by my friend, Lauren Tolhurst. And uh, I'll quickly tell this story. Uh, when we, I was writing my book, I was convinced that I should should uh, quilt it. I'll just switch cameras oh, so okay. you can tell your story. I'll do it really fast here. I was convinced that I should stitch in the ditch quilt my quilt. And I was days away from my deadline that this quilt had to go in. And the more I stitched, the worse my quilt looked to the point where I knew I could not save this qu this quilt from disaster. So I phoned my friend Lauren, and as soon as I heard her sweet voice, I said, oh, Lauren, I've ruined my quilt. I don't know if you could help me. I'm pretty sure there were tears <laughs> involved. It was one or two. Yeah. Anyway, she said, Shelly, you take apart what you've done, bring it to me tomorrow, and I'll quilt it for you. So I said to Bernie, after I got off the phone with Lauren, I said, I can't face it. I don't know if you ever feel stressed like that where you just can't face it. I felt like that. And Bernie says, it's okay. You go get me a seam ripper and I'll start removing those seams. Well, I couldn't let him do it all by himself. So I got us a couple seam rippers and together we removed all the seams. And by the end of it, it became a race. So we got the quilt to Lauren on time. She quilted it for me. It was just a little, one of those little miracles that happens in a person's life. Um, and, there's a question here yeah. uh, from Suzanne. And she's asking, as a beginner, that quilt scares me. Is this recommended for experienced instead of beginners? It's recommended for confident beginner. Absolutely. And what a great way to, to gain confidence mm -hmm. in your quilting. Mm -hmm. You know, the more you do this, the easier it's going to get for you. So if you're really into scrappy quilting, do select a, a theme 
such as this one, which was circa 1800, or go more modern, which I'm gonna show you in a second. But absolutely a beginner can do this. And maybe you don't have a stash that you've been building for the past 30 years, but maybe you have a stash that you've been building for a year. How many different fabrics in that? Speaking of stashes. <laughs> I I'm, I'm claim there's over a thousand. <laughs> <laughs> different prints. That's a but stash. That's a stash. That's a stash. Oh, you should see it. But see, people give me, there's, there's a piece of fabric in here that my friend Lori gave me. She let me go searching through her scrap bin and it was like this tiny little strip, but I knew it would fit in my quilt. So I took it, she gave it to me and it's in here as many pieces as I could fit because they worked great. They were a bright flash of pink and they I didn't have any, so that was wonderful. So uh, absolutely, you don't have to have hundreds of fabrics in a scrappy quilt, but do, do take it on as a beginner. And if you wanna contact me, you're welcome to. My um, email information is, is on the internet and you're welcome to email me and uh, I will answer you. Valerie says her stash is ready for that design. There you go. <laughs> awesome. Yes, take it on and email me and I'll give you a helping hand, a guiding hand if you would like, for sure. So I'm just going to quickly show you uh, one more quilt that was another deep dive into my stash. This is one of my favorites. This is called Fruit Medley. And... This, I used the same guidelines for this quilt as I did for the Apple Yard Lane. I just have so much fun working in, in these particular little prints. But one thing that I did do, I broke the rules <laughs> just a little bit. And this, and you know, your own rules are made to be broken. And just right down here, I put in a modern print is playing in this quilt among all of those 1800s, circa 1800 prints, and they get along just fine. But I the love quails, quails, and so I had to put Mama Quail in there. You see it okay? Yeah. yeah. Now Shirley asks you, Shelley, uh, how long did it take to make these quilts? Well, that is a really good question, Shirley. I, uh, I, I can't remember. I do know that both of them were done on a deadline. And I especially remember working with Fruit Medley that I had to select, I had to do fabric selection for five blocks every day and sew five blocks every day until I had it all done. Now, Sabrina asked a really, really great question. Uh, you like working with tiny pieces. I do. How does your machine not swallow them? That's a really good oh, question. Oh, I really like that. That's fantastic. Yep. So what I do is I do use a quarter inch presser foot and I also use a straight stitch plate. And then I use uh, the Acorn products, which we're gonna show you uh, in just a little bit to prepare my fabrics with. And I always start off sewing with a header. I call it a header. I always start sewing on a little piece of fabric. I leave the needle down just off the fabric, raise the presser foot and put my next piece underneath the presser foot, then lower and start to sew. And by sewing on a header, using a straight stitch plate and a quarter inch foot, it helps those pieces not go, not go into my um, stitch plate. So if you are working with a nine millimeter sewing machine, a straight stitch plate is a really good option. And by that, Shelly means that if your machine can do a maximum stitch width of nine millimeters, you have a very large opening in that needle plate for, to accommodate the wide zigzag. And of course, that's where your fabrics want to get sucked down inside at the beginning. A, um, a straight stitch plate will make a huge difference. And the other thing is if you use a nice sharp needle, in the finest size that will work with your thread. I'm assuming most of you would piece with a with a, a 50 weight thread. The Aurifil threads are great. They're 50 weight, two strands, and it's nice and fine, and you can easily stitch those with a size 70 needle. So that finer needle uh, 
meets less resistant or cr creates less resistance at the fabric when it meets the fabric and tries to push that fabric down into the needle plate. I hope that makes sense to you. Yeah. Uh, let me know if, if that wasn't clear. But that straight stitch plate is a lifesaver for smaller pieces or if you're starting on a corner or something. All right, Shell. Okay, I do want to show uh, just... Would you like the other camera? Yeah. And what was the lady who asked the question about the beginner and the stash? Uh, I want to kind of a, see, or I can. I'll just address if you. It was Suzanne that was asking about the the uh, doing it as a beginner. Okay, Suzanne. One more thing I forgot to mention is that you could choose. I'm going to switch cameras okay. for you. Yeah, thanks. You could choose what I'm going to show next. And that is you could use uh, blocks that are all, you could have this, use the same background fabric for all of your blocks and just change the darker prints. So for example, here is uh, this, this particular quilt. I'm using all the same background and I'm changing up, I'm adding interest with, scrappy interest with the darker prints so i'm repeating them but it's great because it makes it so that i only have to focus on changing the fabrics for these for the darker fabrics i don't have to worry about trying to select also my background print so that is also an option and we'll make it a little bit easier when selecting your fabric. So that's one. I want to say one thing also about when you're selecting fat, when, when you're trying to select fabrics is- uh, May I ask a, a, yes, or answer please. a quick question before I lose it? Uh, mm -hmm. The question was, does it help to use an embroidery needle instead of a universal needle? What, what I would use or what Shelly uses you is a, is a let me, me let me switch camera so I can talk to you directly. I, I feel more like I'm talking to you. The a sharp needle, uh, like a Microtex needle. I'm a big fan also of the Organ HLX5 needles in a sharp um, because the sharp needle, when it uh, makes contact with the fabric, has less of a tendency to push the fabric down. That sharp needle makes a much cleaner penetration of the fabric. Hopefully that is logical to you. So I want to talk a little bit about something that I, I do find important when you're first starting to do, to select fabrics for a quilt. That is you want to find your pattern. What pattern do you want to work with? And so I'm showing these fabrics because a long time ago, I designed a quilt and fell in love with it, but I could not find the right fabrics for it. So I had my pattern selected, but when I went to the quilt shops, I never found the fabrics until I came to Blue Barn Quilts and I saw these beautiful bundles. I finally found my fabrics. So sometimes just to, I want to encourage you that you may be all excited to start your quilt, but you might have to put that enthusiasm on hold until the exact fabrics show themselves. So it's been a couple years and I finally found them. So you'll be seeing this quilt come to life. It's going to be called Make a Wish. So when you see Make a Wish, you'll know I had to wait a few years before I finally found the fabrics. It's amazing that the, the uh, fabric uh, designers aren't in tune with what's going on in your head. I can't imagine. I, I know, right? <laughs> well, actually, this these are Tilda prints, and they came out a couple of years ago when ah. I designed my quilt. I just didn't see them. There you go. Okay, there we go. So now I want to talk to you step-by-step uh, going through how I select my pattern. Now, I don't know if we can get that up a little closer. Can you see that okay? I can bring the camera down. Let me, let me, sorry, this is gonna shake for a moment, folks. Sorry about that. Can you see it okay? Hang on, let me turn the camera. 
I wonder if it would be helpful to see it on the I think phone. I can see that. I think I can see that. Oh, that's pretty clear, Shell. I can get the camera even lower. Yeah. What about this? I don't think so. No. Okay. Uh, how's that for you? Oh well, hopefully people hopefully you can see this okay. So this is the pattern that I designed and as I was working on this design, I it, it to me it just spoke to bright happy colors and lots of them. And this quilt is called I'm going to bring this down here so you can kind of see the border here. This quilt is called Circle of Friends. And I enjoy my friends so much. I, I love being with my friends. And that's why I wanted to make sure that this particular quilt spoke joyful in volumes. So I have my quilt. I know that I want to do bright modern prints, but what do I do next? I, have, I saw this particular fabric and uh, this is a fairy, oh my goodness, I should know the exact name of this because I have lots of it. Anyway, this is a tulip pink print and I absolutely love it. As soon as I saw it, I knew that these happy, joyful birds and these happy stars, I knew that that had to be my background print. So here's an example of a fabric or of a, a print and a quilt that is just going to be one print. But as I look through this, when I cut pieces from different places in this fabric, it's going to read as scrappy. Once I had my background fabric, this also is working as my theme print for my quilt. And so I went shopping and when I went shopping, I found all of these beautiful prints that match. Maybe I'll raise the camera up again. Oh, now, okay, thank to... you. Okay, how can you go wrong with these? These are gorgeous. So they, they match or blend nicely with my theme print. And I have to admit, I, I've gone a little crazy with this and I've bought all kinds. This is a this is a fabric bundle. This is again at uh, Blue Barn. Uh, just gorgeous. So I pick up all of my fabrics. Now, one thing that I keep in mind is I want to have visual texture, and because my pieces are a bit small, I I want to not work with a print that's too large, but it can be medium. So for example, this particular print works well to add some interest to some of those pieces. And these little prints, of course, work really, really well. These stripes are great. They add visual interest. And uh, this print too, cut up in different places uh, of, on the fabric will look great. So these are all really good examples of fabric that are going to work really well in this quilt because they blend well with one another. They're, they go from a small print to a medium print to polka dots to stripes, all kinds of great visual texture. Let me just show you some of the blocks that have some of these prints in them. I was also able, not only did I go shopping to enhance my stash, which scrappy quilts are supposed to be using up your stash. <laughs> anyway, mine don't use up my stash. It's, a, it's an excuse to grow it. So you can see as I'm, as I'm building my, uh, my stash and my selecting my fabrics, I have selected fabrics that are dark and medium and I leave the light to the background fabric. I, I don't want to go too light. Okay. So I want to talk a little bit about, let's maybe go to, 
Are there any questions um, for fabric selection and for colors and themes? Just okay. reading some of the comments here. Okay. So I want to talk to you a little bit about, let's say I have been to the Blue Barn Quilt Company and I have all of these beautiful fabrics that I'm coming home with. And now what do I do? I'm all excited. I just went shopping. I want to start my quilt. What is the next step? And this is really important, and it's often one that we do overlook. Any of you who have seen Bernie and I talking before, you know I'm one of those people that are going to take all of these gorgeous fabrics and I'm going to throw them into the washing machine and give them a good wash. And one of the big reasons why is that so these fabrics, when they've gone through the manufacturing process or when they are imported into the country, uh, there can be chemicals and, and uh, rogue dyes and all kinds of stuff on your fabrics that you may want to remove from them before you start using them in your quilt. I actually want to remove them because the fumes when I'm pressing that come off of them can sometimes irritate my throat and lungs. So I do wash my fabrics. I wash them in cold water and then I take them and I toss them in a the dryer. And you get rid of some potential surprises like shrinking and rogue dyes, those types of things. Yes. But then what happens? Mm -hmm. Well, this, this is pretty nice what these look like, but then they come out of the dryer and they look, <clears throat> they have, they have frayed edges and all that stuff. So we want to fix these up and make them pretty. Right, Bernie? You want to make them easier to work with. That's right. One thing I find I in... What's that? I, I actually have a question for you, Shelly. Yes. It goes back, it goes back to the pre-washing. Do you... So do you separate your colors when you pre-wash? Do you only separate the reds? Do you use a color catcher? How do you go about doing that? That's a great question. So I do separate my colors. I will separate, uh, let's just like uh, the warms from the cools. So I'll take the greens and the blues and I'll put those together. Anything that's sort of greeny bluey, those, those play well together in the laundry. And uh, for reds, I will put all the reds and the purples, any uh, red leading purples, I'll put those in the laundry pinks all that will go with red i will often choose to put orange and yellow alone together sometimes i feel brave and i might put them with the greens or the blues but often i feel like they should just be in the bath all by themselves because oh well, you're living on the edge i i live on the <laughs> edge <laughs> but i do i don't want any of the the dyes to get on those bright yellows and oranges. I do have to admit though, when I took the took this kit home, I did wash because now nowadays our if I if I was washing this, I would put the the yellows with these pinks and and that red and then I'd put all the purples and blues and greens together. They should be fine. I do use a color catcher. They work great. And sometimes I'm so surprised when I take that out and I don't see any dye in it. So these modern prints are really quite good uh, in a lot of cases for rogue dyes. But they still, it, sometimes it comes out pink when you have reds in there. What about detergent, Shell? I use the same detergent that I use uh, what, for my clothing. If it's good for my clothing, then yes, a mild a mild is great. And don't use any strong smells if that doesn't work for you. Absolutely. I don't use anything that, that uh, has a really strong smell because, again, it irritates my throat. It gives us headaches. <laughs> okay. Was that, did that help, Brian? 
Yes, it did answer my question. The only I've been doing it the same way you do it, except for I have yet to use a color catcher. Okay. Well, you don't, it, you know, color catchers weren't around back when I started quilting <laughs> in the, makes me sound really old. Well, I am anyway, back in the, <laughs> in the uh, late eighties, early nineties, when I started quilting, I, we didn't have color catchers. Donna asked, uh, do you wash pre-cuts? I do Donna. I'm, I'm one of those. I wash pre-cuts. I take them and I soak them in the sink with the same uh, detergent I wash my clothing in. And I let them soak in the sink. I agitate them and I might soak them for 15 minutes to half an hour just to make sure that the chemicals and the um, anything that could be in the fabric has been removed. And I use cold water for both washing in the washing machine and for in the sink. I will then take those fabrics and I roll them up in a towel and then I will take them and put them in the dryer. Because they're pre-cuts, sometimes you, you might have a, a narrow two inch strip. I wash those too, I know. And I can get away with it. If, as long as you don't over dry them, you're okay. They don't shrink too much. They don't shrink at all, really. But I will take them and put them in the dryer with a towel and tumble them dry with the towels and some washcloths. Just if I don't put them in with a towel, they get all crinkly and I can't get the wrinkles out. So just put them in there so that as they're tumbling, they're free and they don't come out all scrunched up. That's a quilting term. Awesome. Thank you, Shelly. Scrunched. Scrunched up. Yes. Okay. How are we doing? We're doing well. Okay. We're just about there. So <laughs> I want to show you then uh, how I go about preparing my fabrics a little bit further after they have washed and dried. Now they're a bit wrinkly. So I want to show you how you can, I don't know how, if, how well, it much shows up pretty showing clearly. up. Yeah. yeah. It's wrinkled. I don't want it to be wrinkled and I want to put the body back in that the washing process removed. And by doing this, I make it so my fabric will fray less. It also uh, bring, makes it easier for me to cut. It feels better. It's not as limp. So let's go and do that. Yeah, it actually makes your cutting more accurate. And, and also to go back to a question about the fabric being eaten by the by the machine, uh, the way Shelly does this, there's also less chance of the fabric getting pushed down inside that needle plate. Still recommend the straight stitch plate, but you know, th this will help. So do you want to talk a little bit about this? Sure, let me just uh, switch camera so I can. Okay, here comes the shameless self-promotion. Uh, this is our new e-sprayer. Uh, it holds the uh, easy press fabric treatment. And this is meant so that if you're doing a lot of, you know, the, the little hand pumps and your wrists are getting sore, this is a way to get around that. It's rechargeable, it comes with a USB charging cord. Uh, the charge lasts a long time. And this just makes your, uh, if you're doing a lot of uh, fabric prep, this makes it, this makes it easier. All right, let me switch you. This is the this old, is, yeah. this is the Mr. This bottle. This is the Mr. Bottle with the uh, little spray uh, lever, the little pump. All right. Okay. Let me just switch you over, Shell, so Thank that you. we can see what you're doing here. One second. So hopefully this will show up on the camera. You're on. Okay. I'm just going to push the button, and this really fine mist comes out. I'm not sure if you can... You probably can't see the mist, but you can probably see what's happening on my fabric. There we go. See how my fabric is turning darker there? It's such a fine mist. So Just I push the button to start it and push the button to stop it. Yep. Yeah. So once I have sprayed my fabric, now what I want to do is let it soak into the fabric for about 15 seconds. So... And then I sprayed the wrong side. Now you can spray the wrong side, the right side. It doesn't matter. You can spray both sides. It's entirely up to you. 
but I've, I'm in the habit of spraying the wrong side and then I'll flip my fabric over and press from the right side. I have my iron set to wool setting. That's actually an important thing to maybe take note of. I don't have it. I have it set sort of between um, cotton and wool here at about four and a half because I know that's where this iron is happiest. If I, if I put it to five, then I start to scorch my fabrics. And I can scorch a fabric at five, whether I've sprayed it with water or I've sprayed it with easy press. Not that, you know, it's easy to, to scorch fabric. <laughs> Trust me, I know. So what I start to do now is I'm lifting and moving the iron. I'm not moving the iron um, on the surface of the fabric. I'm picking it up. I'm actually pick, physically picking it up and moving it from position to position as I'm pressing. This is very gentle. Shelly's not, she doesn't need to stand on the iron. She doesn't need to beat the fabric into submission. All she's doing is using heat to, to dry the fabric now, and that's gonna uh, add a lot of body back into the fabric. You could add as much body as you want. You could, you know, I, I'm not sure why you do this, but you could make that fabric like paper by uh, you doing this process more than once. So maybe you, if we wanted to use a cry cut. A cricket? A yeah. cricket. Yeah. I, I do want to just go back to the iron uh, just a little bit. One thing, uh, sometimes people use a, uh, will get a new iron, set it to the same setting as their previous one and maybe scorch their fabrics. The, the uh, thermostats on irons aren't infallible. They're not 100% the same. So you could have two of exactly the same iron and not um, and have different heat settings. So it's a, a really good idea to start out on the wool setting just to see if that's where your iron is happy. So you don't need to set this iron to incinerate. All you want to do is just dry the dry the fabric. Now what I do is I feel with my other hand when I'm pressing, I feel with my other hand to see if it's nearly dry. Once it's nearly dry, that's when I do what I call the swirl. Because let's face it, we like to swirl the iron on our fabrics. And when it's nearly dry, I don't risk the chance of stretching my fabric out of shape. So now once it's dry, let's pick that up. Whoops. Now you can see that there's a difference in the, the way that my fabric looks. I've added body to it. It's going to be so much easier for me now to cut my fabric. Here's what it looked like before. The iron that Shelly is working with is a, it's an iron that I don't think is available anymore from Continental Electric and it's a dry iron. And that's, that's another thing. Shelly does not use steam. You can see the bottom of the iron is, is very, very smooth. Uh, she doesn't use steam because steam, if you overuse it, you yeah, let me, let me switch cameras. Steam, if you uh, overuse it, has a tendency to stretch your fabric. So these little tricks um, is all part of what makes Shelly's corners meet, her points meet. It's just a little bit of prep work. And, and in the end, you're doing a lot less mm -hmm. seam ripping. That's true. <laughs> Although my seam ripper and I know are, are very well acquainted. And I but I have a pretty one that a friend gave me. And uh, I love, I don't mind taking it out when I make a mistake. This might be a, a, a really good time to see if there's any questions. Yes, absolutely. Oh, and one thing I want to say too, is that um, what we've just shown you can be, I know I work with a, with really tiny pieces, but this, all of this information goes with bigger pieces too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. Oh, great question. I did forget to mention that. Yes. I do work with all cotton, hundred percent cotton. And I tend to, to work with uh, just your regular quilters cottons the kind found in your quilt, your local quilt shops. 
All right. I don't see any. I don't. I hope I didn't miss any questions. But no. Well, I mean, you. There were a few more questions, but you guys answered all of it. So um, here is a good question: How do you store your iron fabric so it doesn't wrinkle again? Oh, thank you for asking that because I left out a really super important thing here. Thank you. I store them uh, laying flat on my table. And when I'm working with a scrappy quilt, I actually sort them by color and lay them flat in a bin or flat on my table as I'm working with them. I wanna uh, show one more thing. I think it's a really important part of, do, of your scrap quilting. So let's May I just, just relay a back. question to yes, you because please. I keep forgetting about this. Um, Sabrina asks where you got the color wheel. Local quilt shop. It's a C and T, uh, C and T, publishing product. And okay, let me switch cameras. It is. I love this color wheel. I want to show you a couple. These are from C and T Publishing. And I know that Linda has them. You're talking about Blue Barn here. Yes, at Blue Barn. I'm sure they're available in many in many. These are places. these are in my. You can see them and read more information about them in my book. But I'm uh, missing a bin. I just wanted to show one more thing. That's why I forgot to show this. While you look for that, Shelly, I do believe we carry that exact color wheel from C and T. Oh, I'm sorry, Brian. That's awesome. Yeah, we try to stay on top of it, you know. <laughs> well, you guys are certainly on top of it. That is for sure. All right, I'm just going to just erase everything else I said about where to get it. Get it from <laughs> Sewing Parts Online. Great product. Well, well, I just had to shout out really quickly. This is our, uh, Alex can attest to this too. Alex, do you agree? I, this is our gallon of, uh, of your guys' fabric treatment. How often do I use this, Alex? Every single time. I love using it. I love using the glue. I love using the pen to get my seams as flat as possible. And we'll talk a little bit about that after Shelly goes over her last point. And then we'll talk a little bit about your book as well. But Shelly, did you have one more thing you wanted to show? Yes, I do. I have one more. Well, I, I would say it's a super, very, very important thing. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Shall, shall I switch cameras? Yes, you please. Okay. Okay. So when I'm working with scrappy quilts, once I have prepared my fabrics, then I test the pattern first. Once I've tested the pattern and I know everything is a go, then I start cutting my fabrics into strips. So for example, here's the uh, yellow strips that I'm going to, these are all colors that I'm going to be working with in my quilt. So once I've cut these strips, I take them and place a clip along, a clip along the side or on the end, and I keep them all together. It makes it so much easier as you're selecting fabrics for your quilt. I do the same things, same thing for the, the blues, all the blues. I cut them and I clip them together. And so as I'm cutting the pieces for each individual block, it's much easier for me to select my fabrics because I'm keeping them clipped together by their color family. So blues, greens, oranges, pinks. I do that for all of the strips. So even if they're uh, one inch strips. So this is all for my circle of friend quilt. And the parent uh, fabrics, the bigger pieces, they all, uh, they're all pressed and they lay on my table on another table and they're ready for me to continue to cut from once I use all of these strips up. So this is a big part of working with lots and lots of different fabrics. Once I finally figured this out, it made everything so much easier. So. So for know. Donna, uh, uh, she asked the question about the uh, pattern for the quilt in the background. I'm assuming you mean the, uh, uh, here comes the sun quilt back here. And that is available in the September 2021 issue, uh, issue of uh, 
AQS magazine. So, yes. Right? Yeah. And I do have your book. If we, if we have time, I can go and uh, grab it. Let's just see what Brian wants to do okay. here. It does look like we have to wrap it up because we have a giveaway to do. And I want to make sure everybody sees the pricing on your products. But I mean, you guys join us for pretty much every event. And I think you may be potentially joining us for a future one. We've already talked about it, but there's no solid plan yet. So if we do have you back, we'll definitely get a chance to talk about Bernie's book again. Because I know people really, really liked it when we talked about it in June. So, um, so before I let you guys go and do the giveaway and go over the pricing, is there anything you guys want to plug? Anything new coming out? Anything you want to say to wrap it up? Don't really know. Is there anything that you missed? Or well, yeah. <laughs> we could probably talk for hours. You don't want that. <laughs> <laughs> we have somebody else spectacular coming up. That's right. Maybe one day we'll have a solo event with just you and Shelly, and then we can talk as long as we want about <laughs> Oh, fantastic. Be careful what you wish for. That's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you guys so much for joining us, and I hope you have a great rest of your day. Thanks, Thank everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much. Awesome. I am so happy that they joined us for that segment. Let me fix my screen. There we go. So let me talk about... Shelly's book really quickly, and then the Acorn Precision Piecing Tools. So this is the book we've been talking about, and it has Apple Yard Lane, her quilt on the front. Um, it is typically, it's an MSRP of $32.99. We typically have it on sale for $29.95. If you call in, you can get a better price over the phone. If you want to make a quilt like Shelly Scott Tobish, I am telling you, buy this book. It's not, what you saw today is only just a snippet of what's in it. She goes over her block builders, which is a way that she stays organized. And I would imagine that staying organized is a huge part of making a quilt with this level of detail. She also goes over how she sews. She talks about using the straight stitch plate. She talks about using the quarter inch foot. She talks about using a leader and a footer. She goes over color, value, texture, contrast. And there's also a, a handful, I believe it's 12, let me pull Bernie back up and ask. Bernie, how many patterns are in the book? I, I think it's six, six, and that's patterns including the block builders, yeah. Okay, awesome, thank you. So if you want to quilt like Shelly Scott Tobish, you absolutely can. All of the information is in this book. I personally own it, and everybody who knows me personally knows that I can't stand to read, and I read this book from cover to back like within two days of getting it, um, so I, I can't recommend it enough. We also talked about their fabric treatment. If you're interested in trying their fabric treatment, we have the combo set on sale for $40, an MSRP of $40.99, sale price of $34.99. But of course, if you call in, you'll get the call-in pricing on that. We also have the Precision Piecing Starter Kit. They didn't get much of a chance to talk about the uh, glue and the pen, but just to give you a quick overview, overview the glue is a soft hold glue. So uh, Shelly has talked about in the past how she had used a firm hold glue on fabric that she really loved and she had to pull it apart and the firm hold glue ruined her fabric that she cherished. So her and, Bern her and Bernie came up with the soft hold glue uh, so that you can work with your fabric while you base, you, you, before you piece it together, you can take it apart, put it back together just to make sure you're getting it absolutely right without ruining your fabric before you stitch it. And I'm sure when they come back for our next event, they'll talk about that a little further. They also showed us the e-sprayer. We have that in the studio. We use that all the time. It is an MSRP of $100.99 and a sale price of $85.99. Of course, if you call in, you will get the special event price. Okay. I think I'm a little out of breath on that one. Well, with that said, let's go ahead and do our giveaway for the Orfil Thread Kit. And then we are going to bring up our new friend, Michelle. Alex, do you want to go ahead and pull up the giveaway tool? Yes, I do. All right. You know the drill. We got a drum roll. Bernie and Shelly, I hope you're in the background doing this with us. <laughs> Yay, Carol. Congratulations. So, Carol, you won Orifil Thread Kit number 13. So, let me put your name down. Congrats, Carol. Carol. And you are entered to win the Sewing Room Makeover Grand Prize at the end of the event tomorrow. So make sure you tune back in to see if you win that one. All right. So let's go ahead and take away the giveaway tool. And we are going to bring up our new friend, Michelle. She has two segments back-to-back, -back, actually. 
First, she's gonna show us how to make thread lace, and then she's gonna do a half square triangle and quarter square triangle demo. I think I got that right. Let's bring Michelle up. Hey, Brian. I'm so happy hey, to be Michelle. here. Thank you so much. I am so happy that you're here. So a little backstory, we met you at QuiltCon in Atlanta earlier this year. We, Alex, Alex, Trish and I had gone and we were running around filming TikToks, acting a fool, interviewing people <laughs> randomly on a bunch of stuff. And we, we just happened to stop by your booth because we noticed your hair. We were like, oh my gosh, that lady has the coolest pink hair in the world. We have to go talk to her. And I said, you know what? I think I recognize her from somewhere. I've seen her do something somewhere. And to this day, I don't know what video it was, but I saw you somewhere on YouTube and we interviewed you and the rest is history. Now you're here with us for So Creative Live. So thank you so much for joining. And do you want to introduce yourself for everybody? Sure. My name is Michelle Umloff and I coined myself as a national educator. I began with Saki. They give me credit back to 2010, um, but I officially became a, a national educator for them in 2014. And that was really the uh, very beginning of my professional sewing career. I've worked with other companies, um, including Baby Lock. I was an educator for them for a little while. And then I am also a national demonstrator for Clover, which we'll be talking about during my second segment. I work independently awesome. as well, so I um, teach at my local community college and parks and recreation. It's a lot of fun because I get to share with them a lot of products that make sewing fun and exciting and fast. And um, I go to quilt guilds and shops also. So I, I was on tour yesterday. <laughs> Dang, you stay busy. <laughs> well, I have to pay for my Jeep parts. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. I've got dogs I got to put through college, so I get it. Anyway, so I'll get, let you go ahead and uh, get your segment started. All right. Thanks so much. Well, today I am going to show you how to make thread lace. And I'm going to start with one of my most favorite projects is making a scarf. And what I like about this particular project is there's a couple of rules, but it's very forgiving and you can do it any way that you want. So there's in that consent, uh, in that part, it's very um, subjective to how you want to construct it. So you're gonna need a couple parts for your machine. Of course, you're gonna need a mach sewing machine in good working condition. And don't forget to perhaps open it up and give it a clean inside. You'll be surprised at how much lint and dust can occur be found underneath the bobbin area and sometimes my machine seems to be acting wonky it doesn't want to sew and that's because i hadn't cleaned it over a period of time you'll need two different types of presser feet for this project you'll need a regular standard presser foot as well as a free motion presser foot so you'll see on my screen i have both presser feet up um, the free motion foot that i personally and um, like to use is one that's spring loaded. So it, be, it sits pretty close to the fabric or you'll see stabilizer and it kind of hops along without touching the project at all. So that's my favorite type of foot. I always like to try something new when I'm sewing and my good machine or my, my newest machine came with a lot of different parts to include a straight stitch plate. And I rarely use it, but that really does have a great benefit to it because it allows your straight stitches to be formed a lot better, a lot more consistent and more straight. There's also a straight stitch foot that is available and it too came with my presser or with my sewing machine. And for the longest time before I became a little bit more knowledge about all this, I thought that was my quarter inch foot, but it's not. It's slightly larger than a quarter inch if you choose to use it that way. So if that's what you decide to use ever, just remember to keep it consistent. Don't start a project using that foot and then get a real quarter inch foot. 
Of course, we are going to use Salky's threads. And today I'm going to introduce you to Salky blendable threads. They're 100% Egyptian cotton. They're long stapled and they're just absolutely amazing. You know, I, I love all of Salky's threads, but I really do have an affinity for these. They're available in 12 weight and 30 weight size um, sizes and then there's a couple different spool sizes as well so the 30 weight contains 550 yards on those smaller spools and the um, 12 weight contains 300 yards per spool so that's a lot of thread but what we're making it will seem like that thread will get used up rather quickly now we're going to look at Ultrasolvy stabilizer. This is a wash away stabilizer, and I particularly like to use the 12 inch roll for my scarves. It has um, eight yards on that 12 inch roll. And if you have stabilizers in your stash already, this stabilizer is very, very thick. So there's three types of um, clear film stabilizers that Salky carries. There's Solvy, which is our lightest. There's Super Solvy, which is two times as heavy as the Solvy stabilizer. And then there's Ultra Solvy, which is super thick. You can do a lot of things with Ultra Solvy, and a lot of times it only takes just one layer. I don't think I've ever made anything that requires two layers unless the stitching is like super duper duper close and it perforates it, but one layer is uh, plenty. So you're gonna need to cut a piece of your Ultra Solvy. Remember it's eight inches wide and you have to take in account for shrinkage. So I know that question's gonna come up right away. How much does it shrink? Well, there's a lot of variables involved with that, including how warm your temperature might be of the water when you go to wash this out, how um, densely your scarf or thread lace is stitched. So you're gonna have to do a test watch and test watches are always recommended, you know, and a lot of educators are gonna tell you to always test first before you use a product or um, do some stitching or something like that so you don't have any unwanted surprises. So oftentimes what I'll do is I'll take my roll and I'll drape it around me and then I'll just add a little bit more for the length. I highly recommend doing a practice scarf and I happen to have one here. I taught this as a class. So it might be a little short for a regular scarf to wear around your neck, but it is a great opportunity to learn about this process and if it's something for you. You don't want to have another UFO sitting around, right? But it's a lot of fun. I say this project is like one of those TV projects where you can you really don't have to think. All you have to do is sew. <laughs> and I don't really watch TV too much, but if I decide to watch TV, I can definitely do this at the same time. So the optional thing that you can do is to roll out your cut piece of stabilizer and draw a grid on it. And if you like to be a little bit of a perfectionist, you would use your quilting ruler and a Sharpie to do that. I find um, that the Sharpies does not um, bleed onto the thread. So there's no worry about that. But if you are super concerned, go ahead and test that. Now, I've tried using like my wash away markers to do that. And I find that the Ultra Solvy dries out my marker. So what I do is I take like a little soda cap, fill it up with a little bit of water, and then I'll rehydrate it and continue drawing my grid. So when I started doing these scarves, this um, was something that I did. I drew out a grid and the size of the grid isn't really important. However, over the course of years, I've come to really like a half inch grid. Something that's important is if you can see on this picture is I don't 
have the grid drawn all the way across. So the grid itself is not eight inches wide. It might be seven inches wide or something like that. You don't want to stitch all the way to the edge of the stabilizer. So let me move myself out of the way. And we'll talk about this for a second. We need to pick out what thread we want to use in the top of our machine and which thread to use in the bobbin. This might be the more challenging part because not all machines really like to sew with the heavier weight 12 weight thread on the top of your machine or, um, or in the bobbin. It's definitely not recommended to mix 12 weight with 12 weight. So we want you to use um, these two threads together. I said there's 126 different colors. Once you've made your first one, you can let it go and try using a different color on the top or the bobbin and have a lot of fun with it. It's just absolutely endless what you can do with these. So with the 12 weight thread, if you're going to use that on the top, you're going to need to use a 116 size needle. It's kind of more ideal to have the 12 weight on the top if you can, but keep in mind um, with the 12 weight thread on the top, that's the thicker thread, okay? And the reason you would, would prefer to have it up top is that you wouldn't have to wind your bobbin as frequently. So conversely, 30 weight thread on a bobbin, you can get a lot more thread there. So if you're finding that you're really having some difficulty sewing in this configuration, consider option two, switch it up. Put the 30 weight thread on the top and the 12 weight thread on the bobbin. If you sew with the 30 weight thread at the top, use a 1940 top stitch needle instead. So you'll definitely want to test that out first and see which one is going to be most compatible for your machine. So you're going to set up your machine with a straight stitch and you want your stitch length to be somewhere around 3.0 to 3.5 millimeters. I tend to go towards the long, longer end. Uh, I just like the longer stitches. And when you're sewing with decorative thread, say you made, you made another project and you want to do some top stitching, you don't want to use a stitch length of 2.6 or something like that because you want those decorative stitches or decorative threads to show. So it's recommended that you use a longer stitch length for decorative purposes. Now let's talk about tension. That has the symbols. Um, if you remember that, some of you might be too young, but I, I recall it. And this is the analogy I use in my classes when I teach the beginners. You might have to lower your tension. So let's just talk about tension for a second. In your machine, it has tension discs. And I liken it to those symbols because your thread is going to come through in between those symbols and you can adjust the dial so that it lets your thread flow more smoothly through those tension discs. So if you're used to using, we'll just say like a 50 weight thread that is commonly used for construction purposes, your tension might be a little tighter. But if you put that 12 weight thread, which is the heavier weight thread in your tension discs, that tension might be too tight to allow that thread to glide through your machine smoothly and evenly. And as such, you are going to experience some breakages and it'll get quite frustrating. A lot of us have newer or computerized sewing machines, so it might adjust that for us automatically, but just keep in mind, you know what you're making, so you might have to adjust the tension accordingly. It doesn't know everything. It knows a lot, but it doesn't know everything. So let's go back to our stabilizer, and if you chose to draw the grid on it. You can see I have a nice grid drawn onto my stabilizer. And in this picture, you can definitely see that it doesn't go all the way to the edge. And Brian, I'd like to point out that this sewing machine is just like the one you have on your table, one of my absolutely favorite sewing machines. 
So you're going to start sewing on your grid, okay? Now you can choose to sew on the grid first, or you can do something else first. And let's see if that's the next slide. Nope, not the next slide, but it's coming up. So even though I had my grid nicely drawn out, I was way off of it for some reason. I don't know if I changed my mind and decided to use the width of my presser foot or what. And that's certainly A-OK -okay to do. But with this project, it's so, I guess the word is organic. It's, going to, it's not going to look like it did on the stabilizer by the time you wash it out. So embrace any kind of imperfections that you did because in the course of this whole big gigantic piece, that's just going to be one small portion of it. So don't worry about staying on those lines. But I will tell you, I do like this project because I think it's good for people who have been sewing for years as well as beginners. And with my beginners, I can encourage them or kind of challenge them to stay on the lines so that they can develop the mind, the eye, the hand, and the feet coordination to do that. So next, we have the fringe. You can start your scarf by making the fringe first and that's quite all right so when you draw your grid on the stabilizer i like to keep the grid at least six inches from the very edge of the grid okay and that is so that i have room for my fringe so let's say maybe we account for eight inches for the fringe and say like um two inches is uh, extra room that we have where we don't sew too close to the edge. You know, and as I think about this, I was like, no, I'm not going to say it. Allow that extra room on the edge where you don't sew. And like I said, I like to do it in about six inch increments, but you can certainly pick a longer fringe if you'd like. And again, talking about um, embracing your imperfections, look at that. That's not exactly perfect, but to make the fringe just so, just so, and um, a little bit thick so that it has some substance to it, to it, you're going to sew down in a straight line, pivot, and come back right on top of that straight line. So again, you can see where this is going to maybe challenge you a little bit to be able to sew straight. And if it's not straight, it's not the end of the world. If you um, roam off of your previous stitch line, it's okay. Then when I get back up to the body of the scarf, you'll develop this too. You'll figure out how to sew one stitch or two stitch stitches before you sew that second line of fringe. So you sew straight down, pivot, turn around, come back up to the body. Once I've stitched the fringe all the way across, I like to go back over it again, across at the top, because I just feel like everything, I'd like I just wanna make sure it's all connected and not going to come apart on me. So that's why I do it. A uh, double stitch, double straight stitch looks great on that too. So I just kind of want to take a little break here before I go into the next part. I do something on Fridays. I started during COVID called UFO Friday. It is by kind of like private invitation only. I am having one coming up this Friday, but I know that I have a lot going on this week and I won't be able to get everybody switched over to it. So I'd like for you to mark your calendar for November 10th and December 8th and I'd love to have you join me. UFO Friday is an opportunity for you to share your UFOs. You can talk about the prof progress that you're making on it. If there's a new project that you'd like to start, you get encouragement from all the other people. Plus, we you get lots of tips. If you have questions to ask, I have such a great following that they are so very helpful when it comes to meeting new people and the crowd seems to come from around the world. I have a lady down in Australia that joins me during the summer months because she's not sleeping then. <laughs> and I have somebody in France that comes and joins us on occasion as well as Canada. So it's just so neat to be in a Zoom meeting with all those people that have such diverse interests, there's um, quilters, there's machine embroiders. There, I have a lady that does 
a lot of quilting, but she also does a lot of crocheting and um, some other handwork and things like that. So you're always inspired by what the other ladies are working on. So let's keep going. So if you're kind of like me, you know, and when I started this project, it was certainly more rigid by the book, by the squares. But if you're ready to let it go and have a good time and not stress over, stress out about this, I'm going to tell you another way to do this. So you're going to set your machine up for free motion sewing. That means you're going to attach the free motion quilting foot that I told you about earlier. You're going to lower your feed dogs. Now, if you have a machine where you can't lower the feed dogs, you could do something like place an index card over top the feed dogs so that they're not giving you some extra drag. And then when your needle goes down, it'll punch that single hole in there and you'll be just fine. You just want to make sure like you use um, the tape that doesn't um, really stick to your machine to adhere that in place. Again, you have your straight stitch and you can either set your stitch length to zero or to seven. People do it both ways. My personal preference is to set it to seven because that is the longest stitch length for my machine. But if you set it at zero, that just means there's no stitch length set at all. And you would could possibly make your stitches as long as you can. So this part really requires a lot of of that memory with your mind, your hands, and your feet. You gotta get a little coordinated. And again, test, 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 right? I just love this project. So now that you're doing free motion sewing, it might be time to revisit this again and see if you have to make any kind of changes with your threading setup. And remember to switch your needles out if you need to, to make any kind of changes like that. So those of you who would like to do the free motion sewing, you could certainly sew your grid free motion style. I have yet to do that myself, but maybe that could be my next change for another scarf. But um, now we're going to talk about the uh, circles or the motif that goes in between those squares. I tell a lot of people, if you're interested in doing free motion sewing and you feel like you cannot do it, this is the, the best project that you can start out with. Because of this project, I can now do surf circles pretty well. And that's because in the green picture, I had squares and I challenged myself to make a circle in, or, or in those squares. So my squares might not be, or my circles might not be as round because the thread needs to touch that grid, okay, that stitched grid a little bit. Now, in the picture with the brown thread, you can see that's a little bit more wild and crazy. We have circles of different shapes, different kind of sizes. They overlap each other, which is very important. As you do this, the circles, I would say go over each circle two to four times. So you'll notice that this isn't like the fringe, right? It kind of is a little bit more wonky. Even on both of them, it's a little bit more wonky. Now, the reason I emphasize this is because you know um, you have to have a little bit of body in your scarf. And the one I'm going to show you right now was honestly an oops. <laughs> it started out really well, right? Looks good. But I accidentally washed it out way too soon. I don't know what I was thinking. But this will help you visualize if your stitching, if your circles aren't, um, if there's not a lot of thread there, your scarf is not going to have any body to it. So it's just going to be like a little thin band. Maybe you want that on purpose and that is cool. But here's the other side of it. And so it has a little bit more body to it than this side. There we go. You can see the difference. So that's very important. You want this to stay together. So sometimes I will go around a circle until I hear my needle starting to kind of make a noise, like a, that thunk, thunk, thunk that we often hear. So we filled up our stabilizer with these circles and now we're ready to rinse it out. And one thing I wanna say is I taught a class 
And it was the smaller one that I showed you with the green one. Here's the green one. Here's my fringe so that you can whoops, see that. It doesn't, I have never taken the time to kind of straighten it out too much. And then I have a brown one here. This brown one has a little bit of metallic thread in it too. So there you go. But once that is totally filled up, now it's time to remove the stabilizer. I happen to prefer the bucket method where I'll fill up a bucket with water and I'll stick my scarf in there and I'll wash it out. And it's going to take several times to do that. Um, I oftentimes will tell people that when you rinse it out for the first time, it's going to be gooey and really gross, but just continue to do that. I like the bucket method because I can take it outside and throw that water onto my um, plants and it won't do them any harm. There are some people out there that will put um, the scarf on the stabilizer into a laundry um, what do you call it, laundry bag, and, and put it in the washing machine. I'm just not like that. I don't know. I, I think I like that instant gratification to look at it. But you're going to have to rinse it several times because I, oftentimes the first time I'll pull it out and I can still see that stabilizer and I'll have to soak it some more. Now, you're going to have to repeat this process several times because that stabilizer is very thick. Remember, it's just one layer, but it's that thick. And when you think that the stabilizer is all gone, that you got it all, do it over again, because honestly, it will stay in there. Um, and it needs that time to wash out and get nice and soft. So when your scarf is all rinsed, you lay it out flat to dry. And if you notice it's still sticky, guess what you have to do? It's either sticky or a little crunchy. You got to rinse it some more and let it soak for a while and it'll all come out. So Brian, that's it. I hope you all enjoyed this project as much as I do, but it is super fun. And there's so many thread colors that you can choose from that you're going to have a ball. Awesome. Thank you, Michelle. I appreciate you. It's, it's a different project for sure. And I can see a lot of people in the comments saying, oh man, I'm going to have to come back to this segment. I have to try this out. It's a very unique uh, technique. Is this something that you came up with or you were you taught by somebody else? Oh, I was taught by somebody else. And I'm glad you said that. If you can put me on full screen, I will show this to you. So maybe I can even make my picture a little wide. Oh, I got to go back over the screen. Make my picture a little wider. So this book came out, or this scarf came from Salky's book, um, Fun with Salky Blendables and Solid Color Cotton Threads. So you can see, this was actually made on a long arm machine, but you can see this. This is all thread made on that stabilizer. If you need to make that stabilizer wider, there's a couple ways that you can do it. You can sew it together. You could sew it together with wash away thread and not have to worry about it. You can um, kind of like piece it together just by dampening, dampening it. Um, and it will uh, pat it on top, overlap it, and it will stick to itself, allow it to dry. And, um, and then you can make your sizes or shapes any size that you want. Good question. Thanks, Brian. Thank you. Uh, Chris is one of our friends. He says, that's incredible. And I agree, Chris. I think it's a really, really unique, cool technique. And I think a handful of us are going to have to try it together. So uh, <laughs> Michelle, you are doing two presentations. So do you need me to take over for a little bit while you reset? Maybe that would be a good idea. Okay. So I'll go ahead and take over and I'll mute you and I'll do the pricing. Just give me a thumbs up whenever you're ready. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. I happen to notice that a lot of a lot of y'all really like Sulky Thread. I have not tried Sulky myself. So if you are a big fan of Sulky in the comments, let me know. Maybe I'll get some and try it out. I have been pretty uh, pr particularly uh, attached to Aurafil. So it's hard to try something else when you really fall in love with the product. But projects like these make me want to try 
Sulky and some of the other threads that we carry. Okay, so there's a couple of deals on the Sulky thread right now. We uh, do have the Crossroads kits by Amy Barrickman on sale for $35.99. The MSRP on them is typically $39.99. But of course, if you call, you can get an even better deal than the $35.99. That is the same for the Sulky Flying Colors package. Uh, that is typically $64.99 on sale on our website for $49.99, but the call-in price is lower than that. Then there's these ones, which I think are really cool. I think it's it's nice to get a thread kit. So I, I'm not a big fan of buying one thread at a time. I like to build my stash in like color builders and stuff like that. So I think these ones are a really good deal, a good way to build up your thread kit fast. The MSRP on the slimline case with cotton blendables thread collection is $307.99 and the sale price is $249.99. But of course, if you call in, we have a better deal over the phone. And then we also have the, let's see, these, uh, a little bit of a smaller one. So if you don't want to commit to the bigger one, um, we do have a smaller slimline case with cotton blendables uh, for $129.99 on sale. MSRP is typically $161.99. And of course, if you call in, we will beat that $129.99. So it looks like Michelle might be ready to do her segment. Are you ready, Michelle? All right, she's giving me the thumbs up. So Michelle, I'm going to unmute you, and I'm just going to put you back on the main cam. All right. Hello again. <laughs> so that is a great deal on those threads. And I wanted to mention the smaller spools that you have there, they have 50 yards of thread on the spool, but they are great for hand embroidery. So you can, the, the, the cotton blendables, the 12 weight and the 30 weight are so diversible. <laughs> I just made up a, a word. <laughs> so, and um, the 12 weight you can also use in the serger. They are awesome in the loopers, the upper and the lower loop, loopers. I've done some work with them a lot and people love to use sulky 12 weight thread in the loopers. So I thought I'd make that clear. Um, okay, so now I'm gonna switch hats and I'm gonna talk about the No Hassles Triangle Gauge by Clover. And let's go over here. I'm gonna switch the camera. I like to talk to myself so you know what I'm doing. There we go. Get it into focus. I couldn't do this beforehand, so I apologize for that. Just takes a second. I'm a one person show. <laughs> All right, so I have the no hassles triangle gauge on my cutting mat here. And I taught a class yesterday, a workshop with a quilting guild. And there were people in the crowd that said, I have that, but I don't know how to use it. So some of you might be in that same situation. And if you don't have this, you're going to want it. So what we have here is the No Hassles Triangle Gauge. And it will help you make half square triangles and quarter square triangles. Now, I don't know about you, but numbers and math just are not my strong point. So this takes out all the math for you. On this side of the gauge, it shows you a picture of a half square triangle. And what it does is this side of the gauge helps you with the half square triangles only. So if I want to make a finished block, we'll say at five and a half inches, I'm gonna squeeze this little part of the gauge and I'm gonna slide it down until it comes into a little notch, okay? And then it's gonna tell me cut five and seven eighths. So what that's telling me is that my squares that I need to start should be five and seven eighths inch square so that they finish at five and a half inches. Okay, now on the other side of the gauge, it shows us quarter square triangles. And you got it, this side of the square or gauge pertains to quarter square triangles. Now you know you can't just take this side of the gauge and make quarter square triangles that are gonna finish at the same size, right? Because we have some extra seams in there. 
So just like the other side, I'm going to slide this down until it engages in the notch. And it's going to tell me to have a quarter square triangle that finishes five and a half inches square, just like my half square triangle. I need to cut my squares at six and a quarter inches. Okay, very easy. So you'll notice that the design of this will allow you to place the no hassles triangle gauge on your fabric so that you can see that it's square. So I was just trying to get a piece of fabric here. So let me, I think I made this one four and a half inches. So when I, whoops, maybe I didn't. Yes, I did. So when I place this gauge onto the fabric, I can notice that my fabric is nice and square along the top, and then it fits down in this area as well. There you have a little extra light. All right, so I've cut my squares, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to match it up with another. Let's see, we were talking about finished at five, um, five and a half inches, so I'll just pretend for these, this purpose. That's one of the things I like about cameras. You can pretend. <laughs> well, my man, I better switch it back to the, the other size. So my square was nice and square. Now I'm going to take my pen. And I prefer this one. It's um, by Clover. It's the air erasable marker, but it has an extra fine tip. So look at that. That's a very, very, very fine tip. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to make my line in here in these little slots that were designed just for this. So there are my lines. Sorry about that. It's so dark, but I put it on another another piece for you. OK. Usually white doesn't show up so well. On camera, so here I have my lines right there down the center from corner to corner and I'd like to make this a little larger so you can see it so let me manipulate this a little bit there we go so from corner to corner we have this guideline okay when you go over to your machine you're going to want to sew a quarter inch away from this guideline. Now I am famous for always sewing on this nice line that I drew at least once. <laughs> I got to do it and get it out of the system and then I can use my clover seam ripper and take it out, right? <laughs> so the foot that I like to use during that process is the patchwork foot. So the patchwork foot looks like this. And whoops, I'm sorry, I went one too far. What happens is your needle's going to go down into that opening that's um, to the back of the foot. From that area where the needle goes down to the outside of the toe, which is in the front, is a quarter. Oh, I'm sorry, that keeps happening. Is a quarter. Mm, I know my hand's touching something. Is a quarter of an inch distance. So that's going to help you keep your seam allowance accurate. All right, let's go back here. So we've sewn this together on both sides a quarter of an inch away. And here I have, I cut it on that line, on my guideline, and I have two half squares, right? Two triangles. So this, if I ever have to go to a deserted island and I can only take one sewing notion, it might be this one. I, I probably have to take a lot of sewing notions, but this is called the fabric folding pen. And when I demo, I don't always have the luxury of having an iron. Well. I do, but you know what I use my iron for? If I'm cold, I turn the iron towards me so that it's a heater. And then when I get hot, I turn the iron away. But this is what I use. <laughs> That's my little secret, Brian. <laughs> I just gave it away. 
but I need electric in my booth for my sewing machine. So the fabric folding pen is filled with water up to about here. And then it comes with secret sauce. It's a liquid that you add to the water. So you place about four or five drops into the barrel of the pen and you just agitate it a little bit. So now that it's mixed up, I am going to draw a line with the pen along my line of stitching. Okay, see how it made that a little dark? If you're concerned about this making a mark on your fabric, remember to always test, test, test. And then I'm going to turn this over to the side or turn it over. And I know I pressed my seam allowance to the light side, but that's okay. And honestly, this presses your fabric so nicely that you don't have to use an iron. And I just want to show you a couple examples of it that how nice and flat they lay. So no, I do not press this after the fact. Now there's no glue inside and these are nice and pliable. Oftentimes I get asked if there's a glue that needs to be rinsed out and no, nope. And then iron has never touched it. I really like these uh, this pen for teaching purposes. That way you don't have a lot of students going up to the iron. There's no bottlenecking there. And, um, and you can press right at your station with just that pen. All right, so let's go back. Now we have our half square triangle. So now we're going to make a quarter square triangle. So the gauge has already told us what size we need to cut our fabric to. I'm just reaching for some more um, samples. So we repeat that same process and we make two half square triangles. And so I have both of my half square triangles use different fabric this time. I cut along the little line. So we are going to run our pen, our fabric folding pen along that seam line. Sometimes my pens will become oversaturated because I travel with them and they're not sitting up straight. So oftentimes I will have to let these set in a, a, like a cup upright and let them dry out. It's just uh, how that works. So I, I prefer to leave them uh, setting up like this. And if you're using a new one for the first time, you might have to squeeze it a little bit in order to get the water to flow through. I'm having a, a, a fun time pressing my seams to the wrong side. Oh, I think this is the one where I made a mistake. It's just a decorative opportunity. It's not a mistake. <laughs> All right, and now I'm gonna do the second side, second half square triangle. That's so funny. Don't you like it when something like that happens? See, you have surprises all the time. Keeps it interesting. Okay, so now that I have my two half square triangles, what I'm going to do is place these together. Now, next, I'm going to show you a way. It's, it's not, I, I would love to say it's my secret, but it's a way that you can nail your points. Like, every time. This is the funnest thing that I do during the demonstration to see how that is perfect. Now I have to share a little secret with you. I am not a quilter. <laughs> My career has led me into that direction and I enjoy doing the demonstrations. I have stacks and stacks and stacks of these quarter square triangles that, you know, really need to be sewn together. I'm waiting for a very nice so, uh, snowy day where I can stay home and just practice, just do some things. Okay, so I have my two squares right sides together, <laughs> despite what the picture looks like. <laughs> and I'm going to line them up so that the seam is on top of each other. And what I'm feeling for is 
that it's nice and flat. So you wanna make sure those seams are butted or nested up to one another. And once they're in place, you can always take a look at it too. You can open it up and see what that looks like. So that looks pretty good to me. I'm gonna take a fork pin. So these fork pins, let's see, which side? No, let's try this side. Fork pins are kind of like a U-shaped pin. And what it does is it gives you two pins that are connected to one another. So I'm gonna take the fork pin and I'm gonna use my fingers to open it up just a little bit. And I'm gonna place it inside. They're very sharp. So it's just saying, hello, I'm on the other side to my finger before I move it. And I really straddle the seam and I just bite into the fabric just a little bit. You don't have to over pin, like stick it in and stick the pin way down and use a lot of the pin. I just used a little chunk. So just a little bite. See, that's all that's in the pin. That's all. Okay, and I'm gonna do that on both sides of the seam. I can feel it, that the seam is nested together and just a little bite. So remember how we made the quarters, the half square triangle where we used the tool and then we drew in between the lines all the way across. So we repeat that again and then we sew all the way across again. So I have my sewn, my new sewn lines right here. I cut that in half and then it's the big reveal. Oh, I don't have a big reveal, <laughs> but here you go. Once I use the, the pen, the fabric folding pen to open up my seam allowances or press my seam allowances to either side, you have two quarter square triangles that are super easy to make. And the, the fork pins, I just cannot say enough good things about them. When I'm demonstrating, sometimes I like to get a little cocky and try some things out. So I've done um, pieced multiples of them together. Here's another one. This one, I'll, I can critique my own work. So that one might be off just a little tiny bit, but I mean, really, I don't think you can see it that much with all that's going on here, you can't really tell. I have a couple more little samples that I can show you like that. So when I first started just experimenting with the fork pins, I just was using four patches and they came out really good. Then I tried something a little more involved with more um, seams that need to be matched up. On something like this, when I have a seam right about here in the middle that needs to be lined up, I tend to start towards the middle with the pin pinning because I know I want this seam to line up. So I'll put the fork pin in here. I'll put the fork pin on this side. And sometimes I find that I might have to do a little bit of easing. So say, um, for instance, it didn't quite line up over here and I might have like a little bit of a gap where one section is longer and the other section is shorter, I know that I have to ease it under. And that's a um, construction, sewing garment construction term where you might have to kind of force the shorter end to be a little bit longer. Now, it's not significantly different, but it's just enough that would make the points off. And so that would help you um, match them up. So that is how you use those fork pins to make your points match up. And that is all I have, Brian. I have just another repeat of my little screen about UFO Friday. Let's see, let me get this off here or minimize myself. 
that's the patchwork foot again and there you go ufo friday so i'd love to meet you all in person and see you during one of my episodes of ufo friday i send out newsletters i try to do it every month <laughs> but sometimes i'm not that accurate but i certainly do give it a good college try to do that so you have any Michelle, questions, Brian? If, yeah if if i wanted to sign up for ufo friday where would i go oh that's a very good question you go to my website <laughs> which is sewing machine artistry dot com and down towards the bottom i have a um an area to be one of my sewing friends and you just click on that and that's where you can join it oh, i can't believe i forgot that part <laughs> i'm glad you got my back <laughs> it's a, wait, you gotta i gotta make sure where everybody's doing their sh uh shameless self-promotion you gotta make the plug <laughs> here well, i can take my um i, I think if I go to settings, wait a minute, that's me. If I go to settings and switch my camera, there I am. There you go. Awesome. Here, let's make it even, even. So Michelle, thank you very much for joining us for So Creative Live. I'm very excited. We asked you to do So Creative Live quite a while ago. So I've been waiting in, in, in anticipation and <laughs> you totally lived up to what I was expecting. I was like, this... This lady's going to come and she's going to kill it. And you totally killed it. So thank you. Thank you. I had a lot of fun. I really enjoy doing this type of work. Hey, do you want to stick around for the giveaway? I sure can. Okay. But there's one caveat. You have to do the drum roll with us. Okay. Oh, I love it. You know, the drum roll that I do is not this. It's the Griswold drum roll. And I make What's my students Griswold do that roll? in class. <laughs> Okay, I'll do it that way if Alex does it that way too. Alex says he'll do it too. Okay. All right. All right, let's get ready to do this. You ready, Alex? I'm ready. Go ahead. Three, two, one. <laughs> I'm running out of breath. <laughs> Woo! Congratulations, D. Awesome. D, you won an Orifil thread kit number 14. And that means you're potentially going to be winning the uh, grand prize Friday before I forget to put your name down. D. Okay. Michelle, well, thank you for officially making me look like a fool doing the Griswold drum roll, but I loved every second. <laughs> anytime, anytime. I look forward to seeing you in Louisiana. <laughs> yeah, I'll come down to town or you got to come up to Tennessee or something. We'll make it happen. Uh, all right. Hey, I like to go four wheeling out at Windrock, so that's not a problem. <laughs> I've never been, but listen, I'll try everything once. So. Say no more. <laughs> all right. All right, Michelle, you have a good rest of your day. Thanks, Brian. Bye. Bye. All right. So we already talked about the sulky thread, but let's talk about uh, the Clover Notions. We have, there's no pricing on this one because there was a few items featured. Our customer service department has a list of all the items that she showed during her Clover presentation. So they can, if you call them, they can get you all the prices um, and the special event price on them. So yeah, I thought that was a really cool, I thought both those were really cool. I thought the thread lace was really interesting and uh, definitely something different than what I'm used to seeing. And then the uh, half square and quarter square triangle segment was a great refresher because I love working with half square triangles, but man, do they frustrate me sometimes because I just can't get them perfect. So I'll have to refer back to Michelle's segments for those. So we have an educator coming up next, I believe is Stephanie Hackney from Hobbs, but I don't see her in the studio yet. Uh, we still have three minutes until her segment was supposed to start anyway. So we'll give her a few minutes to pop in. Alex, while we wait, do we have a video we can play really quickly? <laughs> yes, play your pool new video. Yeah, okay, totally. I'm not even gonna give it a preface. Just go ahead and play it. Yeah. Making your quilt sandwich on the ground, hunching over, having back problems, sticking your needles in the carpet, then maybe this hack 
is gonna be a good one for you. Have you heard of using a pool noodle to put your quilt sandwich together? Now I just finished putting together a quilt top and I figured what better time than now to figure out if this hack actually works or not. I'm also a very beginner quilter, so this is gonna really test how easy this hack is. So what you're gonna need are three pool noodles, one for the quilt top, one for the batting, and one for the backing, a few straight pins, and some safety pins. Obviously, you need your quilt top, your quilt back, and some batting. I'm personally using batting from Hobbs, and I'm gonna leave the description, and I'll leave the description. <laughs> I'm gonna be using some Hobbs batting, and <laughs> why can't I say it? I'm gonna be using Hobbs batting, and I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna be using Hobbs batting, and the link is gonna be in the description below. That wasn't so hard, Alex, was it? I've never done this before, so we're just gonna see how this goes. We're gonna start off with our backing, and you want the right side to be facing down. Mine's just white, so it doesn't really matter. Then you're gonna put your pool noodle on top and grab the end pieces like this, and you wanna get them as tight as possible and roll it just a little bit. Then grab your pins and pin them in there. Try to straighten it out as you go along, and then you're just gonna roll. Getting it straight and even. I'm already failing, it's fine. We learn from our mistakes. If it's not perfectly unwrinkly and not perfectly straight and whatnot, I think it's okay as you're rolling it, it's when you unroll it that it really matters. I'm just gonna stick one little pin in there and hope that that holds it. Oh, it's not even gonna, what's happening? Hello? I did not see this in any tutorial. It was the pin's fault. Then you're gonna get your batting and apparently there is a wrong and a right side to batting. Let me get my notes. The flat side needs to be down, which I'm assuming mine already is. Let's start rolling. Your quilt top has to be right side facing up. Let's get the handy dandy pool noodle out here. You also want to make sure that you have ironed your quilt top and back before you do this. Now, What's the next step? We're gonna get our backing, take our little pinsies out, and unroll it. You can do this by spray basting or pinning. I was originally gonna use the spray based, but I'm more familiar with the pins, and I figured if I'm learning one thing as it is, I might as well stick to the other thing that's familiar, if that makes sense. So I'm gonna pin, but if you were to spray baste, you would just lift up the layers as you go. So what we're gonna be doing is putting all of the pool noodles down and rolling, spray, roll, spray, but I'm pinning. I'm a visual person. I'll just show you. We're gonna take our batting, take the pin out, and we wanna line this up with our backing. Nice and even. Take our top and do the same thing, but of course you wanna have a border of your back and batting, so we're not gonna line up the edges. And you also wanna make sure, so my batting is bigger than my backing, so I have to really watch what I'm doing to make sure that I'm gonna have enough backing back there. So I have a little bit exposed, I'm gonna go ahead and start pinning. Roll this out, roll this out, roll this out, and keep pinning. One thing that I'm already noticing that I like about this and doing this like on the ground is it's not as overwhelming. I like being able to stand and see what I'm doing. I like being able to smooth it out as I go. And sometimes I would get the pins kind of stuck in the carpet underneath. And it was always kind of hard to pick up my quilt to really get it in there. However, being at the table, I have a lot more leverage. Now when you start to get even further down the table and you don't want to reach so far, you'll just pull this down. 
so that you're not hunching over trying to reach it. I would also say that if you're doing this on like a dining table or a table that you know you don't want to get scuffed up, just be very careful. I have a cutting mat underneath this, so I'm not as worried about that. And I'm just lifting mine up whenever I pin so that I can make sure that I'm getting all the layers. Oh no. What happens when I run out of batting? You don't have batting? Uh-uh. It's not long enough? Mm-mm. You learn from our mistakes. You could trim the top of the fold off. Okay. And make it shorter. I'll do that. You could make Franken batting. Oh, we do have off. extra. But you'd have to feed the whole thing, the zigzag, the whole th uh, thing through. I'm just gonna trim it. Learn from my mistakes, measure before you start. And there you have it. I think that I will definitely keep pool noodles on hand forever because this was a lot easier than being on the ground. And next time I'll try spray basting, but for pinning and keeping yourself off the ground, this is definitely a really good option. I'm gonna take it over to the sewing machine now and finish the rest. So I give this a 10 out of 10. I love that video. I, I was really proud of Alex for doing that one. Alex, I have to, I have to give her her props. Uh, she knows I feel this way about her, but I love Alex's ability to take on any challenge that's thrown at her with like the utmost outer confidence, uh, regardless of how she's feeling inside. If she's like unsure of herself, she's always, I'm always like, Hey, do you want to like learn how to do this thing? And she's just like, yep, absolutely. I'm going to do it. And she does it. She figures it out. And I uh, was really proud when she made this video because I basically just explained to her a few things about how to make a jelly roll race. I was like, yeah, you kind of do this and you kind of do that. And I, I, I walked away and it, it was like, I, I turned around and all of a sudden she had this perfectly sewn jelly roll race. And I was like, how did you do that girlfriend? You're like crazy talented. So I'm really excited for, to see what she does in the next couple months with quilting and sewing and stuff. And I hope you guys enjoyed that video. So, um, Stephanie, unfortunately, still isn't here. We have reached out to her to see uh, if she is still coming. So if she's still able to make it, we'll we'll have her presentation. It'll just be a little later than it was expected. Um, but, bef but instead, we're going to play a, a, a quick video. But before we do that, I'm going to talk to you about TED, which is my personal sewing machine. So if you tuned in yesterday... I talked a little bit about Ted and you, uh, you learned that this is my personal sewing machine that I got in July and I am absolutely in love with him. Uh, he's a straight stitch only machine. He's built for uh, quilting and heavy duty sewing like bags, jeans, stuff like that. Uh, he, it's, if, if you took a, an industrial machine and a home sewing machine and blend them, blended them together to make uh, some sort of morph of the two, that's what this machine is. It's basically a semi-industrial machine. It's got a commercial bobbin hook. Uh, it has a knee lift lever. Um, it's got the extra high presser foot lift. It's got pressure foot pressure. It's an amazing machine. I know a lot of you out there already know about what, uh, what this machine can do because it's all over the internet. People talk about this machine all the time. But the reason I want to talk to you about it today is because Juki is doing a very special deal on them. So... Here is the pricing on TED. Uh, this is the 2010Q. It's the second level in the TL series, so one above the entry-level machine. It is typically $1,699. We have it on sale on our website for $999. And of course, if you called in, you would get a special event price on him. However, I said he was the second in the line, but there's also a third in the line, and that's the Juki TL15. The Juki TL15 has a similar build internally. It's just as powerful, has that commercial bobbin case, has all of those amazing features, um, except for it has one extra feature, 
and that is the micro lift function on the presser foot. So what that is, is it raises your presser foot just a few millimeters higher than it typically is when you're sewing. And that little tiny, tiny bit of extra space allows you to feed things like puffy quilts. So if you're working like with a really high loft batting or you're making one of those puff quilts, you know, the kind that they, they look like literal puffs, um, that extra space is so helpful in accommodating those materials. So the TL-15 also comes with a few extra accessories, um, but the kicker is that right now, the TL-15 is also on sale for $9.99. And if you call in, you will get special event pricing. So it's kind of wild. You can pay for the TL-15 for the same price as the Juki 2010Q, but you get the extra features. So if you're one of those people, and I know you're out there, who's been saying, I've been thinking about getting one of those straight stitch machines. I've been thinking about getting one of the Jukies or one of the baby locks or something. I think this is a killer, killer deal. So I would definitely recommend at least calling to find out what the special event pricing is. Uh, we do offer free financing with credit approval. We have a couple of financing options. So we will help you get into owning a Juki TL and you will understand exactly why those of us who do own it love it so much. Uh, I own one. Chris Marchini owns one, Courtney Govro owns one. Uh, I, they're just amazing, amazing machines. So I'm done making that little plug. So I'm gonna transition us into the video we're gonna watch. This is gonna be really cool because we got the opportunity to have a conversation with a quilting legend. So does the name Pat Sloan mean anything to you guys in the chat section? Sound off in the chat if you know who Pat Sloan is if you do her monthly sew-alongs, if you're on her Facebook group, if you watch her YouTube videos, she is such a fun person. She, you know, she's an amazing quilter. She's very talented. But like her thing is that she makes quilting fun and she creates this incredible community. And the people who are in her community are so quick to help you if you have questions, to encourage you if you're feeling down about, you know, messing up on a quilt to give you ideas for your next pattern. They're just, it's an amazing group of people. So I was very honored to be able to sit down with her and Trisha and have an hour long conversation. And it was incredibly inspiring. And that's all I'm gonna say about that. Alex, do you wanna go ahead and play it? Not gonna lie, you are like quilting royalty and I'm a little nervous. <laughs> oh no. Quilters, they're just like us, right? Yeah. <laughs> So you've done a podcast before. Yes, you did your own me. podcast, right? I did. I did. I, it was only audio and it was actually internet uh, radio. So it was live radio. And I started it. I ran it for about a year and a half and then looked for a sponsor. So then I ran it for, produced it and ran it for American Patchwork and Quilling Magazine after that. But it was never any video with it. Gotcha. That's really cool. I had a chance to listen to a couple of the episodes and I'm like, not going to lie. My favorite is Linda Pacini. Oh, <laughs> you did an episode with Linda. I love Linda so much. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Lots, lot, every 10 years I spoke to a lot of people. <laughs> so. yeah. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah. She's on my vision board. We went and met her in Missouri when we went to their, uh, their product training. Right, and I was right. Just like, oh, she's just so comfortable in her skin. I want to mm -hmm. like be able to talk about sewing stuff like her. Oh, Linda's is she is quite amazing, and she has that ability to let everybody feel like they're her best friend, like immediately. Mm -hmm. You talk mm -hmm. to her, and it's just it's just her aura. Uh, she's just an incredible person, and her sewing knowledge is oceans deep <laughs> uh -huh. mm -hmm. she's very talented yeah and mm -hmm. she has a way of like inspiring you to be like i just know i can do this now <laughs> right she right right the, yeah <laughs> the vibe check there you go <laughs> oh well i guess pat we kind of just went right into it didn't we <laughs> yes <laughs> <laughs> Well, it is wonderful to have you on as i mentioned i am a little nervous because you're you're quilting royalty but oh. <laughs> if you could just tell everybody a little bit about yourself that would be fabulous Ah, well, I'm, uh, I'm Pat Sloan, and I live in Northern Virginia, uh, just outside Washington, D.C. So if they visualize that, I live within a very, very highly populated area. I've got 1.2 million people in my county. So uh, we are <laughs> very, I, I call myself very urban. Uh, so it's very urban living. Um, let's see, I've been sewing 
you know, quite quite a long time. I learned in home ec class. So I was one of those mm-hmm. kids that took home ec class where, uh, you know, when that teacher said, turn on the machines, it was like the angel sang because mm-hmm. I was like, oh, this is so cool because I had knew nothing about sewing. I don't have anybody in my family who sewed. Um, really, nobody did crafts for the most part. So it's all my mother always says she doesn't know where I came from. So it's uh, like. <laughs> So do you happen to remember what machine you learned on in home ec? Not in home ec, but my mom and dad uh, were incredibly encouraging. Uh, They still are. And they bought me my own machine. We lived in Europe, so they had to buy it on European currency because um, to run a machine through the transformers were just, you know, so I bought they bought me a genie. Uh, like is that singer genie? Is yep. that genie? Yeah, mm-hmm. and I, it I don't have it anymore because they they left it there when they moved back to the United States. So you know it's uh, it's on that currency. <laughs> well, whoever has it, it's probably still running. Yeah, no, yeah. I, mean, I used to get calls about the singer genie quite a bit when I was in customer service. I can't remember the exact model number or numbers because there's several, but I think it's like five forty four or something. Now that's gonna bug me. Oh <laughs> but no. The- Pat, I do have to say uh, thank you for your unboxing portion of the video you posted the other week. We are very grateful that you did that. When I first saw you pop in on our list, I was like, oh my gosh, Pat Sloan signed up to be one of our affiliates. And I <laughs> kind of, I freaked out he a little a bit. Little. <laughs> uh, I freaked out a little bit. You so, guys are so cute. <laughs> well, to be able to send you something and for you to like show it off on your platform was a really cool like pat on my back moment i was very very proud and and just blessed to make that connection with you and i'm super excited that you're talking to us today oh well it it was so fun uh you were very uh, gracious to send things along to show people they love seeing new things and you Uh you happen to send me almost everything i don't have so that was great though it's fun to yeah awesome yeah yeah very cool uh the other i am sorry one second. <laughs> no, the other thing that I was going to say is the book, um, Bernie's book that you had shown off, everybody was loving on that book. And it's cool that you had mentioned that you're going to do a deeper dive. If you have looked at that book a little bit further, it's so fabulous. He does such a wonderful job on just mechanic stuff in general. So mm-hmm. very cool. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll have to do that because, you know, I'm, you know, your true confessions. I mean, like, you know, I turn it on and I use it. That's that's how I do machines. You know, I'm just not a real t- machine techie, you know, dive into kind of person. So I'm kind of like on the other end of things, maybe from you guys, because that's sort of your focus, um, mm-hmm. all the little parts and everything. I'm more like, you know, what can I make this do for me? You know, uh, you know, what, what, what can I sew? What can come out the other end in fabric? Uh, so, um, and I put the machines when they have a problem or people need to troubleshoot their own, it's really a, nice to have a tool, uh, book. I like books, you know, that you can go look at. That's awesome. So when you were in home ec and you learned to sew, was that quilting or did quilting come later? Yeah, no, that was, uh, clothing They we just did clothing. And uh, I didn't even know what a quilt was until I met my husband. Yeah, so I met him. He wasn't my husband yet, <laughs> but his grandma, his grandma had uh, made quilts. And so um, my first quilt, I basically decided I wanted to make a bedspread. It was mm. like in 1978. And I went to the sewing store where I bought my clothing fabric and told them I wanted to make a quilt. So they got a magazine. They gave me this magazine. And um, I bought like the calico there because in like 78, there really was not much in the way of fabric for quilting, mm-hmm. you know. And so I made this giant star and it and made a bedspread. And then that was it for a long time, <laughs> a very long time. <laughs> I didn't so even question. think about it. Do you still have that quilt? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, awesome. yeah, I've shown really it. Cool. I've shown it. I actually had it put in a uh, picture of it put in one of my books. Uh, so I did that because I thought it would be fun. <laughs> I have a question for you. So since you have been a part of the quilting community for quite some time, mm-hmm. I, I would say you're probably like one of the community elders and you command the authority in the community. How have you seen the quilting industry grow from your time back in the 70s to now? 
And yeah, I've got, I didn't get in it in the 70s, the industry. I didn't enter the industry until about nine, 1998, oh, okay. uh, 97, yeah, 97, 98. I just sewed as a hobby, um, uh, but it has changed since 97, uh, for sure, because the internet was in, barely existed for anybody who wasn't maybe a big business or government and stuff like that in, in the late 90s. Uh, you know, I worked in computers. That's my first career. So I have a computer science degree. I spent 20 something years as a software developer. Um, and, you know, I was all into the technology. You know, I was in it as fast as I could get, you know, get online, you know, let me sign in. Uh, but it took a really long time for quilt makers to get there. You know, and I would follow different communities and like the knitters were much more progressive. So knitters were like online, but like the quilters mm -hmm. are like, no, 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 <laughs> don't email me. You know, like it's just, it took a really long time, um, but it's been fabulous uh, now that everybody is online. <laughs> or, or, mm -hmm. If they're not, they're like, you know, everything's online. So it's great. It's that's, that's the big, the big, big change because online brings so much with it because mm -hmm. you become a global um, society. You're no longer very isolated to just what is in your own store, in your own community. Um, you now can pick up your phone in the morning and see what your friend in Australia just made. And in the 70s, you couldn't do that. Yeah, your community is incredible. I mean, can you tell everybody a little bit about your YouTube and your Facebook? Yeah, I um, I've been I I love online communities. If they that is where I thrive. I just love to be able to talk to people in an online community, uh, and I've been on them since like ninety eight, nineteen ninety eight. Mm -hmm. I mean, there were communities there. They were small, but I was in them. And so and I so now so I've run online communities on many platforms because over the years platforms change. People start in one place. Like yeah, if anybody remembers Yahoo, there were Yahoo groups that were wonderful and lively and vibrant and had great things and that's all gone they totally gone they shut down that platform uh, so as things slowed and ebbed you moved and right now my community is on facebook my largest community it is 340,000 quilters across the world um and so it is fun it is active uh i have a group of uh, quilters who I call my ambassadors that help me manage the group. They're volunteers. They will answer questions and help um, with, you know, because it's a moderated group because when it's that big you have to have moderation and stuff. So they help with that and, you know, kind of keep things on track and, and all that kind of stuff. And then I've always done YouTube. Um, I don't know when you all started YouTube. Do you remember when you, when you're, when you opened your store probably? Oh, well, it's 15. Yeah. It's been a little while because the girl that previously did it, did it for several years. So yeah, but should, we took over, we took over about a year and a half, two years ago. Well, I was a little bit more or a little bit before Brian, excuse me. Yeah. So I mean, this is the managing this platform for sewing parts mm -hmm. online is new to Trisha and I in the grand um, scheme of things. And we, I mean, it is, I, I just have to take the opportunity to say it is with three people here, so much work just to manage one platform. So the fact that you have gone from platform to platform, mm -hmm. learned, you know, new quirks about each platform, grown your community, community like a lot of internet, um, people who are successful in the internet today, they get there pretty quickly. So to hear that you really trugged through the mud and you, de you just kept consistent and you built this massive, friendly, really engaged community. Mm -hmm. It's just, it's truly impressive. Yeah. Um, like just thinking about it, <laughs> like we've, we're constantly wondering how can we build our community? Cause we love the community aspect of it. It just makes our hearts yeah. happy. And it's like to yeah. see yours grow like that. It's like, Oh, one day maybe we'll have a community. <laughs> <laughs> how do we get there? <laughs> You're really yeah. cool. What we're yeah. trying to say. You're very oh. cool. You're very inspiring. <laughs> Thank you. Well, it is, it is interesting. You have to enjoy it. And, you know, obviously you guys are in that part of the business that you enjoy it, you know, and that has to, you have to enjoy it. I do. That's my favorite. One of my favorite things about doing what I do is the, is the community aspect and where I run it. And like for YouTube, I tried it like, like six months after YouTube went up 
I made my first video. And yeah. so it's awful. You can see it. It's out there. <laughs> it's like I, I filmed it in my I I filmed it in my backyard. I mean, it's like, you know, but I I spent a lot of time in, in this business on the road. And so during that part, my video stuff was a lot less because mm -hmm. I was spending time on the road. And then when I was home, I was writing a lot of books. And so there was just other parts that were making everything run and YouTube wasn't part of that. Um, and so it's, it's still, I would do one every so often, but um, after my podcast ended, um, I decided that, you know, I get back into YouTube more consistently since I didn't have this weekly podcast anymore. Now I would do like a weekly video or maybe mm -hmm. I would do one other one. So I started building that up over the past, for the past five years. Um, and I just hit 99,000 uh, subscribers. Yes. Congratulations. <laughs> Congratulations. Yes. You're close so, to 100. I'm close to 100,000. That's the goal. I've been giving quilts away. You, you would think like it would just grow like fast, but even when you give quilts away, it still takes very long time to grow, yes. grow your subscriber rate. Um, but there, I have a really great community there. Uh, and that feeds all the other things that I do so that people watch my video, then they come to my Facebook group and then they, um, then we talk there about what's going on because Facebook allows you to share a picture. So mm -hmm. I'll say, show me your blue quilts today or show me your Star Wars quilts today or whatever it is. And th they can't show that on YouTube. So they go over to my Facebook group. Yep. So they are all kind of in interconnected. So speaking of your YouTube, one of your videos in particular is your most successful video and it doesn't have a whole lot to do with what you're known for, which is quilting. Do you want to talk about right. that for a second? Yeah, I think right now my highest watched video is where I had skin cancer. And so it was on my face, which you know, on my nose. And so I had looked like, you know, the bride of Frankenstein for, you know, about a month or so while that was healing. And my surgeon, um, he suggested that I do a video on it. He said, you know, it's, there's a lot of people who are, don't have the information that you might be able to provide about your experience. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I did. I basically talked about what I went through because there's a lot of scary videos out there. Mm -hmm. And even though my face looks, looked a little bad, looked a little rough, uh, it was, you know, I, mine was not a scary one. It was basal cell carcinoma, which is very um, slow growing, very isolated. You know, um, I had the Mohs procedure, but anyways, the, that video is um, watched by a lot of people who are not quilters. <laughs> so they yeah. just find it. I appreciated that video a lot because it was educational for a completely different aspect, but you did such a great job passing on information. So I know a lot of people are going to appreciate that video. But yeah. also you had a whole nother experience with, with some injuries, right? Oh yeah. I, I had a couple of years there where it just was not, <laughs> was not my time. Yeah. I get yeah, right after COVID started, um, you know, like three months into it, I tripped on the sidewalk and broke both of my wrists. And so um, if for any of you out there that have broken one wrist, uh, you know, I would have prayed for that, <laughs> but two wrists was a bit rough. And I was in this spot where we, none of us really understood what COVID was and how long we would be under these restrictions and, you know, not be well. And uh, so I decided I would just keep filming. So I filmed, I film uh, six days a week. And so I still filmed six days a week with two broken, two broken wrists for, that's dedication right there. That's wild. <laughs> that's, God, that's that's awesome. My husband had to do a lot of stuff when that was going on. So it, <laughs> he had to help with a lot of things and then he had to film, including filming. So he even went on film once. <laughs> that's like, nice. he was like well, I'll come and say hi. <laughs> that's awesome. Well, thank you, husband. <laughs> yeah. Great. I do my have husband, to Greg. On the <laughs> I do have to touch on the fact that you just said you film six days a week. How yes. do you prevent burnout? Yeah, seriously. Well, I've been filming six days a week for three and a half years. Wow. So, um, you know, I am taking time, like if there's a holiday, I don't do a film. Like during the first mm -hmm. year, I kind of filmed. I mean, I had to film on Christmas Day the first year mm -hmm. because we were under COVID and people were just 
felt sad. So I just felt like I would do one because it wasn't a lot for me to do 10 minutes and just say hi, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, But now I have to take I had to take some time where I'm just not filming or I'm not having to produce a film and load it that day, you know, that mm-hmm. kind of a thing. So I just yeah. have to balance. But basically my, my videos are not, I'm not doing heavy duty tutorials six days a week. You know, mm-hmm. I am showing you what I sew and I prefer to do that. I mean, there's lots of tutorial videos out there and that's kind of not what my gig is. I'm more a lifestyle this is what I do mm. all on a daily basis. I, I host lots of sew alongs. So we talk about those. I talk about organization. I talk about, you know, just whatever it's kind of comes to my mind. Um, so it is not one of those channels where you'll go, you know, very often to say, I want to learn how to do a miter corner. Well, I might mm. show you that, but I'm going to talk about a bunch of other stuff in the same video. So it's not like my format is just more lifestyle. Mm. I like that because... Yeah it's saying like, I know exactly who I am and what I want to deliver. And it's like prioritizing, you know, what makes you happy with the content. Because ultimately, if you are not having fun with the content you're producing, then no, like, it's not going to, it's translate. It's not going to translate. So to say like, no, my priority is to be authentically myself with who I am online. And I'm not going to, you know, spend all this time creating these tutorials when that's not what I'm interested in doing. And you still like, because, most people go to YouTube for that kind of stuff. So right. to get a, mm-hmm. a community to fall in love with you just by sharing your story, mm-hmm. I mean, that's pretty awesome. It is. Yeah. And speaking of community, I want to back up to um, COVID when you had said people were just sad. You, we had encountered this during our So Creative Live where somebody was saying that they felt part of something, you know, I know you're probably looking at me like, Trish, what are you even talking about? <laughs> he knows what I'm talking about. No, I know what you're talking about. <laughs> but there's people that feel a connection with you when you can grow that community together. And it's like you're thinking you're sharing some sewing stuff and they're sitting here feeling like I'm part of something. And that's what we want, too, because legit, we want people to really feel as they're part of our community and we can learn together, grow together, do projects together. And that just made, that just made me so happy. I know I'm not getting it across the way I need to, but I, it just made me yeah. really happy. And I'm, I'm actually getting teary eyed because it makes me like emotional. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> There's a lot that you can do with platforms like this to make people feel better. So, right. It, people do love, I mean, they listen to it in the background or they, Mm -hmm. they need to have a pick me up because something else isn't going so well, you know, and they can go back. We can all sort of, um, sort of dig into our sewing sometimes, or just Mm -hmm. into that community, because you don't even have to be sewing. You can just dig into your community and say, Hey, Mm -hmm. you know, I need some happiness. So you can look at pretty quilts or listen to somebody talk about pretty quilts (laughs) or show, (laughs) you know, show something fun or, and, and if there's a little education, Hey, that's cool. But sometimes you don't have any brain power for that. You know, sometimes you don't want to have to listen to a heavy duty tutorial. You just want a little quilt chat like you're at a guild. I don't know Mm. uh, if you're involved with your local guilds, but, you know, like at a guild, sometimes people come. They don't want to sit and sew. They just want to hang out and be with everybody and get that really good vibe. And so Mm -hmm. that's what I hope I provide with my videos is like you're, you know, anywhere in the world, any time of day you need it. You need it at 2 a.m. in the morning, just turn it on. There it is. You can join in. Yeah, quick shout out to the Hickman County Quilt Guild in, in uh, Centerville, Tennessee. That's my quilt guild. I hope oh, you all good. are there. <laughs> um, so I have a question really quickly. So talking about the connection you've made with your community, do you have any fun or interesting stories about meeting people who follow you online in real life? Meeting them in real, oh yeah, I've met lots of people in real life because when I taught on the road, um, you know, they were, they were there. Uh, it w- was kind of fun and is that I wasn't doing a whole lot of videos during this, but the community thing was massive. I have a co-author, Jane Davidson, who's Australian. We did a two books, um, but when we were doing the first book called The Splendid Sampler, we invited about 80 designers to all do a six inch block. And then we did this free quilt along for the world. And mm-hmm. so every week for a year, because we had a block 
and it was a different designer. Well, when this first kicked off, you know, we had a, a special uh, Facebook group for it. We had a special website for it. Um, but when it first kicked off, it was amazing because it had involved so many people, uh, so many other designers that all did the kickoff all at once. So you had like mm -hmm. lots of momentum where people heard about it. That was the thing. We wanted lots of people to hear about it, to join in. And I would go to things and people would have their displays of their blocks. You know, and when we first started, it was so fun to just go all over the U.S. And then Jane was in Australia doing the same thing. She'd go in and somebody would have a display up. Look at the blocks that we're doing. And, you know, oh, then that's it's awesome. that's incredible. And, you know, so that that was just a really massive effort. But uh, on a smaller scale, it always the same thing's going to happen. You know, they'll talk to me about something I said on the video and I would I would forgot that I had. You know, I'm like, how, how do they know that? And it's like, you have that brief second. It's like, because that's video and this is real life. So, you know, <laughs> how do you know that? Oh, you're watched. Okay. <laughs> that's incredible. I also want to touch on the fact that you've mentioned a couple of times that you have books. So you're an author. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, I started writing books very soon after I started in the industry. Um, Leisure Arts was the publisher at the time, and they came to me, and I did uh, 20 books, about, no, not 20, probably about 17 books with Leisure Arts, and then I went over to Martin Gale. I did 10 books with Martin Gale. Uh, I have done uh, several other publications with, like, McCall's Magazine. They used to make publications. So I, I've done uh, 30 quote books. Is it a lot of work? Uh, it, it, it is, it is. Uh, but I also, um, when I write books, I, I partner very heavily with the, my publisher so that it's their job to do like the editing, their job to do all the formatting, all that kind of stuff. So it's my job to come up with the designs and the concepts and make the, get the quilts made and all that. But I'm not laying out the books and things like that. Mm. That's the, that's a publisher job. That's not my job. There are people who do the whole thing. Mm. You know, they publish self-published books where they have to do the layout. They have to do the marketing of the book, you know, head to distributors and all that. Whereas if when you partner with the publisher, you have a, you know, you're splitting the work. There's, mm -hmm. there's work. So I did, I think the most I did was like three books in one year, which was insane. That was insane. Yeah. That sounds yeah. like a lot. Yeah, it was I, a lot. And I was also really, teaching on the road. So that was oh no goodness. other life but that. <laughs> so speaking of being on the road, how often do you travel now? Zero. 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 So, yeah, yeah. So in 2019, after 20 years on the road, I stopped that part of my business. So mm -hmm. I decided 20 years of heavy travel was enough. And I would rather do something else. So, uh, <laughs> well, taking advantage of the online platforms works well for you too. So, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so, right, right. Yeah. So, when it comes to your YouTube videos and everything, I know you said with Facebook you have some moderators. With YouTube, do you primarily do that by yourself or with the assistance of your husband a little bit? Yeah, I do it 100% by myself. Wow. I do it all, all of it. I do the, I decide what it's going to be, I film it, produce it. I put the film together, edit the film, load it, do all the social media, you know, notices that everybody will see it came out and all that. So, yeah. Pat Sloan uh, says, and this is why we could call you quilting royalty. <laughs> Pat says, I be girl bossing right now. Right, right. <laughs> oh. Teach me your lesson. We were emailing before when you had mentioned doing a podcast for 10 years and like, this is a new venture for us. I'm like, pass on the wisdom. Mm. We'll, we'll take any advice you've got. <laughs> I really enjoyed interviewing people. I really enjoyed because I love stories mm -hmm. and I love hearing what um, makes people tick, you know, and I would spend a lot of time going out and looking at what my, in, my, my guest did for, with their work. I would read their most current things. I would look at their, you know, if they had videos or their pictures or whatever they were doing so that I knew some fun things. I would always ask my guests, um, was there something special they wanted to share? Was there something going on that they wanted to be to tell us about? Uh, because I can't know everything. You know, mm -hmm. I don't know. So if I ask them, then I get the best information in advance. Mm -hmm. um, 
And then we always had sort of a list of questions because some people are not quick on their feet. You know, they don't want to be surprised. So I always had all my list of questions. This is the kind of things we're going to talk about. So we'd agree on it and they would know in advance. Uh, that way they felt comfortable. You know, it was all about being comfortable. And of course, mine were no video. So they could be in their <laughs> jammies and didn't need any makeup. They could have the dog on their lap. It didn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> Make it a little more comfortable. Sorry. Well, on that note, Pat, is there something that you would like to share with us? <laughs> and I wasn't. I wasn't fishing, but <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, I I really would hope that if you're not, uh, if YouTube is something that you just use, like I'm just going to go search for this, and then you get off of YouTube. I would suggest you look around and see mm. what else might be. You know, because there are so many other types of videos out there besides strict um, tutorials, <clears throat> which are amazing. You can learn everything you need to know um, uh, by a tutorial at, on YouTube. It is incredible. There's so much good stuff, but there's other styles, other mm -hmm. styles. So you might want, you know, you just explore. You can, I tell people, you can listen to them in the background because a lot of it, you don't need to watch so much. You mm -hmm. can, you know, just kind of listen to uh, to the chat, to what's ta what they're talking about. And the other thing I wanted to say is that uh, if you, I, I, I've declared myself like the unofficial uh, ambassador for the Virginia Quilt Museum. So I had to give a plug to the Virginia Quilt Museum. <laughs> if you're in Virginia and you are near Harrisonburg, Virginia, um, stop into the Virginia Quilt Museum. It is in a pre-Civil War uh, home. Mm. So if you're into old homes, that's really neat. Uh, you can see most of the home because uh, the museum fills the whole house is three stories um, and they always have great exhibits. They have not just old quilts. They have lots of contemporary quilts, um, all different styles of quilts. And I often talk about what they're doing on my videos. And I just finished, um, which we still have little parts of it, but we did it so along with my friend Wendy Shepard and I, where we actually patterned a quilt from the museum and ran it with the museum. So as a fundraiser so that we could raise money for the museum. They bought the pattern. <clears throat> we did a sew along. We are having an in-person event in September with Wendy and I and the vintage quilt and our quilts. And then people can submit their quilts to have some of them exhibited in the museum for a three month oh, exhibit. So it is awesome. Spectacular. That's awesome. That's really cool. So I've got a question with Wendy Shepard. She's an aura philosopher, correct? So are you mm -hmm. a fan of Orophil? Oh, I've been with Orphil, Orphil since they started making thread. So wow. have you met Alex Veronelli? I've not met Alex, no. No. Alex, uh, Alex is head of their marketing. Yes, we have. Oh, yes, we have. I just didn't realize her last name. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. Alex V. Yeah. This, so Alex, uh, Alex wrote me one time and said, uh, many years ago, he goes, can I send you some thread? And I'm like, sure, send me some thread. <laughs> And we've been best friends ever since. So uh, he and Elena Gregati, Elaine is the president uh, of Orophil and Orophil USA. Her father is the president of the major Orophil, which is based in Italy. So I've known, I've been part of the Orophil family since day one. I have thread kits with them and things like that. So nice. Pat Sloan's uh, perfect box of neutrals. Yeah, there you That's go. That's right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I do have to clarify because I now am confused because I'm sitting here thinking Alex is, no, I'm thinking of Aaron. Thinking of Aaron but I'm we thinking did of meet Aaron. Alex. We met, they yeah. were really good to us they when were. we met them. We met the whole Orophil team, except for Karen Miller, who I am dying to meet in person. Oh, because Karen's her. wonderful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. She's, oh gosh, I just love Karen. Yeah. Karen, if you ever watch this, I love you. And <laughs> I can't wait to see you virtually again. Yeah. So I'm horrible with names, but yeah, now that we have that clarified, mm -hmm. thank you for that. <laughs> yes. So, Aaron, she, she is um, sort of a contact person, marketing mm -hmm. also, but a contact person. Yeah. That's fun. Yeah. Brian can definitely share his love for Orophil. <laughs> oh yeah. I just think it's a great, it, it I really think it's a great product. I think that they're very uh, thoughtful with how they curate their collections. And I know that the company has a really good message behind it. The culture there is really great. They're always doing really good things for the community at large. I, enjoy, I just, I, I love working with them every chance I get. 
Yeah, they're they're an international company, and so they're very mindful of a lot of mm -hmm. things, and um, are very generous uh, across with the quilters, with events. Uh, when I, you know, when the Ukraine war started, um, when Ukraine was, you know, invaded, a lot of people felt like kind of like they wanted to do something. And mm -hmm. I talked to Orville and I said, I want to do something, but I want to raise money. You know, that's what I want to mm -hmm. have. I want to do. So they helped me figure out. Uh, we did um, a fundraiser that raised like two hundred thirty thousand dollars. So it was. You know, that's a lot. That is a lot of money. <laughs> that's awesome. It's a lot of money. That's amazing yeah. to yeah, take the that quilters, on. You know, quilters were amazing. I did a quilt block and people made the quilt blocks and hung them all over the place, you know, all their where they live, their businesses. Um, then people in other countries, you know, would send me pictures of, you know, the quilt blocks that they made into quilts. And then, um, then lots of quilts were donated to different places on behalf. But the whole thing was done as a as a fundraiser and you know they orfil was the company i approached to help me figure out how what was the best way to do this um so i yeah. want to touch on one thing because this has been fresh on my mind i was thinking about this the other evening i must have just been like washing the dishes and zoning out or something <laughs> but i was thinking about what i enjoy about quilting so much um and i don't know like as a symbol like what is a quilt mean to humanity like it's a symbol of comfort and warmth and security and comfort and love and so mm -hmm. it takes a very specific empathetic warm type of person to want to dedicate their time to making a quilt for somebody because on on a a, a, a human level like it is such a meaningful gift and um i just it it brought me full circle with those thoughts that I was having this week. And when you talk about how um, you had talked about quilters wanting to help. And when the Ukraine war happened, I experienced the, the warmth of the quilting community for the first time when I was working in customer service here in the middle of the pandemic and all quilters wanted to do was make masks for everybody. That's all they wanted right. to do. They just right. wanted to help. And so I don't know. I just, I, I think that you and your platform, you kind of embody that essence a little bit. Um, so thank you. That's all I have to say. Oh. <laughs> oh, it is it is an amazing hobby for people and it it is much deeper in a lot of for a lot of people. It, just yes. as you were expressing, there's a deepness to it that they may not ever really sit down and think think broadly about it, but it is there. Um, it's not for everybody. Some some people make a baby quilt and that's it. You know, they're done. But uh, there's so many people. It, it's actually quilting is a lifestyle. It yeah. is a lifestyle and uh, for a large number of people. And it doesn't mean that they have to sew every day. They mm -hmm. might just uh, look at patterns or go on their watch YouTube or go to their community. Um, just go to the store and browse and buy because buying is one hobby and making <laughs> stuff is another <laughs> true they're two it's separate right. hobbies that is a <laughs> that's awesome well you you get to use my what a yes. one of three quilts <laughs> thank you trisha i am wearing her quilt right now I, i'm on a very um early journey in my quilting experience <laughs> so well, everybody has to make their first quilt I mean, mm -hmm. you can't get there without making one, and then mm -hmm. you have to make more and more and more. Um, that, that's what I always tell everybody. You just need to make another one. Okay, you're done. Make another one. You know, you just. <laughs> I'm a. I I love to make. That's mm -hmm. you know. When I started quilting, I knew it was going to be a deep dive because I was like, oh, this is really fun because I love fabric, and mm -hmm. for clothing. I'm not very good at making clothing. I'm pretty bad because yeah. uh, I just it just didn't click with me. But I made it anyways. I made it for years and years, and I would wear it, and it didn't fit. And you know, I just make <laughs> something else. But when I found quilting, I was like, yes, this is it. This is it. <laughs> Brian and I have had this conversation before. I love the sewing process, like even with quilting or whatever, I like just being behind the machine, relaxing, getting in my zone. I think the thing that I struggle with the most on quilting is the prep. Like, I'm like, maybe I should start with kits and have it all cut out <laughs> and then I can get behind the machine. But um, yeah. I know you enjoy the cutting process a lot. Yeah, for me, it's a, um, what I like about quilting is the ritual, you know? 
it uh, you 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 find something that you want to make and then you go and you buy the fabric and you get the pattern and you do the measurements and then you start the cutting but you have to do you pre-wash or you do you don't pre-wash do you starch do you press <laughs> like you there everybody has their own very particular way of doing it and um there's also something very peaceful about the consistency of the hobby that you are repeating yourself a lot you're almost like tessellating your actions mm. a little bit um mm -hmm. it, and it just like i have a very anxious adhd mind and when i'm quilting my mind is quiet and mm. um it's a luxury that i don't get to experience when i'm doing a lot of other things so mm -hmm. uh yeah that's that's what i have to say about that that's very interesting very interesting. No, um, in prepping for it though, another thing I've told you, I like to do projects that I have that I can finish relatively quickly. So maybe that's another thing that I struggle with when it comes to quilting, because it's hard for me to do that slowing down. I want to just be done. Uh, so I have recently started like just making myself slow down, take my time on different projects and stuff. And I've enjoyed the process. It's just not my natural tendency. Right. So I think right. I will become more in love with quilting as I continue mm -hmm. to do that. So, yeah. And as you, as you keep making them, there will be, it'd be like, it's like learning to drive. When you learn to drive, you have so many things that are new. Like you don't mm -hmm. know how to do any of those things. So you're, you know, mm -hmm. it's hard to remember learning to drive, but that's the way it was. And, but then they be, become habit or they become mm -hmm. just totally things you don't think about. Uh, and that's the way it happens with quilting. In the beginning, there's so many different little things that you have to keep in place and your mind has to be pretty in sync with all of it. But later after a while, you get to narrow that down and then you mm -hmm. can sort of be Zen, a little bit Zen about a lot of it. And that's mm -hmm. kind of relaxing because your brain doesn't have to be so focused all the time to be sure that you've, but you still have to focus, you know, like, did you cut that right? I just, I just have something right now that I'm like, oh, that's, what, that's not right. I what cut that, I, I mean, I cut a bunch of them and here's two of them that are too small. Like what, what the heck is that? So I even so, sewed one of them and it was wrong. So yeah, there. <laughs> nice. <laughs> so outside of quilting, Pat, what else do you like to do? <laughs> There's other things that's like. <laughs> yeah, what no, do you mean outside you're, of quilting? You're totally fine like, with no. This is it. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, over the years, I you know I have tried many many crafts before I sort of settled in and uh, you know sort of zoned only to this. I do some cross stitch. I always call myself a baby cross stitcher. Um, I do, and you know, and it's still like in the sewing realm. Like I, I've done hand embroidery, you know, that kind of a thing, hand work. Um, but outside of that, I love, I love flowers, and so I mm. do some gardening. But I don't do a ton because I don't want the maintenance of a garden. So my garden is kind of um, contained, you know, not too big, not too much. Um, I do like travel when it's not work. Now, you know, like travel somewhere for fun. Um, but yeah, that's, uh, <laughs> I used to do a lot of baking and cooking, but I don't do that so much anymore. You know, that was kind of, I did that for many, 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 many years. And now I'm like, uh, you know, yeah. stick to what you like, you know? Yeah. yeah. So what's one way that you boost your creativity? Hmm. <laughs> I'm not that deep. That's like, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not that deep. Uh, yeah. Well, I guess I don't really have problems with my creativity. Mm -hmm. I guess that's, you know, there are times when, especially earlier in my career where I had to, I have to design on command, you know, basically design, oh. like production designing, you know, there are people who are artists who, who do their work and then there are like production artists. And so I think a lot of quilt people in the quilt business, you have to work on a production artist kind of mindset. So if mm -hmm. I need to produce a snowman quilt today or within the next day or so, I need to do it to meet mm -hmm. a deadline. You know, it isn't like I'm like, oh, I'm not feeling it. I'll do it in December. Like, no, you have to have the quilt shipped in the next, you know, three weeks. So you've got to get the design ready. So I mean, and if you're writing a book and it's seasonal, you might be out of sync of the seasons. You've just got to sort of dig in and 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 do that, do do whatever it is. So I just find it, it's just a job, you know, it's a job yeah. to figure it out and you make it happen. So I don't really, I don't really do anything special. I just decide what well, today is the day it's gonna happen. And uh, 
you know, if, if I'm having some problems with it, I might leave it till the next day, you know, but. Yeah. Awesome. Just get it done. Yep. Just get yeah. it done. Do it. Yeah. It's a, if you, if you know anybody who does production artwork, like in big companies or diff, small companies, whatever, you have deadlines and mm -hmm. you just can't, you just can't sit around not doing your job. So mm -hmm. you just, you just, it, you just dig in and it, starts coming up, I guess. <laughs> I love that. So I do want to touch on the machine that you use. What is your normal sewing machine? I have a baby lock, uh, Solaris, um, Whoa. vision. <laughs> We're both like Make dream, dream machine. <laughs> I am a baby lock ambassador. Uh, and I have been for six, seven years, something like that. And so they are very, very generous. Uh, they always like us to have the ambassadors to have, uh, you know, newer, higher end machines. Mm -hmm. uh, it has lots of bells and whistles that are not my normal work mode. Like I don't, it has a, you know, incredible embroidery features, which mm -hmm. I'm just not an embroidery quilter. So, uh, or embroidery person, it's just, uh, and I've done it, but it's just not in my mode you know what i i normally do so but i love i love the machine um i don't i used to have i mean i still have it i have a tiara and i have a sashiko and i have an old destiny uh, an older destiny uh two machine as well um but like i used to used to use the tiara for the free motion quilting but the solaris i don't really need to use the tiara now because mm -hmm. the, I, if it's really big i just send it to long armor because I'm not gonna, I'm not interested in that type of quilting. So the smaller stuff I can just do on the Solaris. So I can do everything. It's yeah. a huge machine. It is a huge machine, but in general though, Baby Lock, their machines are so beautiful and they're so user-friendly and their interface is wonderful to use. And we love their education and I just love everything about Baby Lock, so. That's, that's kind pretty, of the key here. I yeah. mean, like, that's the other thing about Baby Lock and about you and about Orophil and about, like, mm -hmm. you know, they're, they are about community. It's all about community. Those are the brands we tend to gravitate yeah, towards. Those are the things we tend to use. It's the ones that are about building the community. That's, that's the very interesting. You're diving in for the anyway. reasons behind it. <laughs> I love it. No, I'm a big, big fan. So very very cool well i hate that we always have to do the ending thing it's always like i don't want to end <laughs> well i've got but a good ending question do it what's next for pat sloan well i don't know i just sort of uh, move i don't have any huge plans or any secrets or anything like that you know <laughs> i i <laughs> I have to do my August schedule, you know, but uh, other than that's this in a few weeks, it comes up. That's about how far ahead I'm planning. Uh, no, I, I, I do plan things for the years, but I just don't have major, major big. I mean, after being in the, I think I've been full time in the business almost 24 years and have done a lot of different uh, things. And I've been, uh, you know, enjoyed all of those experiences. And so now I really just like to sort of sew for fun. Really, mm -hmm. that's what I like to sew for fun. Don't, you know, I also have fabric with Benertex. So I'm constantly doing sort of projects with my Benertex fabric. That's what this fabric is here. Um, and so that's the thing that's always sort of on ongoing and, and coming along. But yeah, just uh, sew alongs and having fun and doing the same thing I'm doing now. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Well, on a final note, what is one piece of advice that you would give a new quilter? Ah, a new quilter. Yeah. Is uh, I would just say, keep making quilts because they tend, people will tend to make one and feel like it has to like be a masterpiece or whatever. Um, a lot, not everybody feels that way, but a lot of people do, you know, but then they stop. And it mm. might be a while before they make another one. It's a mind, memory, motion kind of a thing, even mm. for quilting. So if you do one, then make another, make another, make another. Just, just get on that train, you know, and just keep going because you get better really fast by making things, mm. not by reading about it or watching it or talking about it. You actually get better by making them. And mm -hmm. so if you could just keep going one right after the other, even if they're simple, you will start perfecting all those things like your quarter inch and your cutting abilities and how you put it together, the final thing, your color organization, all of that gets fine tuned by actually making. 
Wonderful. And I'm going to take that advice. We'll <laughs> <laughs> cut a quote out today. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, thank you so much for joining us, Pat. Seriously, this has been truly an honor to get to sit and chat, chat with you. So we appreciate you taking the time to spend with us. Well, that was awesome. I'm really glad that we got to play that. I, you know, we, I muted. Yeah. Are you sure? No. Hey, in the chat, let me know if you can hear me. You're good. I'm good? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So uh, as I was saying, we filmed that quite some time ago. So it's really cool to see it, you know, in retrospect. Um, it was a really fun conversation. And I had already started falling in love with quilting. I think that's that was like around the time that my uh, perspective on quilting started to shift after I, I talked to a quilter named Tim Natar. And we had a really great conversation. I, we had a conversation with Shelly Tobish, who was on earlier today. And it was in those conversation with those women that I started to realize what it was all about. And I think that the thing that resonated most with me when I had that conversation, when we had that conversation, Trish and I, with Pat, when she said quilting is a lifestyle, that's when it clicked for me. I realized that it, it, it wasn't just about the art. It's about all of it. It's, you know, it's about that when you really dive deep into quilting, it becomes a part of your personality and it, it becomes a deeper part of your life. And it brings you all of this joy. And, and for some of us, some serenity from the anxious thoughts we have in our heads. And yeah, I, I think that that conversation that I had with Pat, that Trish and I had with Pat, uh, was one of the most meaningful experiences I've ever had in my life. So thank you to Pat. If you ever see this for having that convo with us, it was very, very special. And I'm so glad that we got to share it with our audience today. So that said, Alex and I, while that was playing, we've been brainstorming on what we can do to fill this last hour because we, you know, we could cut the stream early, but we don't think it's fair to everybody who, you know, there's some people who can't make it to all the segments. So they look at the schedule and they see what they want to, what they want to attend the most. And a lot of people really want to be there for the last giveaway of the day. And that's completely fair and valid. So we're not going to cut the stream early. Instead, what we're going to do is Stephanie Hackney joined us for Christmas in July. She did a smaller version of what she was supposed to do today. She did a little bit of a Q&A. And I know a lot of people were really, really excited about her batting lecture because batting is a very overwhelming thing. You know, uh, when you look at batting, you're like, what's 80-20? What's loft? What is, uh, what is scrim? Like, what do all these things mean? Um, so I know there were people looking forward to the information she was going to share today. So we're going to play the segment from Christmas in July so that you can get a little bit of a snippet and hopefully leave today at least feeling a little bit more confident about batting. So, uh, before we do that, I'm going to do a giveaway, but I actually have a little bit of a surprise. Alex doesn't even know about this one. So I grabbed extra Orophil, uh, thread kits just in case for something like this. Um, I, I, I grabbed exactly as many segments as we had, plus a few more just in case. Um, and I just want to say thank you to you guys for being so patient and rolling with the punches on this one and hanging out with us while we figured out what to do to fill that extra slot. So for this segment, instead of giving away one, we're going to give away two. So two people are going to win. And the next segment, instead of giving away one, we're going to give away two. So four people uh, are going to get a chance to enter the grand finale giveaway. Um, so I, I, yeah, just thank you for being patient with us. So Alex, let's go ahead and bring up the giveaway tool and we're going to do two. Okay. Yes. Okay. And I also have to say that one of my absolute, he does one of my favorite things about Brian is his heart. He's like the giveaway fairy, but he's got one of the biggest hearts that I've ever met in my entire life. I had no idea he was doing this, but I should have known because this is just what he does. He just like sprinkles joy everywhere at all times. And I just, I'm obsessed with you, but okay. Well, thank you, Alex. That is very kind of you. I appreciate that. Okay, right. so let's give away the first one. This is going to be thread kit number 15. So everybody drum roll, please. Congratulations, Mary H. Let me write down your name. And you are going to be thread kit number 15. So you are going to be entered into the grand finale giveaway uh, tomorrow at the end of the day. So now we are going to do giveaway number 16. But before we do that, I just want to say, 
Uh, the only person in the world that can make me drum, drum, drum roll like a Griswold is Michelle from Sewing Machine Artistry. Nobody else is ever going to see me do that ever again, okay? All right, let's do this one. Ready, set, go. Ellen Camden, I recognize that name. Ellen, mm -hmm. this is not your first So Creative Live, so congratulations. You are entered to win the grand prize tomorrow, uh, and that's super exciting. Okay, Ellen. Congratulations, guys. C. Okay. So we're going to go ahead and play that playback from uh, Stephanie's Q&A from July, and then when we're done with that, we'll go ahead and do the wrap-up of the day and the uh, final giveaway of day two about batting i've written down several and i'm hoping you guys have your questions ready because we can get them answered from stephanie she's got so much knowledge regarding batting so hello, hello stephanie <laughs> how are you doing today i'm great how are you guys very good thank you for asking i was just telling everybody we're super excited about this segment because i know i have a lot of questions about batting so i'm hoping those questions come on in and you can help us get all of those answered <laughs> awesome awesome that's what we're so, here for right want to get the yeah, questions right. answered and i think oftentimes what happens is people don't maybe don't even know what they don't know um because mm -hmm. i get a lot of questions where people say you know i've been quilting for 20 years, right? And at the end of a lecture, uh, because I do give this as a formal lecture, they'll say, I had no idea. I had no idea there were so many things. Or one of the most common things I hear is, now I know why that quilt didn't turn out exactly the way I wanted it to. <laughs> so I think it's important um, that we try to give as much information as possible. And uh, that's what we're here to do today. Well, I know when we spoke previously, you had said, you know, some people will have multiple pages worth of notes. So I am ready. <laughs> I've got my pen, I've got my paper. Awesome. We are good to go. <laughs> awesome. So before we get into the questions, you want to tell everybody a little bit about yourself? Sure. So um, a little bit of background on the company. Um, the company company is, uh, the formal name is Hobbs Bonded Fibers, and we're what's known as a non-woven textiles firm. So we make lots of products. They're not made um, by weaving uh, input products like you would normally make fabric. Uh, we make them from loose components. We combine them in a variety of different processes, and we make things like uh, the lining that you see in your trunk of your car. We make items for first responders. Uh, we make uh, things for the equine industry, for the clothing industry. So lots Lots and lots of different products. Of course, I think the batting and the craft products are the most exciting, uh, and that's a division that I am in charge of. So I'm the director of sales and marketing. I've been with Hobbs almost seven years, and I came into the the role. 10 days before quilt market. So it was like a trial by fire. <laughs> they threw me in the deep end and said, will she learn everything there is to know about quilting and batting? And it's been a fantastic ride. Um, my previous career uh, is I worked in the paper crafting industry for many years. Um, I was also in the media for the paper crafting industry and wrote a, a monthly brand, branding column for a retailer magazine. And uh, prior to that, I worked in IT. Prior to that, I was a makeup artist. So it's been a long and winding road. And But I have to say that I think this is really the most exciting uh, in terms of the things that I've done in my career because it you just get to be surrounded by all these amazingly creative people, right? And wonderful people, like really genuine, kind, giving, loving, caring people. And it's just fantastic to see all the amazing things people make with our products. So that's the that's the informal bio. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> so I do have to ask also, do you do like quilting or crafting? Like what's your go-to? What makes your heart happy? Right. So um, I am a quilter, um, but I actually really like Hand quilting. I love EPP, so I've always got three or four EPP projects going on whenever I'm traveling, and that's usually where I have time to work on them. I am looking at a long arm machine. I just attended um, a show and got to sit down with a mid arm machine and a long arm machine, and oh man, <laughs> they're a lot of fun. So I'm already looking in my room and saying, where can I fit one of those things? But then I do a lot of sewing. I like making, you know, personal items, things I can give as gifts. I'm also a paper crafter so I'm a card maker and a scrapbooker I love doing mixed media and I'm hoping to kind of merge the mixed media and some of our products 
to create some really fun experiments. Um, and those are things that I will share either on our website or on our Instagram account. I'll be in the background here and I'll unmute myself to ask you some questions and I'll keep an eye on the comments. I know you said you have a lot of knowledge that you can make sure that you want to share that way too. Um, but if you want to just start out by explaining what is batting? And I'll let okay. you take it away. So for anybody who may be new to quilting and they may be thinking, okay, you know, why does batting really make a difference? So batting obviously is the middle layer. So you've got your top layer, which is generally where your piecing and your stitching is going to be. You've got your back layer and in between there is uh, batting and that's what makes it a quilt. So we make a variety of different products and they're all designed to give different effects to the quilt. Now it could be what the quilt looks like, it could be how it drapes, it could be how warm it is, it could be how heavy or light it is, it could be the way it makes your work um, really stand out. Um, so if you're making something like an art quilt, you have lots of tiny, tiny pieces. We have battings that are specifically made to make those stand out. If you're making a quilt with a lot of big piecing and you really want everything to have a lot of texture, kind of like the quilt behind me, um, then we have other battings that we would recommend for that. But we also know that quilters like to make lots of different projects. And especially if you've been quilting a long time and you've made a lot, a lot of quilts and how many more quilts can you make for your friends and your family? And maybe you want to branch out a little bit. So maybe you're making things for your home, right? You might be making things like table toppers or runners or placemats. You might be making pillows. Uh, you might be making lap quilts. You might be making wall hangings or something for the holidays or maybe even a quilted coat or jacket. So really when we're talking about batting, it can be for any project. It's not just going to be for quilts. So anytime that I say quilt or I mention project, I'm meaning anything that you could make that might have batting in it. The other thing to keep in mind is that we also make things like pillow forms and we use our really nice quality uh, poly stuffing the same fiber that we use to make our poly down batting that's very very well known and loved we use that in making our pillows and we do make all those pillows in-house so they're actually the stuffing is blown in and then we hand sew all of those the great thing about them is they're super puffy and they really hold their shape and they're machine washable we also make stuffing so if you're a doll maker if you make amigurami and you like to stuff it with a really nice stuffing to fill it out if you're going to be making your own pillow forms or maybe you're a doll maker. Um, we make a variety of different stuffings that are fantastic for that as well. I think some of the most important things that I want to impart today is number one, there is no perfect batting. There is a batting that is going to be best for getting you the results you want this time for this project. And there may be trade-offs, right? There may be eight reasons that we say, oh, that's the perfect batting for this project. But there may be one goal that you have for that project that's very specific. And that may be the most important thing to you. And it may be that that batting is not going to give you that result or get, or get you to that goal. So we ask lots of questions. When we spend time with quilters and they're asking for help on batting, we always will ask a lot of questions. And we usually start with a five series of questions, but then it may go to 20 or 30 questions. What we're trying to do is to ascertain as much information as we can about your project and what your goals are so that we can make sure that we're recommending the best batting. And again, no perfect batting. We make all of our own products. We make them in Waco, Texas, and we've been doing that for 45 years this year. So we're very, very proud of that. That's pretty unusual in manufacturing anymore, um, especially in batting to make all of your own products. It's a way that we can control the quality of the products and gives us a chance to make a variety of different types of things so that you have lots to choose from when you're deciding what you're going to be making and how you want it to turn out. A few things that I think are really important. Number one, all of our battings are machine washable. Now, anytime that I say machine washable, there's a couple of little things you need to know. Number one, that is always within a finished project. You never want to wash batting on its own. And here's why. Again, I mentioned earlier that we don't weave products. So we take loose components. Let's say like our 80-20, it'd be cotton and it'd be poly. And we're going to blend those together. And we want them to lock tight together. We want those fibers to hold up over time. Lots of use, leaven, maybe abuse, and washing of quilts. And so we want to make sure that that batting is going to hold tight together. Well, if you take a batting and you put it in a washing machine or you try to wash it on its own, 
this is what's happening. You're actually pulling those fibers apart and ruining the integrity of the batting. So you never want to pre-wash batting. Secondly, with every batting on the package, on our literature, on our website, you will always find a stitch guideline. There's a handy little chart that exists on our product page of our website. And one of the columns here is the maximum distance Oh, let's see, go over here. <laughs> Maximum distance between stitches. That is one of the most important things to pay attention to. And I will tell you in most audiences, only about 10% or 20% of the audience even knows that that recommendation exists and or follows it. Here's why it's important. When we're developing a brand new batting, we are going to make what's called a wash test sample. So we're gonna make little mini quilts. We're gonna quilt them at different distances, and then we're going to torture test them. We're gonna wash them and dry them over and over and over again. Then we are gonna take them apart and we're going to inspect the batting. If we have quilted the batting at four inches and at six inches, and we look at it and we say at four inches, it looks great. But at six inches, we're seeing a little bit of stress in the batting. We're seeing fibers pulling a little bit or maybe migrating a little bit. Um, then we know that six inches is too wide of a stitch guideline. And then we're going to recommend that you stitch the batting every four inches. And what that means is that when you have a quilt like this, you need to go four inches this way and four inches this way. Now, the more densely you quilt, of course, the stronger everything is going to be. But sometimes you want a quilt with a lot of open space. So we do make some battings that have a wider stitch distance. We have one that goes up to nine inches, one that goes to eight inches. Two of those are in that bundle today. So there, that's a chance for you to try some battings that give you a little wider stitch guideline, which number one indicates that they're super, super strong and also indicates that you've got more design options, right? That means that you've got more open space that you can leave open if that's your desire. So that stitch guideline is very, very important. If we tell you you should stitch the quilt every four inches and you stitch it every six or eight inches, you are risking the integrity of that quilt over time because it's not anchored in enough places for that particular combination of fibers, right? And that doesn't mean that a batting that has a four inch stitch guideline or even a three inch stitch guideline is not the same quality as something with an eight or nine inch stitch guideline. It just means that those fibers have different strengths and the way we make the batting makes one even stronger than the other one. So just important to keep that in mind. Another thing to know is that we have two different product lines. So if you notice on the banner behind me, there is Heirloom at the top, Tuscany at the bottom. Those are actually two separate product lines. And those product lines have some crossover products like cotton and wool, and they have some unique products. The primary difference between the two lines is in the way those are packaged. So the heirloom products are rolled very tightly by a machine. They're compressed, they're put into a pre-printed bag, and those go out in case lots. When we do the Tuscany products, we actually use the same base materials when the products are the same in both lines, but we're going to take those to another part of the plant. We're going to hand cut, hand fold and hand package them, and we leave some air in the bags. They're not tightly compressed. They're going to be very lightly folded. There's gonna be air in the bags and a pre-printed insert inside. So what is the difference? Well, the primary difference is with the heirloom products, you will see some wrinkling increasing in the batting with the Tuscany products you won't. Doesn't, again, mean that one is better than the other. It's just a feature of those. Also, the Tuscany products are not sold to big box stores or deep discounters. We only sell those to online resellers, sellers like the ones hosting today's program, or to uh, retail shops, right? Independent quote retail shops. So those are the primary differences between those product lines. And again, there's some crossover and then there's some unique products. Another thing that's really important to think about is when you're thinking about the uh, end result, especially for things like quilts or clothing, there are many different things to consider, right? You've got things like the warmth or the thermal value. Is it gonna be cool? Is it gonna be warm? Is it gonna be both for all year round? Lots of different things to consider. You wanna consider finish and loft. You wanna consider the dry. Hey guys, I just wanted to come on really quickly um, and let you know to ignore the surprise word that says sunscreen. That's from our Christmas in July event. 
In fact, the person who won that segment is watching right now. Her name's Quilty Katie. <laughs> so congrats, Quilty Katie, on winning that uh, Hobbs bundle. But the surprise word for this segment is going to be backstitch. I just wanted to clarify for everybody. All right, go ahead, Alex. Rapeability, right? And the washability. Some battings, even though all are machine washable, some battings have specific requirements around temperature and the cycle that you should put the washing machine on. And I can answer questions about those as we maybe talk about some individual products. So those are the really, I think, the most important things that I wanted to make sure we get out there um, early. And if we have time at the end, we can talk a little bit about bearding as well, because I think there's a lot of misconceptions about what causes bearding and how you prevent it, if it happens to you, how to fix it. For anyone who doesn't know, bearding is when the batting comes up through the surface of the fabric. It'll either come up the top or the bottom. It's generally going to be in the stitch lines, generally not a happy moment for a quilter. Um, and so we have uh, some ways to prevent that and a lot of advice we can give around that. Fabulous. We actually have a few questions coming in for you already. So let me read those off for you. Do you have a specialty batting for microwave use? We actually do not recommend any of our battings go in the microwave. Here's the thing on, on microwave use. Number one, everything you put in the microwave must be 100% cotton. So if you're going to make something like a potato bag or a bowl koozie, it does need to be 100% cotton. And that means the fabric, the batting, the thread, and if you're gonna put any kind of a little tag on it, make sure that that is also 100% cotton. The reason we don't recommend putting things like that in the microwave, so if you're making it like a bowl koozie, we recommend putting the bowl in the microwave, heating it up on its own, and then using some pot holders to drop it into your bowl koozie, using that when you're going to actually eat your soup or whatever you've made. The reason we don't recommend putting it into the microwave is because things can change in that fiber and you're not going to be able to see it, right? It's encased in fabric. So the more times you microwave it, the more chance of is that something is changing inside there in with that fiber. Now, you might put it in there a hundred times and it works great. The hundred and first time, it catches on fire. That is always a risk. So you want to make sure that whatever you're using in the microwave, that it is made specifically for use in the microwave. And again, that every component of your project is 100% cotton. While we do have 100% cotton battings and they are 100% cotton fiber, we still don't recommend that they go into the microwave. And that's primarily because we're just concerned about safety. When you do put something in the microwave, never leave it unattended, never put it in for more than two minutes at a time, check it periodically. Um, and again, just always kind of stay there and keep an eye on it. Great information. Um, we have a couple of questions about your facility in Waco. Do you give tours? Uh, we don't at this time. Um, and here's why. Um, I mentioned earlier that we make a lot of different products. We make products for all different industries. Some of those um, are exclusive products. They're things that we cannot talk about, that we cannot have anybody in the plant when we're producing those. Um, and there's also safety issues, right? The people that are in our plant that are running the machines, they have been trained on safety. They wear specialty goggles, et cetera. Um, and we always need to make sure that safety is our number one concern anytime somebody is in the plant. Even when I am in the office and I work in the front office and when I go into the plant, I have to have closed toed shoes, I have to have specialty goggles on, um, and I know the rules around where you can and can't go around the machinery. Um, and so we don't generally give tours um, because of the fact that it creates a lot of disruption in the process of producing and we're producing uh, two and three shifts all day long, right? So right now it's not possible. However, I would really like to host maybe one or two events a year. Um, we might coordinate those uh, with the silos, which is just down the road from us. Um, it's for any of you who are Chip and Joanna Gaines uh, fans, um, they are just down the street from us. We might coordinate a special event. And in that case, then we would make sure that we could have people go into the plant um, and we would have everything set up to accommodate visitors. Sign me up for that. I am a big fan of Chip and Joanna. <laughs> So I'll tell you, if, if people are interested in how batting is made, um, we did make a product for very high-end outerwear. It is made with buffalo fur, 
And the, I don't know if any of you have ever heard of the program. There's a TV program, the crew came out of Canada and it's called How It's Made. Um, that crew came into our plant and they filmed us making that product a few years back. And if you go on YouTube and just type in How It's Made Buffalo or How It's Made Hobbs, you should be able to find those videos and you'll be able to see the parts of the process that they were able to record. Some of those are, are confidential, we don't share them, um, but it'll give you an idea of how batting is made because how we make that clothing insulation is very similar. How It's Made is a fantastic show. That's actually one of my husband's favorites. He has watched every single one every single season that they put out great great show <laughs> but anyway to batting uh, Marilyn here is asking I just lost my question there we go how do you tell what the right side of the batting is oh great question Marilyn that is something that I think um, people are very concerned about and there are a lot of teachers out there who teach you know to to flip the batting and look for the dimples or the you know or the the little dots you should never need to worry about that with Hobbs batting all of our battings are exactly the same on both sides except for one product and i'll talk about that in just a moment but the batting is made so that it goes through our process in both directions um, so the batting is the same on both sides so you don't need to worry about the, the upside or the downside or the right side or the wrong side the only product that is different is the heirloom natural with scrim that is a hundred percent natural cotton with a layer of scrim they are needle punched together that locks the fibers together and that product has a different you know side on both sides it's cotton on one side it's the scrim on the other side however that needle punching process interlocks those fibers very well so generally if i hand somebody a sample of that product they usually can't tell which side the scrim is on but that's really the only product that is different on one side and when people ask us well do you put the scrim up or down generally we recommend that it go down but you should experiment with it that's what batting really is uh, all about is you want to experiment with different battings and try them because you'll find some that you really love and some may not be your favorites and and that's why there's so many different battings uh, on the market. Can you elaborate a little bit on scrim? What is that? Yeah, let me, um, I actually have a sample here I can show you. So scrim is a stabilizing layer. If anybody's a garment sewer and you've used a stabilizer or an interfacing, it is going to look a lot like that. So this is the batting, right? Looks the same on both sides. However, it has this secret ingredient here and you have to kind of work at getting the two layers apart. So here is your scrim and here is your, your cotton, right? And they are needle punched together. These are really long, sharp needles that pounce in there thousands of times and it locks the fibers together. So this is what the scrim looks like. It is 100% polyester. It is incredibly strong. It's very, very sheer and very, very soft. So what is the benefit of the scrim? With a normal cotton, I would never pull on the batting like this because you would stretch it out of shape and very easily ruin it. With this batting, it doesn't happen, right? And that is because that scrim layer creates a web or a net around the cotton that holds it in place. Where would be an application that that would be beneficial? Um, so a few different things. If you're making something like a wall hanging, like the, the banner behind me, and you want the edges to stay really straight and squared up, that is a perfect batting for that. If you're going to be making something like a whole cloth quilt or an art quilt, um, again, and you want it very structured, that is a really great batting. For the whole cloth quilts, what's really nice, because that is just stitching and you're going to be manipulating the quilt, moving it a lot. It's very easy to stretch out 100% cotton. If you take a um, just like a cotton ball in your bathroom and you take the cotton and you pull on it, it is going to stretch out of shape. If you continue to pull on it, you can pull it apart. It's the same with cotton batting. So cotton batting is a little more delicate than other battings. And that applies to all cotton batting, not just our brand. If it's 100% cotton batting, you need to be a little delicate with it. So when you add that scrim layer, you are adding a layer of strength to it. So if you're making something like a whole cloth quilt that you're going to manipulate a lot, this will keep that batting really nice and straight, keep it from stretching out and getting warped. The other thing is if you're going to make a shaped quilt right so if you maybe you're making an art quilt or a quilt that has a scalloped edge or a curved edge this will hold that shape really nicely and then as i mentioned earlier 
with some of the battings, they have a wider stitch guideline. That scrim uh, batting has an eight inch stitch guideline. That means that you can go eight inches apart on in your stitching, which gives you more design options. And it's a very, very strong batting. If you're making quilts for, for teens um, or toddlers, and you know they're gonna be pulling on their quilts and maybe giving them a lot of love, maybe abusing them, um, even for quilts that are gonna be used outside, this can be a really nice batting because it'll really, really hold up well. Wonderful, Stephanie. Uh, we've got a couple questions here from, one is from Sin. Um, what is the lightest batting to sleep with? I think it's important to distinguish between light and uh, cool or warm, right? So in terms of weight, in terms of light weight, I would say the wool and the poly are going to be the lightest weight right? Cotton is the heaviest fiber. So if you want a really lightweight quilt, then you could go with poly or silk or wool. However, there is a big difference between the thermal value or the warmth of those quilts. So if you mean light in terms of cool, then you would want to stick with something like the silk or the wool. And oftentimes people say wool, but wool is warm. Well, wool is warm, and silk can also be warm, but they also breathe. They're a natural fiber and they breathe. And so even here in very, very hot Texas, it's like 102 and 104 all week this week, um, we use wool and silk in our quilts because we want to make sure that those quilts can be used year round. We don't want to have to swap out our favorite quilts. So we use the wool and the silk. The poly is a really fantastic batting uh, for a lightweight quilt, but it is going to be warmer. It's a man-made fiber. It doesn't breathe the way the natural fibers do. So when your body temperature warms up, it is going to hold in the heat. So again, anytime somebody says light or heavy, um, we always want to make sure that we understand whether they're meaning in terms of weight or in terms of warmth. On that same vein, Jeff Becker is asking I, or saying, I like heavy quilts. Um, what batting would be best for me? So Jeff, if you want to throw it in the comment and clarify <laughs> after hearing Stephanie explain that, we can see what might be a good option for you. Yeah, and I would say if, if you're talking heavy in terms of weight, right? If those of us who grew up with those really heavy, cuddly, quilts from grandma or, or mom. Um, we like a really heavy quilt, something that kind of puts some weight on us. Um, that Then you want to go with cotton because cotton is going to be the heaviest fiber. We do make a cotton batting that is super, super thick, super fluffy. Let me show you an example of a little quilt. So this is a little quilt made with that. Um, you can see that it's super thick and it's a really nice heavyweight quilt. This little sample sits in our booth when we're at shows and people always put it on and kind of cuddle with it. This is the Tuscany Supreme Cotton. It's our thickest cotton. It's going to be the heaviest and you can even double that up to get a really nice heavy quilt. If somebody's trying to restore an old quilt and they want it to feel like it would have felt when it was made, that's the batting that we recommend. Awesome. Patty is asking, does using the batting with scrim elim eliminate the need for blocking? I would say it's pretty much going to eliminate that need. Um, I've not ever been asked that. So that's a great question. Thank you for asking that. Um, I think that the key thing is it is that quilt is, again, not going to stretch out of shape because that stabilizing layer, just like when you use stabilizer interfacing and clothing, it holds its structure, right? So using something like that heirloom natural scrim will keep it really squared up. I, I've used it a couple times in smaller projects and I know quite a few people who use it in their whole cloth quilts and they do a lot of manipulating, a lot of stitching and they have no issue with that quilt getting out of shape. In fact, there's a beautiful one uh, that a quilter by the name of Chris Vieira, she goes by Quilter on the Run One, the number one. Um, online if you want to check out her work. She did a whole cloth quilt and showed it at AP, uh, AQS Paducah. And it was two layers of that heirloom natural scrim, really, really heavily quilted, whole cloth. So it was like a cream color and it had this sort of scallop wavy edge. That thing was so perfectly straight 
right? And that that she chose that batting specifically for that reason. Great information. Um, I want to back up a little bit to some of the terms that you've used. Can you clarify what needle punch means? Yeah. So if any of you've ever done needle felting, right? If you've taken wool roving and you've used those really long sharp needles and you've poked them in and out of the of the wool roving, you know that that takes that roving and it kind of bonds it, right? You can make little critters and all sorts of fun stuff with that. Well, we use that same process. In fact, the needles look very similar. They're on boards that are about this wide, tall as me, um, and there's thousands of them, right? And they go in, and when the batting is coming through on the, on the line, those needles go in and they punch over and over and over again. And what that's doing is it's locking those fibers together. So needle punching is something you'll see written in the descriptions of products. You'll see it on our packaging. Anytime that you see the term needle punching, that's what they're referring to. And it is commonly used in the making of that. Wonderful. How about loft? You see that all the time, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, so loft is the puffiness or the thickness. So let's take a look at a couple examples here. So this is what we would refer to as low loft, right? This is Thermor, um, and this is just a fantastic batting, has a lot of really great properties, also one of the battings that we're putting in the giveaway. That is what's called a low loft or a thin batting. Then we have another polyester that is called polydown. This is what's called a high loft or puffy batting. So the low loft battings are best for when you're making things with a lot of tiny detail. So imagine you're making an art quilt and you have lots of tiny pieces, right? If you have a really puffy batting, which is meant to puff between the stitches, right? So here's your stitches in between my fingers and here's where it's going to puff. If these are really, really narrow and, it, and that batting really puffs, it may obscure some of your work. So you would want to use a lower loft batting for those kinds of projects. If you're making something for the table and you're gonna have food and drink around there, you wanna make sure that you're using a lower loft batting because if you have a really puffy batting and you put a tall stem glass on there, probably not gonna end up well. Now, conversely, if you want something to really pop or puff, like in the banner behind me, a little hard to tell maybe from here, but those K facet fabric strips, they are super puffy and they really pop off the background. Also, all of that texture that you can see, those straight lines that go around um, those colored strips and then in the middle where it's very heavily pebbled, that was achieved by having a very puffy batting. So in the case of this banner, it's actually two layers of batting. We put the silk on the back because it holds the shape and the structure and it helps that quilt to hang really, really nice and straight. And then we put polyester batting on the top and the polyester is meant to puff or give a lot of the texture. Why did we put those two together? Well, primarily because I fold that banner up and I hand carry it on every flight. I don't ever check that banner because that goes in the middle of our booth and I don't ever want to worry about it getting lost or damaged. So I always hand carry that with me. That means it needs to be lightweight so that I can carry it all day through airports and getting it to the hotel and to the show, etc. One thing I do want to mention, those two battings have a different shrink rate and shrink rate is very, very important when you're going to be piecing or pairing battings and the project is going to be washed. So in this case, the silk batting does not shrink or, or does shrink three to 5% and the uh, poly batting does not shrink. So if we were gonna wash this uh, quilt behind me, that would not be a good pairing because the batting that shrinks is going to pull in on the non-shrinking batting and that can twist or distort your quilt. So if you're taking your batting scraps and you're laying them side by side, you're running a zigzag stitch over them to connect them, to make some new batting or to make for small projects, you want to make sure that the battings you're putting together have the same shrink rate and the same loft. Anytime that you're pairing battings, right? So you're taking two different types of batting, putting them together. That could be cotton wool with wool, could be 100% cotton with wool, it could be silken wool. You want to make sure that the shrink rate on both battings is the same if you're gonna wash it. Because again, if one batting shrinks and one batting doesn't, that batting that shrinks is gonna pull in on the other batting and that could create twisting or distortion. That actually leads right into my next question. If I'm a fan of a crinkled antique look, 
what batting would you recommend? Okay, so then you want to use a batting that is going to shrink, right? And if you pre-wash your fabric, that crinkling wrinkling is gonna be even more prevalent. So let's say that you're using cotton fabric and you pre-wash the fabric, and now you put a cotton batting inside your quilt. When you wash that quilt, the fabric's not gonna shrink anymore. The batting is gonna shrink three to 5%. It's gonna pull in on that fabric, giving it that crinkled, wrinkled, traditional look. If you didn't want that, right? Let's say that you want a really smooth finish. Let's say you're making a modern quilt or an art quilt. And part of what you want is a very, very smooth finish. If you're going to pre-wash your battings, you must use a non-shrinking batting, right? Because your, your fabric's no longer going to shrink when you wash your quilt. So you want to make sure that the batting you put in there is a non-shrinking batting, something that's going to stay nice and flat and smooth. And in our case, that would be any of our polyester battings. Those do not shrink. If you are not pre-washing, your fabric and you put a shrinking batting with your cotton fabrics, they're both going to shrink together. You'll have a little bit of wrinkling, crinkling, but not as much. So always important to be looking at that shrink rate. And again, that is something that is also on this chart that you can download from our website. Very, very important chart. It gives you lots of information. That same information, again, is on every package of batting. And that applies to anybody who makes batting. We all put the shrink rate, what the uh, fibers are that are inside the batting, how far apart to stitch, etc., on the packaging, and then generally on our websites. Our website for us is always the most up to date because it takes longer to update collateral and packaging and it's very expensive to do so. So we'll generally always do our updates on the website first. So if you've thrown away your bag and you're using your batting, you can always go to the website to get the information. Fabulous. Um, since you have that handy dandy reference, Sherry's asking, does the cotton batting shrink? And what's that shrink rate? It does. So all of our battings are going to shrink three to 5%. The exception to that is is the Tuscany Supreme cotton, that really thick, soft, fluffy cotton. We don't heavily needle punch it. That means the fibers are a little bit looser. So that is gonna shrink more like four to 6% depending on how you quilt it. And then for polyester, they don't shrink at all. So the Thermore and the Poly Down and the Cloud Loft, those are three of our poly battings, they do not shrink at all. What I do want to point out is the more that you quilt something, the less it is going to shrink. And also you need to think about how you add warmth to a quilt. So um, if you've ever seen those puffer jackets, right, the puffer jackets generally will have either channel stitching or they'll have little squares or they'll have diamonds. And the reason those are put into those garments is to create pockets for air. And that air, again, generally those are going to be filled with down or with polyester that um, is going to hold in the heat. So when your body temperature warms up, it goes into those fibers and it gets locked into those pockets. So when you make pockets in a quilt, it's going to have more warmth than a quilt that is very, very densely stitched. Awesome. We have a couple of questions regarding the wool. Um, NC Boot is saying, I'm allergic to wool too. Will it affect my skin? Okay, couple things. Um, if you are allergic to wool, I would not handle the wool batting. Now our wool is 100% wool, meaning there's no other fiber blended into it. It's 100% wool. It is also a, a wool that is super washed. That super washing process cleans out the impurities, makes that wool fiber super clean and smooth and nice and soft and drapey, uh, but it also removes the lanolin. And the lanolin is often what people are allergic to or, or sensitive to. Again, if you're allergic to it, I would not handle it yourself. However, you could put it inside of a quilt. I know several educators that use nothing but our wool and they make quilts for their whole family and they have kids who um, are real sensitive or allergic to wool. They still have wool batting in their quilts because we're here in Texas. Again, I wouldn't recommend handling it if you are indeed allergic. If you're a little bit sensitive, you may find that you can handle that product because of the fact that the lanolin has been removed. Wonderful. Also, so um, what would be your recommendation for an all year round um, batting? Wool or silk. Wool or silk. <laughs> those, those are the two. Yeah, and primarily because they're great in any climate, right? We're really hot here right now. Our whole week is 102 to 104. Um, and I'm in Austin, the plant is in Waco. Then we also have, you know, Dallas and Houston on either end of us. 
And in Austin, it never used to be very humid. It was always pretty dry. But right now, we seem to be getting a lot more humidity. Well, I don't want to sweat under my quilt, and I tend to run hot anyway. So I like to use the wool and the silk because they're lightweight. They're going to be super drapey and cuddly, but they're also going to breathe, right? They are, they are actually antimicrobial fibers, meaning that when that fiber gets wet, it will wick, and it um, does not mold or mildew right? So the batting is not going to mold or mildew if the quilt gets wet. Um, they also dry more quickly. Your cotton fabric is going to take a lot longer to dry. So if I'm looking for something that I can use year round in any climate, the wool and the silk are going to be my choice. Now I do want to mention that those two, in addition to the cotton wool, the Tuscany cotton wool, that is an 80-20 blend, 80% cotton, 20% wool. All three of those must be washed, again, once inside a project, cold water on a delicate cycle. You don't ever want to put hot water, high heat, or steam against any project made with those because the wool will very easily felt through the fabric with high heat or steam or hot water. So you wash them on a delicate cycle, cold water, and then you throw it in a dryer that's set to delicate or air fluff, or you can air dry those quilts. Perfect. This is not a question, but I just want to throw this out there because I completely agree. It's saying, really appreciate you, Stephanie, for all of this information. I've learned things about batting that I never knew. Thank you. So this is great. <laughs> That's awesome. I will tell you that is the absolute best comment, um, best compliment I can ever get. And that, that I'm very passionate about this. I do probably, I think in the last couple of years, I've done 250 of these lectures via Zoom. Um, and, and that's a more formal lecture, but I like doing this as well. This is really fun for me to get to do this and deliver this information in this format. So thank well, you. Well, we are very, very thankful for, for your, your time and knowledge. We are really loving this. We're going to keep on going, Kayla Quilts. That's Kayla now. She's going to be joining us too for this event. So, hey, Kayla. Um, awesome. She's saying... Um, can I piece the scrim batting together and still get the benefits? I like to use all of my waste. Yes, yes, you can piece any of the batting. So for anybody who's not ever done that, number one, always keep your scraps, even if they're really small scraps. So those really, really tiny, little teeny tiny scraps, you can actually use those, wad them up, and you can use them as a little eraser to take the marks out of your quilt top. A, a quilter told me that tip and I tried it and it works great, especially works great with our 80-20. Um, anytime that you have larger scraps, all you're going to do is you're going to lay those two pieces side by side like this. You're going to have a nice clean edge here and you're just going to run a zigzag stitch over that. People have asked how, how wide do you make it? As long as it's catching both sides of the batting, that is plenty. There is a tape that you can buy that's called a batting tape. It's about this wide. It's a poly tape and you iron it in place. Two things to note about that. Number one, you want to be very, very careful. You don't want to put your, your you want to use a pressing sheet, right? Don't put the sole plate of your iron on anything polyester um, because it will melt. Um, it will not catch on fire, but it will melt. Um, and that makes quite a mess on your iron. Second thing is when you're going to put battings together like that, um, if you're going to use the tape, I don't recommend using it on really lofty battings. Because remember I said that these areas are the part that's supposed to puff, right? These are your stitch lines, and this is the part that's supposed to puff. If you happen to have a piece of tape right here, when you stitch over it, it's not going to puff the same way the other areas are. And you may see a little bit of a flat spot in there. So I don't recommend using the tape on really puffy, lofty battings, especially if you really want a lot of puff and texture, um, then I would use this exact stitch. And it holds together perfectly well because you're still going to be using your stitch guideline, right? Everybody's going to use that stitch guideline. So again, most of the time it's going to be four inches, for some battings, it's up to eight or nine inches. BL is asking about that batting tape as well. Um, just a quick question. Does Hobbs have the batting tape or do you use a different brand? No, we do not make it. There are several different brands on the market. There is one called batting tape. That was the first one on the market. And there's several other companies that make them now. Um, they run around $10. You get a roll that's about this big and it'll last you quite a while. But I'm sure that you can find that. I, I think it's a, it's a great thing for, for stores to to carry because some people are not as comfortable with that zigzag 
But my personal preference is I use the zigzag stitch method and it works just fine. Yeah, we just peeked on our website. We do offer some from Bozel and then the huh? zigzag method. I'm a big fan of that. I've done that multiple times. It's always nice when you're not throwing away those little pieces. So great, great. Um, Sherry's asking, can Scrim be purchased by itself? It can be, be because it's basically going to be an interfacing or a um, like a stabilizer that you might be able to buy in your fabric store. Um, or at one of the big uh, craft stores. However, we don't sell it on its own. We buy it in bulk and it's applied to not just our batting, we apply it to other products as well that we make for other industries. Wonderful. Um, Bridget is asking, is there a batting that is better for using a domestic quilting machine like her Elna? So I would say the key thing when you're doing a domestic machine, especially if you're doing larger quilts, is you want to use a lower loft batting or a batting that easily compresses right because if you're trying to manipulate your quilt through a small throat space um, you're going to need to really tighten that quilt down and move it around quite a bit so when you're using a lower loft batting something like the 100 percent cotton our regular 100 percent cotton or the 80 20 or even that thermor that very thin poly those are going to compress down very nicely and you're going to be able to manipulate those around if you get a much like the thicker cotton might be a little bit more challenging with a domestic machine um, but even the wool and the silk i mean the wool even though it's puffy and the poly down they push down as well. So if you press it as you're going through, you should not have any problem. We, we have lots of uh, very well-known quilters that only use domestic machines. Um, and it's amazing the quilts that they make. Uh, just absolutely stunning quilt work and, and ruler work that they do with a domestic machine. Wonderful. Do you have a specific needle that you recommend using when you're using your bedding? We don't have one specific needle, I will say. Um, this is this goes to that uh, talk that we do about bearding. It is very, very important that you start every project with a brand new needle. And I know I get a lot of pushback on this when I when I talk about this, but needles should be considered a component of your quilt, just like thread. So it's really, really important to understand the different types of needles that are available, uh, the sizes of those needles, and then how to properly pair them with the right thread right? Because different projects, depending on whether you want the thread to stand out or you want it to sort of fade in the background, you can use different weights, threads, different color threads, different fiber blends in the thread. You want to make sure that's paired to the correct needle. And I'm not a needle expert. I will tell you, uh, there is a gal by the name of Rhonda Pierce, who is the representative for Schmetz needles. She and I refer each other all the time. Anytime I do a batting lecture, I refer her. Anytime she does a needle lecture, she refers me and that's because I think oftentimes the thread, the needle, and the battings are really afterthoughts or things people are not thinking about up front and you really should be because they will impact not only your quilting process but the outcome that you have. If you're getting bearding, take your needle out and change it, put a new needle in. Oftentimes that will fix the problem. What happens when a needle starts to get dull is as it's going through the fabric, right? It, it's almost like a little fish hook. If it's got a little nick or a burr, it's dull down here, it'll grab batting and it'll either pull it out the top or it'll push it down the back. So starting with a new needle is the best way to ensure that you're not gonna have any bearding issues. Starting with the best quality fabric and batting as well. Another thing about needles is that you need to pay attention to the size because sometimes bearding happens when the needle going in is too big and it's making too big of a hole and that allows the thread to grab the fiber in the batting and pull it up or push it out the back. So the size of the needle, the type of needle is really, really important. And I will tell you, there's nobody that gives more information about needles than Rhonda at Schmitz, but it's really important to learn that information because it'll make a big difference in the outcome of your quilt, your quilting process, and the longevity of the quilt. I just have to say, we absolutely love Rhonda. <laughs> and the funny thing is, is we have these ABC pocket guides and the luggage tags. She right. actually gave them to me while I was in your booth at QuiltCon. <laughs> oh, <laughs> <was> like, <laughs> no, yeah, she's been on with a couple of times and she's fabulous. <laughs> yeah, she really is. And and we we like to partner. So she didn't have a booth at QuiltCon. And I said, oh, you got to come and, and share some information about needles. Um, because oftentimes what happens is when a quilt starts to beard, 
people automatically assume it's a batting issue. It's almost never a batting issue. It's usually because either they started with inexpensive fabric that has too loose of a weave. Um, and it doesn't matter what batting you put behind that. It's not going to have a tight enough weave in the fabric to hold the batting in place. Or again, if you're using a, a needle that's dull or a needle that's too big, or if you haven't paired your thread and your needle properly, right? And that's especially the case with a long arm machine. So if you have a, a needle that comes down on the long arm machine and it has this groove here where that thread is supposed to lay in there, if the, the thread is too large, it's not laying in the groove, it's laying on top of the groove. And when those two things go in and out of the fabric, that it is the needle is helping to make the hole and it is pulling the batting up right back and forth and it can pull it out of the fabric so you want to make sure that you're pairing your needle and your thread properly <laughs> stephanie i told you i'd be taking notes but i stopped and i was just like listening listening so i'm also going to be <laughs> listening to this over again i absolutely love it so we are getting closer to the end here um, i do ask that could you explain a little bit about the batting that's going to be in the giveaway because i wanted to hear about that thermor and the other specialty batting you mentioned yeah so the thermor let me just hold up this little sample. So this is 100% polyester. This batting was originally designed for clothing and miniatures. It is incredibly strong. Again, I would never recommend doing this to your batting because you'll stretch it out of shape, but this batting will really hold up well to that. This has a nine inch stitch guideline, right? Meaning that you can go up to nine inches apart. That can be fantastic for things like t-shirt quilts where you may not want to stitch through the design in the t-shirt to anchor that block in place. It is also fantastic for any kind of inherently heavy quilt, t-shirt quilt, denim quilt, have a quilt that's gonna have a lot of heavy fabrics, lots of heavy piecing on it. This batting for a queen size weighs no more than your favorite uh, fabric scissors. So it's very, very lightweight, incredibly strong. It is also fantastic for things like wall hangings, right? It's gonna keep its structure. It's gonna stay very straight, great for art quilts great for hand quilting you can also use it for embroidery in the hoop either by machine or hand so if you're doing any kind of hand embroidery I, I do embroidery and crocheting and other things as well when i do embroidery i put either the thermor the silk or the wool behind that but the thermor is a really nice thing to put in there because not only will it keep your fabric stretched really taut without that ring getting locked in there, um, it also hides a lot of sins. So if you're like me and the back of your uh, projects is maybe not as clean as it should be, your batting will hide that, right? It keeps it away from the fabric. And so it can be really nice for that. It is fantastic for making things like clothing, right? For, for jackets and coats, it's gonna give a little more structured feeling. Now keep in mind again, 100% polyester, so it is going to hold in the heat. Wonderful for a quilt when you want some warmth. Um, if somebody is has strength or dexterity issues, but they're always cold, this can be a really nice batting. So it's great for like a lap quilt. If you have somebody who's in a wheelchair or a, a walker and they want to have something they can put over themselves, it's really easy to move around, but it'll keep them warm. Thermore is fantastic for that. Uh, let's go to the scrim, the one we talked about earlier. So this is the natural cotton with scrim. Again, it's 100% cotton. Then with that scrim layer needle punched into it, it is still very, very soft and cuddly like cotton batting should be, but again, incredibly strong, not going to stretch out of shape. You should never do that to cotton batting because it'll just destroy it, right? It stretches out of shape. Once it goes out of shape, you can't use it. The great thing about this, again, it's great for any high use quilt, a quilt that may be getting a lot of use and abuse because it'll stay really nicely structured. It's wonderful for things for the table um, because it's nice and low loft. It's great for wall hangings. Um, and again, whole cloth quilts or any kind of shaped quilt it'll really hold that shape really nicely. So it's a very, very strong batting. Both of those two are very strong. So the Tuscany Supreme cotton is our newest cotton. Um, that is the one that we made these uh, wash test samples with. It's super, super, super cuddly. One of the best things about that cotton, because we don't heavily needle punch it, which flattens and stiffens a cotton fiber, right? So if you've ever made a quilt and you really heavily quilted it and it's made with cotton batting, you're going to find it super stiff, right? One of the great things about this 
is that with this batting, even where it is very heavily pebbled here in the middle, very densely stitched, it is still super soft and pliable. It's not stiff at all. That is because of that super thick, fluffy cotton. We don't heavily needle punch it. Um, fantastic for old school heavy quilts, really great for redoing a quilt. If you're making things like pot holders or trivets or uh, table toppers where you're maybe gonna put some hot items on there, you can use that product. You would still want to put a heat reflected material in there, right? You need something else besides just cotton. I would use two layers of that cotton, put a little heat reflected material, and that product is also fantastic when you recover chairs. So I recovered some dining room chairs, two thick layers of that super thick cotton batting, a layer of our poly batting over the top to create kind of a web or a net over the cotton to protect it. And those chairs are so super comfortable. So if you're doing any home decor projects, if you're going to try to recover couch cushions or make a poof or anything like that, you can use that really thick cotton batting with a layer of the poly over the top. Stephanie, thank you again for joining us. This was absolutely wonderful. As I mentioned, I was taking notes and I just stopped because I was so absorbed in what you were saying. Like so much information that I am going to go back and we'll all watch it on our YouTube. So hopefully you can come back and join us again. Maybe we'll have Rhonda on with you too. <laughs> oh, that would be fun. Yeah, that would, that would be a lot of fun to, to do together. And thank you so much for having me. You guys have been great. And I hope everybody enjoyed it. If anybody does have any questions, um, you can always reach out to me at shackney at hobsbondedfibers.com. Or you can chat with me on Instagram. I'm on there every day. And uh, I love to field questions there and, and to chat and get to know what everybody's making. Love it. Well, we'll be following you on Instagram. <laughs> Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you. Have you. a good one. Bye. Bye. Well, I think that was a pretty good substitute for her lecture. I think that that Q&A was packed with all the information that you need to feel empowered to choose the right batting for your next project. So um, I know that after our Christmas in July event, I already started racking my brain on which battings I want to try. Number one priority for me is the Supreme uh, because it's higher loft and I, I really want to try to do some quilting where my quilting really should. I like the puffy look, you know, almost like that Trapunto look. I, I That's kind of the next direction I want to go in. But I also want to try the wool. I want to try the uh, the Thermor for wall hangings. So um, I hope you guys feel like you got just as much out of that as we did. Um, and also it reminded me that we need to have Rhonda from Schmetz on again for one of our events coming up. So we definitely need to re reach out to her and see if she wants to do another presentation. So um, with that said, we've been collecting the final spring word of the day. Not spring word. I'm back in April right now. The final uh, sewing word of the day. So let me clarify how this is going to work because I know we were th all thrown a little bit of a curveball. So we're going to do it a little differently. I told you we would do two Aura Fill Thread Kits instead of one. But we also have a koala chair to give away. So let me find a picture of that. I think it's at the bottom. Let's see. Yep. Okay. So um, the first prize that we're going to give away for uh, the last giveaway today is going to be just the Orofill thread kit. Whoever wins the first thread kit is going to get entered to win the grand prize tomorrow, which is the sewing room makeover. Then uh, I'm going to do my recap of the day, go through all my pricing, summarize what we learned, and then we will do our last giveaway of the day, which will be the Orofill Thread Kit and the Koala Sew Comfort Chair, a $504 value. Now, I do want to clarify the color of the chair that we have to give away is the wine color. It's like a burgundy. It's really beautiful, actually. So, uh, But what's pictured in here, I believe, is a, is a different color. So it is going to be the burgundy. Um, and whoever wins that, just give us a week or two to get it shipped out. So Alex, let's go ahead and pull up the giveaway tool and let's give away thread kit number 17. And please let's get some energy and let's do a drum roll guys. We got to do this right. All right, let's do it. Drum roll. Congratulations, Jody Cowan. Okay, so Jody, you won Orofill Thread Kit number 17. You will be entered into the giveaway tomorrow afternoon. 
Let me get your name right. Very nice. Congrats, guys. Jody. Congrats, Jody. Okay. So um, stick around with me. I'm going to do the recap. We'll go through all the pricing and all the deals and stuff. And then we will give away the Koala So Comfort Chair and the uh, Orphil Threat Kit. But I have to take my sip of water before I do this because it's a lot of talking. <sighs> okay. I'm ready. So we started the day out strong with Ellie the Quilter. She came on and she did a traditional block tutorial, which was really fun. She, uh, she encouraged me to give Flying Geese another try. I don't know if I'm going to do it right away. I might wait a little bit, uh, perfect my half square triangles first, and then I'm going to do my Flying Geese. But they're not my favorite thing to do, and I think that's just because I haven't figured out how to get them right yet. But I have a feeling that once I master them, I'm really going to enjoy them. So she came on and she didn't show very many products. It was more of an educational segment, but she did feature the Panasonic cordless iron. We do have two options. This one is the Panasonic cordless 360 freestyle iron. The MSRP is $153.99 and the sale price is $139.99. And you've heard me say it all day, but I'm going to say it again anyway. That sale price is not the lowest price we'll go. It's just the lowest price that we can show online. So if you call our customer service at 888-824-1192 before the end of the day tomorrow, you can get an even better deal on any of the products featured or any sewing machine that you're interested in. It doesn't even have to be something that was featured. If it's a sewing machine or something like that and, and you're, you've been wanting it and it wasn't featured, call us and we'll see if we can get you a deal. So... We also carry the Panasonic QL1000 cordless 360 freestyle dry and steam iron. That one has an MSRP of $187.99 and a sale price of $159.99. Again, we will go lower than that $159.99 over the phone. So after Ellie came on, we had Ashley Jones from Dime and she had a really cool demonstration on the Dime sticky hoops. So they call it hoopless embroidery. Um, it's using the sticky hoops and you use it to uh, embroider things that you typically can't embroider. So she did it on uh, spa slippers. She embroidered a greeting card. She did a whole bunch of really cool stuff. And she inspired me to try embroidery. Before her segment, I was like, yeah, I want to try it, but I don't have enough of a why behind it. But once I saw her embroidering those uh, the spa slippers and stuff, I was like, you know what? That actually seems like something I want to do. So I think that I'm going to start looking at some embroidery machines. Um, okay, so after Ashley was the Grace Company, um, they came on and they showed us about the True Cut cutting system, which I've talked about a couple times. I really enjoy my, uh, my comfort cutter from True Cut. I really enjoy my big quilting ruler. I find myself gravitating towards it, especially when I'm cutting up my yardage to cut down even further. I just like to use my big ruler and my true cut to cut straight so that my uh, yardage is a little bit more manageable. So uh, we do have a couple of deals on those. We have the true cut cutter combo that comes with the My Comfort Cutter. It comes with some replacement blades and the circle cutter tool, which is perfect for applique. The MSRP on that is $108.99 and the sale price is $92.80. Of course, if you call in, the price is going to be better. They also showed uh, the True Cut Four Piece Quilters Combo Number Two. That is one seventy ninety nine MSRP, and then the sale price is one forty five eighty. Um, it comes with that big ruler that I was talking about, the My Cut Cutter Comfort Cutter, the True Grips, and the Blade Sharpener. Now we do have a smaller combo than this one. Um, it's got the My Comfort Cutter, the it's got everything except for the sharpener. It is a little more affordable. However, it's currently out of stock. But if you want something that's a little more affordable, you don't see yourself using the blade cutter, you're totally welcome to call an order and lock in that price. And when it comes in uh, to our facility, we'll ship it out immediately. Typically orders from Grace only take about a week to get here. So you won't be waiting that long and at least you'll be getting that's so creative live deal. I totally understand if you don't want to wait, uh, but I still think it's a really good deal. And I, I think the true cut cutting system is a fantastic tool to add to your sewing room. I know a lot of people really liked this one. I think people liked the notions and the tools, but I think they mostly liked the bag, which is totally understandable. It's a very nice looking bag. So it was the true cut travel kit. It has an MSRP of $210.99 and a sale price of $179.95. Uh, but if you call in, we will beat that $179.95. It comes with all the tools you need to take to your quilting retreat or to a friend's house to sew or to classes, all that kind of stuff. 
Um, and, it, and I pointed out earlier that there's some extra storage in it for some presser feet and stuff like that. So I think it's a really cool deal. Um, and if you are interested in it, I think it's a good way to go. The last deal that we have is the True Cut Master Cutting System. So that is an MSRP of $350.99 and a sale price of $299.90. This gets you set up with all of the tools that you need to try out True Cut. It's got the rulers, the true grips, the sharpener, one of the blades and the circle cutting tool, and then a couple of refills on the blades. So uh, that also will have a special event price if you call. After Grace came on, we spoke to my favorite quilter, which is Shelly Scott Tobish. She is so incredible, so precise, and so intelligent. And I'm so grateful that she got to join us for this event to share how she chooses fabric from conception of her project to when she gets ready to sew. Uh, it was a really valuable segment, and I know that she has a whole bunch of more information in her book. Her book features the quilt that she showed us today, which is Apple Yard Lane. That's what's on the cover right here. Um, her book is called Easy Precision Piecing. The MSRP on it is $32.99. The sale price is $29.95. Of course, if you call, we will offer a better deal over the phone. I think that every quilter who is interested in learning how to do really intricate, scrappy, small, precise quilting should get this book. Uh, it's I've read it and it's really easy to understand specifically her um, block builder system, which is how she stays organized with all of those cuts is really interesting. And it, it highlights how important it is from start to finish to, to honor every step of the quilting process in order to achieve the results that Shelly is able to achieve. So if you're interested in achieving quilting like she is, go ahead and buy that book. You will not regret it. So we also talked about their easy press fab fabric treatment mist and bottle combo. So this comes with their fabric treatment and one of those simple sprayers. I talked about how I use this all the time. I have tried starch. I have tried some of the other products on the, mar the market and I just find that the Acorn products, they get me the best result that I'm looking for. Some um, starching or starch alternative products, they make my fabric a little too stiff. Some of them don't make it stiff enough. And I find that the Acorn products really give me that balance uh, that I'm looking for. They also uh, talked about their precision piecing starter kit. This is a three piece kit. It comes with a small bottle of that starch solution. So if you don't want to commit to the big bottle, this is an option for you to just test drive it. It comes with the pen, which uh, you use. She didn't demonstrate it, but I'll explain it to you right now. You That pen is filled with the same uh, pressing solution. And after you uh, sew your blocks together, you run the solution with the pen right over the seam and then you press it and you get the flattest seams imaginable. Then uh, it also comes with the acorn glue. That is a light hold glue. So it's not gonna ruin your fabric and it's great for glue basing your pieces before you sew them. Um, if you've seen any of their segments before, you know that they use the glue. Shelly likes to use the glue. She will glue her quarter inch seam, put her pieces together and then she'll run it through her sewing machine and her, her start and finish of her block don't shift at all. And for me, that's where I have the biggest problem is from specifically at the end of, of sewing my piece. I always tend to get some sort of shift. And since I started using the precision glue, I have not had that problem. So they also talked about the Acorn E sprayer combi pack uh, that has an MSRP of $100 and 99 cents and a sale price of 85 99. Of course we can beat that price. That is an electric misting bottle. It, produces a very fine mist so you won't oversaturate your product or your, sorry, your fabric with the product. Um, and it's great for people who struggle with uh, their hands. You know, if you have arthritis or something like that, you just press the button and you let it go and it does the work until you press the button again. I think it's a fantastic product. I know a lot of y'all were excited about that when you saw it. So then we had Michelle from Sewing Machine Artistry. She did two segments. She did a uh, thread lace on uh, with Sulky fabric. And she also did a little demonstration with some Clover Notions. So if you're interested in doing the thread lace technique, like she talked about, there are some options. We have the Designer Crossroads Denim Six Spool Thread Kit, MSRP of $39.99, sale price of $35.99. Of course, if you call in, the price is lower. She also talked about the Flying Colors 30 Weight Blendables 10 Spool Thread Kit. The MSRP on that is $64.99. The sale price is $49.99. Better price over the phone. 
She also talked about the Slimline case with Cotton Blendables Thread Collection. That is an MSRP of $307.99 and a sale price of $249.99. Of course, we will beat that price over the phone. This is a good way to, if you want to build up your kit fast with some Sulky Thread, go with something like this. There's some beautiful variegated options that I can see in there, and I think you'll really enjoy this for making that thread lace. We also have the Slimline case with Cotton Blendables Thread Collection. This is a little bit of a smaller collection than the last collection I showed you. So if you are a little cautious about investing in the larger spools, you can at least try out the line uh, for uh, MSRP of $161.99 and the sale price of $129.99. And of course, you probably have guessed what I'm going to say next. If you call over the phone, we will beat that price. Okay. She also talked about some Clover products that help her get uh, the perfect half square and quarter square triangles. Uh, she talked about that pen. I saw that a lot of people were really excited about that pen. It actually reminds me a lot of the Acorn pen. They kind of do something similar. So either way you go, if you go with the Acorn pen or you go with the Clover one, I think you're making a good choice. So uh, there was a lot of products in that demo. So we just put prices vary, but customer service has a list of all of those products. So if you call, they will get you those prices. So... After that, we had a quick convert. We showed you an episode of the uh, So Inspired podcast with Pat Sloan. That was pretty cool. We had a conversation uh, with our, from our So Creative Live Christmas in July with Stephanie Hackney. We learned a bunch about batting. And I did talk about the Juki deal right now, but I'll just touch on it again for anybody that missed it. Right now, if you buy a Juki TL15, it is the same exact price as the Juki TL2010Q. And if you don't know anything about these machines, the TL2015 is a higher end version of the TL2010Q. So you're basically getting the next step up in the line for the same exact price. And in fact, a little bit lower because you guessed it, if you call, we will give you a better price. All right, I think that's the last time I'm gonna say that for the day. Thank you for bearing with me. So um, yesterday we went off the air without talking about uh, the schedule. So I'm going to do the giveaway for the Koala chair and the Orifel in just a sec, but let's get the schedule for tomorrow pulled up so we can talk about that. Alex, will you get that pulled up for me? Okay. Let me make it full screen so I can see it because I can't read it right now. Okay. I think it's time for new prescription glasses. So uh, tomorrow, we are starting out strong with our friend Trisha Camacho from Creative Costume Academy. She joined us back in April for our So Creative Live Spring Social, and she is your pattern nerd friend is what she likes to call herself. She is a pattern drafting teacher. She has uh, made costumes for Disney and for uh, Blue Man Group, and she does stuff for shows in Vegas like Cirque du Soleil. She's incredibly talented, and she is also just a really cool person. She's going to be teaching us how to make polar fleece fingerless gloves, which I think is perfect because, you know, quilters and sewers, we need to get started on our projects in advance. So right now is a good time to get started on your winter projects. And I think this is going to be just a really easy, fun sew that you can use up your scraps. Uh, if you sew with knits often and you have scraps left over, uh, this is going to be the perfect project for you. She said that you can do it and just like an hour or two. So I'm excited for that one. Next, after Trisha, we have a newcomer to Sew Creative Live, but she is uh, not a newcomer to the sewing industry. Kelly Latrell, I believe I'm pronouncing that right. Kelly, I hope I didn't butcher that. She is uh, from Juki. She is going to be showing us the Juki Kokochi DX4000 QVP, which that machine is like a spaceship. It is so cool, so high end. It's got amazing features and it's beautiful. Uh, it looks like it could probably play Netflix and Hulu on the screen, but I think we're a few years away from that. But I'm excited for that event because we happen to have a couple of Juki Kokochi DX4000 QVPs that were returned. They were inspected by our master technician. They were uh, ensured to be in new condition and original packaging. And I happen to know for a fact that the sale on those open box machines is very steep. So if you've been looking for a high-end machine, at not a high-end price, I think that's the best opportunity to get something like that. So back to the schedule. After Juki, we have uh, Hannah from Modistra Sews. She is a garment sewist, and she's actually our newest Sewing Parts Online ambassador. She just signed up to be an ambassador, so we haven't really gotten to work with her too much yet. This is going to be our first time working together, but she is going to be doing a free class on tips for sewing collars. 
I'm super excited about that because my friend Deb and I are just starting to dive into the world of garment construction. And uh, we both agreed that we would love some tips on sewing collars and sewing sleeves. So Hannah is going to show us how she perfects sewing collars, which I'm really excited about. After Hannah's segment, Grace is back to show us the Unique 13 Little Rebel sewing machine, which I am so stoked for. If uh, if I wasn't already building a list to the floor of things that I want to get myself for Christmas, I would get the Little Rebel in a heartbeat, but I have to prioritize the sewing furniture first. So uh, the Unique Little Rebel is really, really exciting. It's going to shake up the sewing industry because it is not just a long arm machine, but it's also a piecing machine, and it's also a sit-down quilter. So you heard that right. You can piece on the machine. Then you can, on your table, free motion sew with your hands because it's got a built-in stitch regulator, or you can take it and you can throw it on a frame and long arm with it and use automation and all that stuff. So it kind of does a little bit of everything. And it's got a 13 inch wide throat space and I believe an eight inch tall throat space. So for a piecing machine, that is kind of unheard of. I My mind was blown when they first announced that machine and I'm excited to see it in action tomorrow. They're not going to show it on a frame. They're going to show it in piecing and um, sit down quilting mode. So I'm super excited to see what that's like. After the Grace Company, we have Amanda Mateo from Uniquely Mateo, who is the queen of Jelly Roll Rugs. And I happen to know that she is watching right now. So Amanda, shout out to the queen of Jelly Roll Rugs. She is going to be talking about how she takes her Jelly Roll Rugs and improves them. So she does this really cool thing. So if you don't know anything about Amanda, she teaches people how to make jelly roll rugs, which is a really fun project uh, to get into. Uh, she has classes, private classes on Facebook, where she teaches people how to make the tree skirt. She'll do the uh, oval one, the circle one. But during our event tomorrow, she's going to show us how... Hi, Amanda! She's going to show us how she takes jelly roll rugs that she makes and cuts them in half to make two separate half, half circle jelly roll rugs, which I think is uh, a really cool... She, she did it with... Um, with watermelon fabric once like she had green fabric on the outside and then she had some white and then she had some uh pink with seeds and it looked like two slices of watermelon it was really really cool so i'm excited for her to show that segment tomorrow and we're excited to have her back for our event so after amanda we have our friend chris marquini from rose city originals he is going to be talking about crumb quilting scraps and sustainability now one thing i noticed today in the comments was a lot of people were talking about Mount Scrapmore. They were talking about how in their closet or in their sewing room, they have a giant pile of scraps and they would love more scrap friendly projects. So Chris is going to come on to talk about crumb quilting. He's going to talk about how he makes new fabric out of scraps. And he's going to talk about other ways that you can use up your scraps so that you're being a more mindful quilter. You're being more sustainable. You're being more uh, wallet friendly. Uh, and, and he's really talented at teaching and we're super excited for him to be on because we just started carrying his patterns. So that's really cool. We just reached out to him and said, Hey, we know you sell your patterns on your website. Would you like to sell them on sewingpartsonline.com too? And he replied immediately and said, absolutely. I'd love to. So we ordered some of his patterns and we're going to have them for sale tomorrow at a special event discount. So after Chris is, let me pull up the schedule back up. After Chris is Richard Tharp with Baby Lock, and he's going to be showing us the Baby Lock Sashiko machine. Now, if you tuned in yesterday, you were here when Paul was talking about how he's been using Sashiko thread to do hand embroidery. The Sashiko machine mimics the hand embroidery Sashiko method. So it's a really, and Baby Lock is the only one that makes this machine in America. Um, and I know a lot of people really like it as an addition to their sewing room. Uh, I saw a lot of quilts at QuiltCon this year with Sashiko stitches. And now I don't know if they did it by hand or if they did it by machine. Uh, and that's mostly because the machine does it so well. You can't really tell if it was done by hand or machine. So if you're curious about learning about the Sashiko method and the machine, tune in tomorrow for Richard's segment. After Richard, we are doing a giveaway. And not just a giveaway, but the giveaway. So that after Richard's segment, we're going to do a recap on the event, go over special pricing like we're doing right now, and then we are going to give away a dream sewing room makeover. So I, I, it almost feels like the day before Christmas. Like I can't believe that we're actually giving so, just one person all that stuff. And I am super excited for whoever's going to win and whoever wins better share pictures because I want to see their new sewing space. So. 
that is our schedule for tomorrow. I'm super excited for everybody that's coming on, and I hope y'all can join me. Um, hopefully things run smoothly tomorrow, but I know you guys are patient. And if, you know, we run into road bumps, we're all just going to, you know, laugh at it, roll with the punches and have some fun. I think that's enough talking for me for right now. I, I think the only thing we have left to do is the giveaway for the end of the day. What do you think, Alex? Yeah. Okay. okay. So go ahead and pull up the giveaway tool and then everybody collectively, you know what to do. Either drum in your sewing room, wherever you're watching from, or you can put the drumming emoji in the chat and we know you're uh, drumming with us. So let's go ahead and pull it. Lisa Lash, congratulations. Lisa, you not only won an Orifil thread kit, you are entered into the grand finale giveaway tomorrow at the end of the day and you won a koala sewing chair. So let me go over how to claim your prize before we go off. Congrats, Lisa. Congrats, Lisa. Okay. So for everybody that won today or the day before or wins tomorrow, to claim your prize, you go to www.sewingpartsonline.com forward slash sew creative live. Either click the giveaway tab or scroll down to the giveaway section, fill out and submit your form, and we will do the rest. Now, I've said it a couple times. It's going to take us a week or two to get the giveaways shipped out. And then whoever wins the grand prize, we are going to have to contact you just to verify some information because uh, we want to make sure that some random person isn't claiming your prize. But we will call you. We'll verify who you are and that, and that you're the one that actually won and we'll get it shipped out within about two weeks. So with that said, I think that's I think that's all I have for you. Thank you, everybody, for watching today and for having fun with us. And I can't wait to see you bright and early tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. Central. I'll see y'all later. Bye. Oh, Alex and I did that at the same time. Now it's goodbye. Uh